Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. October 1987, West Migan Boulevard, Gadsden, Alabama. TC, I can't say thanks enough, Jeff said to his friend. I know, Jeff. You've thanked me a hundred times for bringing up the idea of you coming home with me. When mom and dad heard about you being on the outs with your mom, they agreed right away when I asked if it was okay. Even though your mom apologized to you at Benning when we finished AIT, it's still a good idea. Give both yourself and your mother time to get used to her acceptance of your decision. Look, don't worry about it, okay? We've only got a couple of weeks before we report to Bragg, so let's relax and enjoy it. Jeff nodded as their bus pulled into the bus terminal in TC's hometown. The two met at basic training in July. They and one other soldier from basic were together through their advanced individual training in airborne school, though they hadn't formed as close a friendship with the other man. Jeff let out a deep breath while the bus pulled into its assigned parking space. The pair claimed their duffel bags from the storage area under the bus without incident before walking into the terminal. Jeff's eyes scanned his surroundings, taking in the sights of a new place. Nothing too unique about a bus terminal, he thought. We could still be in Columbus for all I know. Two women rushed up to TC. An older version of TC followed at a slower pace. The two women hugged TC while his father walked over to Jeff and held out his hand. Jeff, good to see you again, Dr. Thomas Clayton Pelly Jr. said as they shook hands. His friend TC was better known as Thomas Clayton Pelly III. It's very nice to see you again too, sir, Jeff replied. Jeff met TC's parents a month ago when they traveled to Fort Benning to see their oldest graduate from AIT. We're glad you could come, he clapped Jeff on the shoulder. By this time, TC's mother and sister had released him, allowing his father to welcome him home. Mrs. Pelly and TC's sister, Miranda, came over to greet Jeff. Jean Pelly gathered him into a firm hug, surprising him. Jeff, you're looking good. It's very nice to have you here with us before you boys head to Fort Bragg. Thank you, ma'am, Jeff said. And thank you to your whole family for allowing me to impose on you like this. Oh, hush, she said, swatting his arm. We're glad that Tommy has made such a good friend in the army already. Thanks, Mrs. Pelly, Jeff replied. Turning to the young lady with Mrs. Pelly, Jeff said, It's good to see you again. How have you been, Miss Miranda? The bespectacled blonde girl blushed while looking down and smiling with a closed mouth. Jeff had seen the stunning beauty she would soon become when they first met. She was Allison Redux. Jeff gently took Miranda's outstretched hand, turned it over, bowed low, and kissed the back of it. Miranda's braces showed for a moment when she smiled. That was before she covered her mouth with her other hand and giggled at Jeff's antics. Hey, you putting the moves on my little sister? TC demanded in mock anger. I'm standing right here. You told me she doesn't have a boyfriend, Jeff shot back. I know I'm just a damn Yankee, but there must be a lot of stupid boys around here. Miranda blushed and smiled, covering her mouth again. Jeff turned back to Miranda and asked, When did TC say you were getting your braces off? Saturday, Miranda responded in her lyrical, accented voice. I used to wear them in high school, too, Jeff replied. I smiled the same way until my girlfriend at the time convinced me that it shouldn't be my problem that other people had a problem with them. Encouraged by his words, Miranda smiled back, this time without covering her mouth. Wow, you'll have to chase the boys off with a stick when those braces come off. Miranda blushed again at Jeff's antics. Ready to go? Dr. Pelly asked. TC and Jeff nodded and slung their duffels over their left shoulders, leaving their right hands free to salute if necessary. Both young men wore their Class A uniforms as they traveled under orders. The uniforms drew curious looks in an America only 12 years removed from Vietnam. They drove to the Pelly's home in the southern section of Gadsden, Alabama. Miranda sat in the middle of the rear seat between Jeff and her brother. This allowed her to chat with Jeff. Miranda had accompanied her parents to Benning in September, when he and TC turned blue at the end of AIT. But they hadn't gotten to know each other then. Jeff discovered that Miranda was even more intelligent than her brother had hinted. 
He also learned that there was a school dance scheduled for that coming Saturday. Miranda would get her braces off that same afternoon. Noon had asked Miranda to the dance, and she hadn't wanted to go with her braces on. Miranda hadn't learned that her braces would be coming off until earlier this week. She didn't think she'd find someone to go with her on such short notice. Jeff filed that piece of information away for later. When Miranda went up to bed that evening, Jeff presented his idea to TC and his parents. You are putting the moves on my sister, TC exclaimed. Look, you told me more about this dance after Miranda brought it up. It's clear to me that she feels like she's missed her chance at going. I also think that she feels she didn't shine at her debut last year. Am I right? You're very perceptive, Jeff, Mrs. Pelly remarked. I'd say you've read my daughter's mood very well. Thanks, Mrs. Pelly. Now the dance is in two days this Saturday? The three Pellys nodded. I propose that Saturday morning, Mrs. Pelly, you take her to get a dress appropriate for the dance, maybe under the guise of getting one for a nice dinner out to celebrate, getting her braces off. After that, take her to get her hair done. I'll get the tickets, a corsage for her, and I'll be ready to surprise her with the news that we're going to the dance when you return. Jeff, no offense, but you seem to be putting a lot of effort into this, even though you insist you're not trying to score with my little girl, Dr. Pelly said. Sir, ma'am, TC, I swear to you that I'm not. Mrs. Pelly said that I'd read Miranda well, and my read is that she'll appreciate a good memory of her high school years, particularly of her senior year. With how things were between my mother and me at the end of my senior year, I can't imagine how I'd remember my high school years if I didn't have some positive experiences. Mrs. Pelly put her hand on her husband's arm and smiled at him before turning back to Jeff. Jeff, we believe you and we apologize for the implication. Ma'am, you're looking out for your little girl. I can hardly fault you folks for that. We don't doubt your sincerity, especially not after hearing your reasoning, Mrs. Pelly said, smiling an apology at Jeff. Dr. Pelly looked sheepish for doubting his son's friend. Jeff launched into an explanation of his preparations, as if he hadn't heard a negative word. TC's parents looked at him in gratitude. I'll work on my boots for the next couple of days so they'll shine like mirrors. I'll have TC run me down to Aniston tomorrow to get high-gloss badges for my uniform. I can't be looking like some refugee from a thrift store standing next to her. Hi, Mrs. Williams, TC said to the woman behind the office counter the following day. He and Jeff were at Southside High School, TC's alma mater. Tom Pelly, you young rascal, how have you been? The gray-haired woman asked. You look well. I've been very well, thank you, ma'am. Yourself? Getting by. Who's this young gentleman with you? Mrs. Williams, may I introduce private second class Jeffrey Andrew Knox, late of Enfield, Massachusetts? Jeff, this is Mrs. Alfredine Williams, the real power behind the throne here at Southside. Freddie Williams recoiled in horror. Thomas Clayton Pelly III, you bring a damn Yankee and a blue belly on top of it into my school? She wore a smile on her face as she asked, though. It's okay, Mrs. Williams. He's got proper manners. He's even housebroken. How do you do, Mrs. Williams? It's very nice to meet you, Jeff offered. It's nice to meet you as well, Mr. Knox. Do you have an interest in high schools in the South? Sadly, no, ma'am, Jeff smiled. We came to see if tickets were still available for the fall festival dance tomorrow evening. Freddie Williams looked at TC, a twinkle in her eye. Miranda? TC nodded with a smile. They are, indeed, Mr. Knox, she said. May I buy a pair then? Mrs. Williams quoted him a price and he handed over the cash, getting two tickets in return. Does she know? she asked. No, ma'am, Jeff replied with a smile of his own. If anyone says anything, I'll just say that you were with Thomas when he came back to visit. Thank you, ma'am. Turning to TC, Jeff said, Driver? Aniston Army Depot, if you please. Thanks again for today, Mom. I had a lot of fun, Miranda said when they returned to their house Saturday afternoon. You're welcome, darling, Jean Pelly said, smiling. We're going out to dinner in a little while. Yes, Mary, as soon as we get changed and the men get ready, Jean said as they pulled into the garage. You go up the back stairs and get dressed. 
Once I hear you close your door, I'll let the boys know they can get Dresshead. I want to surprise them with your new look. Miranda sported a new haircut, one that let people see her face better, and revealed her natural beauty. Mrs. Pelly surprised her with a trip to the optometrist that afternoon for contacts, which got rid of the unflattering glasses Miranda hid behind for years. Miranda scampered out of the car with her new purchases and ran up the stairs. Once Jean heard her daughter's door slam shut, she walked into their living room. Her husband, hearing her enter, turned to greet her. Everything go okay, Jeannie? All set, Tom, she replied. Hearing this, Jeff nodded and walked to the downstairs guest bedroom. He emerged ten minutes later wearing his Class A uniform, complete with highly polished boots, sharply creased pants, his maroon beret, and high-gloss skill badges. He carried a bouquet of roses. Jean Pelly nodded in approval. Mom? Miranda called from the top of the stairs, still out of sight. Jean smiled at her husband and the two boys, and then turned to assist her daughter. She smiled wider while her daughter, who looked wonderful in her new, little black dress and heels, came down the stairs. Jean fought to keep from crying. Her little girl was growing up. When Miranda reached the bottom, Jean brushed a stray lock of hair back out of the girl's face and kissed her on the cheek. You look so beautiful, Jean whispered to Miranda with watery eyes as she gave her a gentle hug. Oh, Mom, Miranda said, blushing. Where are we going to dinner? Are the boys ready yet? Let's go see. She led Miranda around the corner into the living room. The younger woman stopped short when she caught sight of Jeff in full uniform, holding the roses. Miss Miranda, may I have the honor of escorting you to your school's fall festival dance this evening? The disbelief on Miranda's face shifted to joy. Yes, her face threatened to split from her widening smile. They posed for photos before Dr. Pelly handed Jeff the keys to his Mercedes sedan. Jeff, ever the gentleman, escorted Miranda to the car and held her door while she slid into the front seat. He walked around the car, climbed into the driver's seat and removed his beret. Your dad said that the Gadsden Country Club would be a nice place to have dinner, so we have seven o'clock reservations. Sound okay to you? I'd like that, she replied shyly. Thank you for asking me to go to the dance with you tonight, Jeff. You didn't have to do this. It seems like you haven't had many good memories of school, other than your math successes, Miranda. I thought I might try to help. No strings attached, so please don't worry about that. You're a friend of Tommy's, Jeff. That's reason enough for me to trust you. Startled looks greeted Miranda and Jeff when they arrived at the fall festival dance. Jeff wasn't sure which generated more talk, his uniform, or the stunning blonde on his arm. The chaperone at the front door didn't recognize Miranda and required her to show her school ID before the couple could enter Southside's gymnasium. Jeff escorted Miranda to a small table and held a chair for her while she sat. They discussed her plans to study math in college and her wish to pursue advanced degrees. They talked for about 20 minutes before Miranda excused herself to freshen up. Jeff stood for her as she departed. He looked around at all the curious faces. Excuse me, sir. Jeff turned to find a tall, thin boy gazing at him. Yes? May I help you? Yes, sir, I beg your pardon. The young woman accompanying you? Is she Miranda Pelly by chance? Indeed she is. Are you a friend of hers? You don't have to call me sir, by the way. I'm an enlisted soldier. I work for a living. Well, I'd like to think I'm her friend, sir, uh... Jeff, he said, offering the boy his hand. Jeff Knox. I'm a friend of Miranda's brother, Tom. Travis Newcomb, sir, I mean Jeff. Good to meet you, Travis. Have a seat. Thanks. I was beginning to wonder if anyone would recognize Miranda. We've been here for almost a half hour, and you're the first person who's come over to talk to her. It took me this long to gather the courage to approach you. I've known and liked Miranda for years, but... Wow. Jeff chuckled at the familiar scenario. I think I was a little like you in eighth grade. Shy, quiet, bookish. The summer after that school year, I decided I'd had enough of that. I pulled up my big boy pants and made some changes in my life. Wound up with a couple of spectacular girlfriends along the way too. High school was a lot more enjoyable for me than middle school was. 
Travis nodded. You started steering the raft rather than let yourself be pushed around by the current. I... Get your hands off me! Miranda yelled, her voice echoing across the dance floor. Travis bolted out of his chair and was halfway across the gym before Miranda's voice registered with Jeff. He hustled to catch up. Jeff watched Travis pull another boy's hand off Miranda's wrist. Travis twisted the boy's hand painfully, causing the palm to face the forearm. The hold caused significant pain in the wrist with a minimum of effort. The other boy's friends seemed ready to pounce on Travis. Gentlemen, Jeff said loud enough to catch their attention. That would be an exceedingly bad move on your part. The others stopped in mid-step. Don't ever touch her again, Thornberry, Travis said in a low, quiet tone to the other boy. If you do, bad things might happen. Travis increased the pressure. Do we understand each other? Two chaperones rushed up. What's going on here? The larger of the two asked in a loud voice. From what he wore, Jeff deduced the man was a football coach. Mr. Newcomb removed this person's hand from Miss Pelly's wrist. It seems that he placed it there without her consent. I don't know about the law in the great state of Alabama, but back home, that's assault. Who the hell are you, Yankee? The other man demanded. I'm the young lady's date, but Mr. Newcomb beat me off the line. This ungentlemanly young man would be in the same position if I'd gotten here first though he'd likely be in worse shape than he is. Jeff smiled a feral smile at the coach, one born of practice. I dislike bullies. You're out of here. All of you. And him? Jeff asked about the boy Travis still held. You worry about yourself, Yankee. Now get out of here. Not so fast, coach, the other chaperone said. Let's allow the sheriff's office to sort this out. Sheriff? The coach squawked. Miss Pelly's wrist is bruised. Our young soldier is correct. That's assault here in Alabama as well. The coach didn't appreciate others telling him he was wrong. You mark my word, starting Monday, your remaining days at this school will be hell. He threatened Travis. Travis glared back at the man. Have fun playing your games with no players. How many of them will pass their classes on their own? What in the hell are you talking about? How many athletes receive tutoring help right now? Who does that tutoring? You try anything with either Miranda or me or any of our friends and that tutoring stops instantly. The coach stared at him, nostrils flaring. And the faculty will be watching Coach Merriweather, the other chaperone warned. Athletes have been allowed far too much leeway at this school for far too long. Students who excel at academics shall no longer suffer abuse at the hands of those who excel on the field. Coach Merriweather stared at the woman before storming off. Travis released his prey, and the boy scrambled away with his friends. I believe you just placed a rather large target on your back, Travis, the woman said. Let him start something, Mrs. Culpepper, Travis commented to his calculus teacher. Our dads will sue him, that player, the school, and the school board, blind, and the tutoring support to athletes will stop. Ah. Where did this attitude come from all of a sudden, Travis? Miranda asked. I don't know. He hurt you and that pissed me off. He looked down at Miranda, only a few inches shorter than himself in her heels. He softly caressed her cheek before kissing her. The kiss grew in intensity until Mrs. Culpepper and Jeff cleared their throats at the same time. The younger couple blushed. Jeff patted the young man on the shoulder. Jeff and TC visited a financial consultant with Dr. Pelly the following Monday. The consultant explained how much of their army paychecks they should be able to save each month. That much? Jeff asked, his eyebrows rising into his hairline while he looked over at TC. His friend was as surprised as he was. Absolutely, boys, Bo Duckworth assured the young soldiers. Let's look at the situation, shall we? As privates, you'll live in barracks on post, so you'll have no housing costs. The army will feed you, so you'll have almost no food costs. They'll give you things to wear, do your laundry, provide work-related transportation, take care of medical expenses. For you young fellows, this is a golden opportunity to be well ahead of your contemporaries financially. Jeff and TC looked at each other again, this time looking like they understood what Mr. Duckworth was trying to tell them. Don't forget either, boys, that after your time in the service is over, 
You will have access to your GI Bill benefits, the man continued from the other side of the conference room table. At the same time, many of your high school classmates will be paying off tens of thousands of dollars in school loans. Other than maybe some maintenance costs on a good used car, you should be able to avoid 85 to 90 percent of an average young person's debt and expenses for the next four years. You'll also learn good financial habits that you'll use for the rest of your lives. Jeff and TC looked thoughtful as they thought about all of what Mr. Duckworth had told them over the last half hour. Tommy, your dad and I will leave you and your friend to think about what I just told you boys. We'll come back in about 15 to 20 minutes and go over any questions you might have then, okay? Bo Duckworth rose from his seat and beckoned to Dr. Pelly to follow him. They closed the door as they left the room and walked down the hall to the consultant's office. The two older gentlemen each got coffee before sitting at a small table in the office. What do you think, Bo? Tom asked one of his oldest friends. If nothing else, at least they paid attention, Bo replied, sipping at his coffee. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to them. I'd hate to have them give four years to Uncle Sam and wind up broke on top of it. What do I owe you for your time? Bo snorted. You might consider letting me win next time we go golfing together, you hustler. I'm convinced they give classes on how to fleece your buddies on the links as part of medical school. That and how to make your handwriting illegible. Still, it's my time, Tom, and you are one of my oldest friends. Not to mention you were just about the first client I ever had here when I hung out my shingle. I'm not scrimping to get by, and I haven't been for a long time. I owe you at least this much. Well, boys, I'm sorry y'all can't stay for Thanksgiving. You take care of yourselves, Dr. Pelly said. Jeff and TC stood in Gadsden's airport terminal on Veterans Day, November 11th. They waited for the call to board their return flight to Bragg that morning, and TC's family waited with them. When the call to board came, Dr. Pelly hugged Jeff after TC, which surprised Jeff. Mrs. Pelly gathered Jeff into a hug of her own next. Y'all come back and see us, you hear? She sniffed, blotting at her eyes. Yes, ma'am, Jeff replied, pulling at his collar. It appeared to have shrunk. Thank you all so much. Unable to get her words out, Mrs. Pelly shook her head and waved off his thanks. That wave said that the family was happy to do it. A crying Miranda grabbed him for another tight hug. She croaked out a quiet thank you before Travis shook his hand. You take care of this young lady, Travis, Jeff said to the young man who was now Miranda's boyfriend. I will, Jeff. I don't need you and Tom coming to find me. From what I've seen over the past week, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Jeff clapped Travis on the back and then stepped back to wait for TC to finish his goodbyes. With a last quick check of each other's uniforms, the two paratroopers hefted their duffels and disappeared down the jetway. 16th of November, 1987, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Jeff shifted the weight of the duffel bag on his shoulder as he crossed the company area from the headquarters building to his assigned barracks. He would finally see his barracks room, his home for the next three or so years, in a few more minutes. His Fort Bragg experience thus far had been limited to filling out paperwork at the reception company. Here's where the rubber meets the road, he thought, thinking about the difference between theory, training, and application, doing. He'd been training for the Army since the beginning of July. Now he would be in the Army learning what that meant. After a full weekend of in-processing with the prospect of one last day tomorrow, his head was spinning. Jeff just wanted out of his Class A's into a set of BDUs to get dinner and then to crawl into bed. Seeing the 82nd Airborne patch on his left shoulder still gave him chills. His biological grandfather died wearing that patch. Entering the Alpha Company building, Jeff saw the signs pointing to 1st Platoon's area and headed in that direction. Other signs pointed to his squad's floor and his squad leader's office. In this barracks, he'd share a room with one other soldier. This barracks was unlike the huge open barracks bay during training, where he bunked with 45 others. A private first class in a battle dress uniform grabbed him when he passed the third squad's lounge. Hey, are you the new guy? The PFC asked, pulling Jeff into the common area. Come here and get in on this. Jeff took in the scene. A second PFC stood over a third sitting in a chair holding a book. These other two appeared to be taunting the book reader, and it brought back memories of people harassing him in junior high school. 
It pissed him off. No, I don't think so, Jeff growled before he turned back to the door. Hey, where you were going, new guy? The second PFC confronted him. The second man's name tape read, Jekyll. Appropriate. Jeff gave the large man a hard look. You want me to help you torment another soldier, one who is apparently in my platoon, when I haven't even reported to my squad leader yet. Get stuffed. I was on the receiving end of this shit in junior high school, so no thanks. I might be the new guy and right out of training, but I already know what the term Bravo Foxtrot means. I think I'm looking at two people who embody the term. He turned on his heel and left. Out in the hallway, Jeff took deep breaths to calm down. He looked again for the squad leader's office, room 319. There it was, right next to his room, 317. He dropped his duffel on his bunk. His roommate wasn't there. He walked next door to report in. Sergeant Private Knox reports, Jeff said, standing at attention. At ease, Private, have a seat, his squad leader said. Jeff sat nervously while the sergeant stared at him, trying to get a feel for Jeff. Finally, the sergeant spoke up. Welcome to 3rd Squad Knox. I'm Staff Sergeant John Tyler. I've been looking at your jacket. This is only a copy, by the way. The original is over at headquarters. Honor grad three times in a row? An RCOM and two AMs before even reporting to your first unit? An average of 291 on your APFTs so far? Not bad, soldier. It's all been theory up until this point, Sergeant. I still need to experience being a soldier, Jeff said. I've had a run of good luck, that's all. And humble to top it all off. I think you'll do well here. You reported to Lieutenant Charrington and Sergeant First Class Hantala when you arrived, I imagine. Yes, Sergeant. When they both got to the office this morning. Good. Why don't you introduce yourself to your roommate and get settled? It's almost chow time. We'll talk more later. Dismissed. Jeff stood and went to attention, executed an about face, and stepped smartly out of the room. Jeff walked next door to his room, where he came face to face with a nightmare. The three PFCs from the lounge sat staring at him. Jeff swallowed. Oh, shit. So you're my new roommate? Asked the one who'd been the other's target in the lounge. His name tape read, Takahashi. Hi! Jeff responded automatically. Shaking his head, Jeff explained, I beg your pardon, Private Takahashi. My karate sensei back home was also named Takahashi. Ken. Takahashi said as he stood and held out his hand. Jeff took it. My name is Ken. Thanks for sticking up for me back there. Carl, Frank, and I are all supposed to be getting new roommates soon. And Carl. Ken indicated PFC Jekyll. Thought up that little test we just put you through. We wanted to know what kind of people we'll be sharing rooms with. Nice job, by the way, Jekyll remarked. He rose and offered his hand. Carl Jekyll, good to meet you. Jeff Knox, he responded. Frank Widmar, the private who had pulled him into the lounge, introduced himself also. Jekyll and Widmar took off after a few minutes of getting acquainted. You speak Japanese then? Ken asked him after the door closed. No, I know the words I needed at the dojo. I studied karate for four years. Sensei was originally from Tokyo. My parents come from down by Hiroshima. They raised my sister and me to speak Japanese and English. I can teach you the language if you'd like. I think my family would be impressed if someone could teach me English, Jeff joked. Don't let this place beat the sense of humor out of you, Ken replied, laughing. I meant I'll teach you Japanese if you would like. I would, thank you, Jeff said sincerely. It's the least I can do after you stood up for me. I felt like I was back in junior high school, getting bullied again. I couldn't stand that shit then either. It was a chance to react like I didn't when I was in junior high, so I did. Whatever the reason, I appreciate it. Carl, Frank, and the rest of the squad will give you a break on the FNG stuff because of how you reacted. Do you have your meal card for the dining facility yet? I do, I just need to knock out some push-ups and sit-ups, get into a set of BDUs, and I'll be ready. Jeff unpacked his duffel bag onto his rack, shook out his best set of BDUs, one of only two sets with the 82nd patch on them so far, and inspected them for wrinkles. Finding none, he undressed down to his briefs and t-shirt and pulled on his PT shorts. He dropped to the floor to start knocking out push-ups. When he finished a silent count, he flipped over 
and did sit-ups. Finished with his PT, he changed into an army brown t-shirt and his BDU pants. He pulled on his jump boots and then put a five-button wool sweater on under his BDU blouse. All set, Ken. That was quick. You did how many of each? One hundred of each. I'm a little behind today. A little behind? Ken was skeptical. If that's a little behind, then how many do you usually do? Jeff shrugged. I'm up to doing at least 500 of each per day in a five-mile run when I can. The run's been hard to do every day since I joined up, but then it's not like they don't make you run in training. That's incredible. I'm used to it now, Jeff shrugged again. I started working out like this the summer before high school. I did some whenever and wherever I was able during the day, and before I knew it, I was up to 500 a day. Come on, I want to eat. I'll get back here to put all this stuff away and I'll crash. I've got one more day of paperwork and in-processing tomorrow. What time is reveal? 04.45. That's about what I've been used to. The new friends left the room and headed out to get dinner. Jeff tried again to wipe the crust out of the corners of his eyes. He filled out more paperwork in the company office early the next day. He slept well the night before, but a mix of early morning PT, breakfast, and a hot shower did not equal an awake Jeff when you added paperwork. He initialed and signed the final page and returned it to the stack. Congratulations, Private. You're all done, said Specialist Josh Tomlinson, one of the headquarters office staff. Jeff smiled as he leaned back into his chair. You're all done. Here. Jeff's smile disappeared. Oh, that was cold. Well, we office staff have to get our kicks where we can. Tomlinson laughed. You still have to draw your equipment at supply. May you die slowly from a thousand paper cuts. Tomlinson laughed again. And fall into a vat of peroxide before you do. Jeff walked back into the room the following evening, carrying a trash can liner with his newly issued web gear in it. You all done? Ken asked. I hope so, Jeff grumbled. He dropped the bag in his closet. I thought that people had to return stuff in better condition than this. I guess whoever had this crap missed that class in basics. And this was the good set. You should have seen the shit they tried to give me first. Jeff spent the last few hours with water and a stiff bristle brush trying to get the mud off the gear. And that was after hours filling out the last of his in-processing paperwork. He'd ask Ken to look at the web gear another day to see how well he cleaned it. I might be better off buying my own, Jeff grumbled. Lots of guys do that, so tell me again about this new stuff you heard about at Supply. The new waterproof gear? I guess it's supposed to replace the field jackets. The specialist over at Supply said the folks at Natick Labs have been working on a whole new system of waterproof jackets, liners, even pants, that are supposed to be made out of that new Gore-Tex stuff. Jeff shrugged. I guess they're going to be rolling it out next summer, so we'll have it next winter. Which means, in true army fashion, it'll get here the summer after that, it will suck, and they'll get it right the second time, in five years. I defer to your greater knowledge and experience in the matter, Jeff joked. Just you wait, new guy. You'll see, you said you met the LT and our platoon sergeant yesterday? Yeah, before I started with all the company and processing fun. Sergeant Hantala has been here a couple of years, so he'll probably PCS in a couple more. The LT just got here a few months ago. He'll be here longer. He seems like he knows what's up. Sergeant Tyler got here about the same time as I did. You ready for chow? As long as it doesn't look like mud tonight, Jeff grumbled. This is the army, Ken reminded him. Don't get your hopes up. I think I need a shower after shaking Infante's hand. Ken chuckled. That's a common reaction. My family wants to visit, but I don't want him near my little sister yet. Certainly not until she's 16 at least. Maybe not even when she's 26. My sister's a senior this year and already 17. She's not visiting until he's ready to PCS. That guy's a legend in his own mind. He'll needle you a little as the new guy. I figured on catching stuff like that as the FNG, Jeff shrugged. I can handle him. I can even put him in his place without kicking his ass. <laughs> From what you've told me, that'll be a new experience for you. Ken laughed when Jeff flipped him off. Jeff and Ken sat in their barracks room reading at the end of Jeff's first week at Fort Bragg. 
they noticed another soldier poke his head in and survey the room through the open door. Hi, how are you? Jeff offered, looking up from his history homework. He received no reply other than a curt nod before the other man disappeared. Jeff looked over at Ken. Fingers. Fingers, Jeff replied. Fingers Flaherty, as in sticky or five-finger discount Fingers Flaherty. Glad I don't have much lying around. It won't matter to him. He'll take whatever regardless. No one's caught him at it yet, I'm guessing. Nope. Make sure the door is locked tight whenever you leave the room, regardless of how long you'll be gone. Right. Jeff settled into life in the active duty army. He no longer mailed the letters to his father and sister to his dad's garage to prevent his mother from intercepting them. Now, he mailed them home. His mom surprised him by showing up at his AIT graduation. She hugged him tight and cried out her apology in the middle of the parade field at Fort Benning. She told him how proud of him she was for his choice and performance in training. Their relationship wasn't back to where it used to be and might never be, but it was improving. Hello? Hi, Mom. Merry Christmas. Hi, Jeff. Merry Christmas. How are you? Okay, thanks, Mom. We've got a pretty light day scheduled. We're still on support cycle, so we've got it easier than the guys in the other brigades. Well, I won't pretend I understand any of that, regardless of how many times you've explained it. I'm sorry you couldn't come home for Christmas. I've only been here a month, Mom. I'm low man on the totem pole, too. Add those together, and my chances of coming home were pretty slim. How are your correspondence classes going? Jeff started his classwork in history two weeks ago. Okay so far, Mom. The university gave me all my AP credits, so I'm already a sophomore. I'm just about done with the first module in that year. I want to get a little farther into the year before we're on training cycle. Ken's been telling me that once we're in training, I'll be too busy and too tired for classwork. I'm just happy to see you continue your education, regardless of how you're doing it. Jeff spoke with his mother for another 10 minutes before talking to his sister, then father. He hung up 30 minutes later. How's your family? Ken asked. They're good, thanks. Do you want to go grab breakfast before you call home? <laughs> yeah, with the time difference, I'll call home between 10 and 1100. Ken was from Spokane, in eastern Washington state, three hours behind Fayetteville. Jeff tracked an item in the local paper for four months before he decided to move on it. He couldn't stand being without a car even after seven months without one of his own. This year, Kara drove what he once considered his car, even though his dad owned it. Jeff and Ken drove out to Carver's Creek, North Carolina in mid-March. Carver's Creek was not far from the base, but felt they needed to wait until they were back on support cycle to go even this far from Fort Bragg. Jeff wanted to check out the vehicle he'd watched in the paper, months for months. Where are we going again? Ken asked in Japanese. The pair started immersion language training earlier in the week. Try that again, a little slower. I think I almost got that. Ken repeated his question slower. Okay, turn left here. Jeff replied in broken Japanese. The two friends pulled up to a modest home set back from the street. To one side of the driveway sat a black 1983 Chevy K10 Silverado pickup. It sported regular tires, no lift package, and it was clean. A gentleman stepped out of the house and made his way down the driveway as Ken and Jeff approached the truck. Help you boys? The man asked. Yes sir, good morning, I'm Jeff Knox and this is my friend Ken Takahashi. We've come to look at the truck if we may? Jeff asked extending a hand to the older man. George Clement, though most just call me Clem. Been plenty of folks by to look, but that's all they ever seem to do. You fellas go on and have a look. I'll be right here to answer questions if I can. Thank you, sir. Jeff stepped to the truck and peered through the window. The interior looked clean and in good shape, as did the exterior. Someone was taking care of this vehicle. Jeff stole a glance at the ground below the truck and saw that the grass underneath was short. Tire tracks led back to the garage near the house and were well-worn. May I look under the hood, sir? Clem nodded, and Jeff pulled the latch. When he raised the hood, he was surprised. As clean as the vehicle looked elsewhere, Jeff found the engine compartment covered in oil. 
Jeff recognized the pattern. The rest of the compartment looked good. He didn't see any animal nests or that any had chewed on the wires or hoses. A closer look under the vehicle showed no issues there, either. May I start her up, sir? Clem nodded and handed over the keys. Starting the engine confirmed Jeff's suspicions about what had caused the oil spray. He let the engine run while he checked the equipment in the cab of the truck. There were no issues. Jeff turned off the motor. He circled the vehicle, testing the shocks on each corner. The sight of something familiar on the bumper froze him in his tracks. An 82nd Airborne Division bumper sticker. Jeff looked at Clem. This was my boy's truck, Clem explained while he looked at the truck, the pain clear on his face. He was a paratrooper over at Bragg two years ago when his chute failed on a training jump. Will blew that head gasket you heard just before that jump. He planned to fix it the weekend after, but he never got the chance. Clem looked at Jeff. His death killed my wife. She died less than three months after he did. Of a broken heart more than anything else. He was our only child. Me? I guess I'm too much of an ornery old cuss. I've been hanging on since they both passed. I finally got around to pulling Will's truck out of the garage this past Christmas. Didn't feel much call to. Before that. Been getting my house in order. Cleaning things up. I'm still planning on being round a few more years, but enough's enough. What are your thoughts on the truck, son? It's obvious your son took good care of it, sir. You've been caring for it, too. Keeping it covered, washed. Fixing that head gasket won't take me more than a couple of days. Parts aren't that expensive or hard to come by. My dad taught me how to tear down an engine for that job. Does 250 under book value sound fair? Son, that seems a bit high for a truck that needs that kind of work. As I said, sir, the truck is well cared for. Your family paid a high price for the freedom I grew up enjoying, and extortion hardly seems fair repayment. There'd be lots of people willing to pay well above book value for your son's truck, if not for the head gasket. I can fix the truck myself, and that gasket is likely the only thing I'll have to touch. I won't even have to touch his bumper sticker, because Ken and I are both in the 82nd. Clem couldn't see Ken's access sticker for Bragg, with his car parked where it was. Jeff saw Clem hesitate for a moment before making his decision. You have yourself a deal, Jeff. Clem held out his hand and they shook on the deal. You boys come up to the house and we'll take care of the paperwork. Jeff and Ken shook Clem's hand again before leaving the house. He paid Clem in cash. They stopped next to Jeff's new used truck with keys and completed papers in hand 30 minutes later. You had him over a barrel if you wanted him there, Ken said. I know, but what good would that have done? I know you saw the USMC stuff around the house. It wouldn't have taken much to have him digging in his heels. Instead, I have a new truck, and he has one last good memory connected to his son. Ken nodded, even more impressed with his younger roommate. The two friends walked up the stairs of their barracks, along with two other soldiers from their platoon, one evening in early May. The four all wore a thick layer of camouflage paint on their faces and carried heavy rucksacks from their massed tactical training jump. With 1st Brigade five weeks into training cycle, the platoon jumped or ran some field training exercise almost every night. All four looked forward to showers, chow, and sleep. Jeff led the way up the stairs. He glanced through the window on the fire door before opening it. He raised his fist in the hand signal for freeze. The rest fell silent while he studied what he saw. Someone was in the room he shared with Ken. Nobody from the squad should be here. All had been on the jump that night. Jeff made the hand signal for enemy in sight and indicated 317. The others nodded. He indicated that the other two should provide security. He and Ken would confront whoever was in their room. He opened the door without making any noise. The impromptu assault section flattened themselves against the wall to stay out of sight. Jeff peeked around the doorframe. There was only one person was inside. Jeff gave a silent three count before he and Ken charged in. The two occupants of the room surprised the burglar. They crushed him against the far wall. He tried to get free, but Jeff yanked his underwear up until it almost ripped. The man's eyes watered and his stomach rolled before Ken drove him to the floor. Jeff knelt on his neck, holding him down. Hey, Sarge they heard one of the others in the hall say. Why aren't you jokers getting cleaned up yet? 
SSG Tyler stepped into view. What the hell's going on in here? He asked as he looked into room 317. We found fingers in here when we got back, Ken said. I can already tell there's stuff missing from our room, but we haven't had a chance to check that bag there. They're lying, Fingers cried. They dragged me in here. Jeff pressed his face into the floor a little harder. Johnson, call the MPs, Tyler ordered. Johnson stepped away to make the call. Fingers started making noise again. Shut up, Fingers. You were supposed to be on sick call. I'm betting you used that excuse for a chance to go through other people's rooms. Godfrey spread the word to have people check their shit. Godfrey, the other soldier who helped them, took off also. Ken and Jeff sat on fingers until the MPs arrived. The MPs took charge of the intruder, wrestling him out of the room in handcuffs. One MP stayed behind to interview Ken and Jeff. They were released an hour later. Gee, it's a good thing we weren't tired or anything, Jeff muttered while stifling a yawn. Yeah, that's exactly what we needed after a day of training. If you two are done clowning around, you should go get washed up, Tyler suggested when he came back into the room. Knox, remember you have your 24-hour CQ duty with Corporal Thomas at 0700 tomorrow? You might want to crash pretty soon. Roger, Sergeant. It's her June 1988, Belchertown Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Jeff felt his tires thump across the seam on the pavement when he crossed into his hometown. He'd been gone almost a year and this was his first visit back to where he grew up. He smiled as he saw a familiar building come into view. Jeff pulled his truck into its parking lot and under the trees along the lot's edge. He was careful to stay out of sight of the building's service base. The items on the wall behind the counter had changed while he'd been away. His official photos from basic training, AIT, and airborne school hung under a classroom-sized American flag, which jutted out from the wall. Familiar faces looked up as he entered. Jeff quickly put his finger to his lips. The men smiled, and one hooked a thumb towards the work area. Jeff shook hands with the mechanics before heading into the garage. He walked to someone working on a car. The person he was looking for was bent over into the engine bay. Jeff knocked on the fender of the car. Can I help you? The man's familiar voice asked in a distracted tone. Yeah, Dad, can you check my truck? 700 miles is a long drive. His father's head hit the hood of the car with a loud. A clang rang through the garage as the wrench he once held hit the concrete floor. His father stepped into view holding his head and a look of wonder crossed his face as he approached Jeff. He gathered his son into a crushing hug. Welcome home, Jeff, Joe said, the emotion clear in his voice. Glad to be home, Dad. Good to see you again, too. I thought I was picking you up in Springfield tomorrow. I'd rather drive those 700 miles between here and Bragg a dozen times than spend all day on a bus, Dad. Plus, I can pick my music in my vehicle. Gotta have the music. Have you been by the house yet? No, I came here first. Well, show me this truck before you go surprise your mother and sister. Jeff led his father out to the parking lot. There the older Knox ambled around the vehicle. Jeff held the keys out to his father so he could start the truck. Sounds fine. Better than it did when I bought it. Joe raised an eyebrow at his son. Had to replace the head gasket. The other brow rose. You did a great job, I can't even tell. Someone did a pretty good job of teaching me how to fix one. Joe threw an arm around his son's neck, ruffling his hair as he led him back to the garage. Put your stuff in your sister's car and head back to the house. What did she do to my car? Jeff cried. If you want to get technical, it's my car, Airborne. I told you it was her turn with it before you left, remember? I did a tune-up and an oil change on it this morning, that's all. Jeff walked away to collect his things, shaking his head, but his father was correct. He'd never admit that out loud, though. He put what little he brought home into his former car before driving it around to the front of the shop. He talked to the men working for his dad and learned that Jerry's son would start working at the garage soon. Jeff parked in the driveway in front of his house. He walked to the back corner and peeked around it. His mom and Kara sat on the back deck, enjoying the late afternoon sun. Jeff backed up and then casually walked around the corner, whistling and twirling the car's keys around a finger. Jeff, 
Kara cried as she scrambled off the deck to hug her big brother. Hi, sis. What are you doing here? What do you mean, did they cancel graduation or something? She swatted his arm. One day he'd have to address these violent tendencies the women in his life displayed. His mother's smile split her face while tears welled up in her eyes. Jeff hadn't been home since last July. Marisa began to cry as she held her son in her arms. She once feared he'd never come home again. Hey, Jeff said in a gentle voice. He pulled back from his mother and looked her in the eye. It's over. However you want to describe the first half of 87, it's over. The valley has always been my home. You've always been my mother. Neither of those changed while we went through that, okay? Marisa nodded and hugged him again. How'd you get here? Kara asked. I thought Dad was picking you up in Springfield tomorrow. I drove. I left Bragg in my truck about six this morning, stopped to see Dad at the garage, and then drove here in your car. My car? You drove my car? That's the one, yes. Her eyes narrowed. Well, Dad's checking my truck after the 700-mile drive I just took. Wait, what truck? Ah! The one I bought in March. Dad's bringing it back tonight after work. What did you get? A black 83 Chevy K10 4x4. Sweet. Jeff, do you want anything special for dinner on your first night home? Marissa asked. Food? Seriously, Mom, I don't want you to change what you plan to have for dinner at 4 in the afternoon. Whatever you guys are going to have is fine. We were just going to have pizza. Benny's? The women nodded. Perfect. I'll take a small sausage and black olive pizza. That's it? Kara asked, a smile on her face. You're right, I should get a large. I work out a lot. More than you used to? Kara laughed as her big brother chased her around the backyard. Marisa smiled at a familiar sight. Jeff studied at the dining room table before dinner later that evening, his books arrayed in an arc in front of him. What are you working on, Jeff? I'm finishing up my history class on America from the Revolution to the Civil War. I'm doing the last of the work I need to finish for sophomore year. You were still able to complete the year then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that I understand how the school system works along with our duty cycles, I think I can be a quarter of the way into my senior year by this time next year. Marisa tried to ruffle Jeff's hair as she did during his high school years, but the short, airborne-approved cut he sported now hardly moved. Mom, the ladies. Dad will be home with the pizza in 10 minutes, Romeo. Thanks for driving me in early, Kara said. Smiling at her, Jeff replied, of course, plus it gives mom and dad more time to get ready. Are you wearing your uniform today? Yep, he replied, hooking a thumb at the garment bag behind him. I'm proud you're in the army. I don't understand the desire to serve per se. But I want a picture of you. I can put right out in the open in my room at college next year. You know? Well, we'd better make sure that someone gets a good picture of the two of us today then, he stated, smiling at his little sister. Jeff pulled into the school parking lot. Given that the ceremony wasn't to start until noon, he found a spot without a problem. What are you going to do until noon, she asked. The same thing I told mom and dad. I'm going to see if I can use the weight room like I used to then shave, shower, and get dressed before noon. If I can't, I've got some schoolwork I can do. Come on, you've got to get in there for the practice session. Jeff escorted his younger sister into the school. Her class would practice for the ceremony over the next two hours, then they would line up for graduation. Jeff peeled off towards the gym, while Kara continued towards the auditorium where graduation would take place. He found the weight room where he left it last year. He also found his copy of the key for it still on his keychain. Coach Kessler gave him the key his freshman year. The noise from his workout attracted the coach, who greeted Jeff warmly. Jeff assured him that he'd return the key when he finished. Coach Kessler waved it off. Keep the key, Jeff, in case you want to work out here during another visit home, he told his former captain. What are you going to do? Steal the weights? Jeff headed down to the locker room at the end of his workout. He prepared his uniform and checked the shine on his boots before he shaved and showered. He was ready well before noon. He checked himself in the mirror. His Class A uniform was in order. The school asked graduation guests to use the auditorium's outside entrances. Jeff stepped through the outside door from the locker room 
and found himself right in the middle of the class of 1988 while they lined up outside. Everyone recognized him. Chris Miklich came over to shake his hand. Look at you, Chris said while they shook hands. Every girl's crazy about a sharp-dressed man and one in uniform. Hey, you're a PFC already? Chris was knowledgeable about its structure, even though he wasn't going to join the military. I did well in basic training and the training that came after, Jeff shrugged. They gave me an early promotion then, and my lieutenant told me about this one just before I came up here. I was able to get the stripes sewn on before I came home. You know Pauline's upset that you haven't written to her since before Christmas, right? Your sister and I parted as friends, he reminded Chris. I'll never forget the time I spent with her, but I've also accepted that I'm not going to be her one and only, either. I knew that when she got to Amherst, she'd find someone. Plus, I didn't want to cause her any trouble once I found out about her new beau. Is he a good guy? He is, Chris admitted. He treats her very well like you did. As well matched as you and Pauline were, they seem to be even more so. I wouldn't be surprised if Frank is her one and only. I'm happy for Pauline as long as she's happy. I'm happy that you guys are happy too. I'm also quite pleased that you guys won another state championship in hockey this year. Nothing like bookending your high school hockey career with state championships, that's for sure. I hope I can be part of a national championship while I'm at Michigan State. Jeff shook hands with Chris again before letting him get back in line. The ceremony was about to start, and Jeff had to find a place to sit, or maybe stand, given how many people showed up for the ceremony. He got a wink from Charlie Flaherty when he passed her. Jeff waved to the faculty members he remembered. He entered the hall and saw his parents had saved him a seat. The ceremony was standard fare and was over in due time. He filed out of the hall along with his parents to find his sister. The school offered a lunch for the graduates and their families in the cafeteria. Jeff felt a hand on his shoulder while waiting to be seated. He turned. Pauline Miklich stood behind him. With her stood Chris, their parents, and another young man he guessed was Frank. Pauline gathered the young private in a firm hug and kissed him on the cheek. You look as beautiful as ever, Pauline, he told her when they released each other. She blushed at the compliment. I'm mad at you, you know, she replied, trying to glare at him. You didn't need to be getting letters from me while you were starting a new relationship, Jeff answered. Is there anything wrong with two friends keeping in touch? No, but I didn't want to cause you any trouble either. She can cause her own trouble, as I'm sure you know, the other young man said. Pauline took exception to his remark. She screeched in outrage while she swatted at the other man's arm. The young man introduced himself as Frank McGann. It's good to meet you finally, Frank said. Pauline's mentioned you more than a few times over the past six months. I hope that hasn't caused any problems for you two. You're kidding, right? Being compared in a positive and complimentary way to someone who treated her like gold? Being told that I treat her as well now as you did in high school? I was shy in high school and didn't have much experience talking to let alone being with girls. It let me know my instincts were good. Don't worry about it. Jeff nodded to the young man before he turned and greeted Pauline's parents. He reintroduced the group to his parents and sister. They were seated at their table soon after that. Lunch was standard event fare, much like the ceremony itself was. Jeff rose with his family when it was time to leave. Excuse me, trooper, came an unfamiliar voice. Jeff turned to find an older gentleman with an 80-second airborne pin on his lapel standing behind him. He had noticed the gentleman with of one of the other families earlier. Yes, sir, Jeff replied, coming to attention just in case. I'm Ben Donaldson, David Donaldson's grandfather, the man introduced himself. Glancing at Jeff's unit crest, Mr. Donaldson asked, You're in the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, then? That's correct, sir. Alpha Company, 1st Battalion. I enlisted last year, after I graduated here at Tompkins, and hit the regiment before Thanksgiving. You, sir? I see you're wearing the division's pin. 325th Glider Infantry, son. I was a platoon leader in Dog Company, 2nd Battalion during the Normandy landings, and ended up at Battalion HQ by the end of the war. Jeff snapped a salute to the man upon hearing that he'd been an officer. 
Sir, Ben Donaldson tossed him a return salute. At ease, trooper, at ease. I've long since mustered out. I saw the patch and wanted to meet you. It looks like the division will be in good hands with your generation. I'll let you get back to your family now. Mr. Donaldson held out his hand. Jeff took it, of course, and saluted again. The older gentleman returned it and nodded to Jeff before walking away towards his own family. The respect Jeff showed the older gentleman and vice versa struck Marissa Knox. That level of respect made her realize how little respect she gave her son over his decision to enlist. He was in better shape than he'd ever been. She was impressed by the classes he was taking and that he was a year ahead of his peers. Like her daughter, she didn't quite understand his drive to serve his country and he hadn't taken the path she expected, but she was proud of him. Jeff pulled into a familiar driveway the following afternoon. He retrieved the flowers from the passenger's seat, walked up the path to the Newberry's front door, and knocked. He backed up, licking his lips nervously and let the front screen door close. He didn't want to be right on top of the person who answered. That person turned out to be Allison's mother, Dorothy. Well, this is a pleasant surprise, she exclaimed with a wide smile. She opened the screen and gave him a big hug. Are those for me? She smiled, touching the flowers. I think that might make Don jealous. Hello, Mrs. Newberry. How have you been? They're for your daughter if she'll accept them. And I don't think I could take Mr. Newberry in a fair fight. You fight fair, she laughed. Well, don't stand there all day. Come on in. I'm sure Allison will love the flowers. Jeff wiped his feet and entered the house, feeling transported back in time. He noted new paint colors in the living and dining rooms in the years since he'd been in the house. Come on back to the kitchen, Jeff. Don, Allison, and I were just having some coffee. Would you like a cup? I'm in the infantry, ma'am. Coffee's the fifth food group. I'd love a cup. Thank you. Mrs. Newberry laughed while they passed through the door to the kitchen. Allison and Mr. Newberry both looked up at the sound of her laughter. Allison let out a happy squeal and scrambled out of the breakfast nook. She bounded across the kitchen to hug Jeff. Somehow she was even more beautiful now than she'd been in high school. She surprised Jeff with a long kiss to go along with the hug. What are you doing here? She asked him, smiling while she molded herself to him. I came home for Kara's graduation yesterday, he explained as they made their way back to the table by the windows. I swung by your house during my nostalgia tour and saw your car. He shook Mr. Newberry's hand before sitting down next to his former girlfriend. We went to lunch in Amherst after church, then walked around the town a little, Mrs. Newberry explained, placing a mug of black coffee in front of Jeff and pushing the cream and sugar towards him. We just got back. She sat down next to her husband. Jeff nodded. I'm lucky then. Anyway, I went by the fresh cut in Prescott, picked up this bouquet for Allison, and returned. I hope I haven't disrupted any plans by showing up unannounced. Not at all, Jeff, Mrs. Newberry assured him. We were trying to figure out what to have for dinner. Can you stay? Allison immediately asked. If your folks won't mind the intrusion at Sunday dinner, Jeff asked, looking at the Newberries. Jeff, there are many words to describe you, but one of them is not intrusion, Mr. Newberry said. You welcomed my little girl into your circle of friends when I transferred to Westover and helped her feel at home in this community right away. You treated her with respect even before you started dating, and then like a queen once you did. Thank you, sir, Jeff said, nodding at the older gentleman. Turning back to the man's daughter, Jeff added, Allison, I also want to say I'm sorry for not keeping in touch better. My life's gotten somewhat hectic. Between the division's duty schedule and my schoolwork, I never seem to have much time. Schoolwork? Correspondence College, I'm finishing up my sophomore year in history. You're already a sophomore? Almost a junior? Yes, all those AP courses we took are proving very helpful. If there is anything better than a beautiful young woman in a bikini, it's one who is your date. Allison and Jeff visited Thompson's Pond Beach in New Salem the following afternoon. She lay on her towel, soaking up the sun. Jeff sat on his towel next to her with a textbook in his hands. What the hell am I doing? He asked himself. He put the book down and stretched out. I wondered when you'd finally put that thing down, Allison muttered. 
Hey, I'm trying to keep up with you. Good luck with that. Of course, I'm here with you, so that should count for something. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. You're a nut, all right. He reached over and held her hand. You're my nut, though, Brainiac. Allison pressed herself to his side. She kissed him, and the world faded away. His hands roamed over her back while they kissed. One hand drifted further south and squeezed her firm butt. She liked that. It's too bad this is a public beach, mister, she said, gazing into his eyes. I'm game if you are. She blushed as red as the bikini she wore. Well, maybe we'll wait on that. There were only one or two other couples on the beach since public schools were still in session. He kissed her nose. Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. I know you didn't, Jeff, she said, putting her head down on his chest. I tried to zing you, and you zinged me back. Are you seeing anyone in North Carolina? Anyone you're interested in? No, Allison, the unit I'm in is exclusively male. Most women on the base are also in the military, so one of us would head somewhere at some point. I'm pretty busy most of the time, so I don't go to the bars off post much, or anywhere else for that matter. Plus, whoever's next for me has to measure up to you and Pauline. That's a pretty tall order. What about you? Any prospects for you in and around Cambridge? She snorted. The guys there are either so shy and nerdy that they swallow their tongues when I walk into a room, or they could give lessons in dickheadedness to Brian Cosgrove. Allison, in all fairness to the nerds, you're an absolute knockout. I almost swallowed my tongue when I saw you in your bikini today. Allison kissed him again. You said you're leaving Friday? Yeah, my pass expires Saturday morning. How's it going there? It's a bit of everything, Jeff shrugged. It's easy and hard, intense and boring, challenging and stupid. I love it. You love it? All of that and you love it? It keeps me focused. I have to watch what I'm doing when I'm bored. I have to keep things straight when I'm up to my eyeballs and stuff. I have to stay in top physical shape. There's a purpose that drives you in that unit. Purpose? Within 18 hours of notification, the 82nd Airborne Division strategically deploys, conducts forcible entry parachute assault, and secures key objectives for follow-on military operations in support of U.S. national interests. Add that together with school and learning Japanese from my roommate and my plate's full. What was that first part? The 82nd Airborne Division's mission concept as stated in Division Pamphlet 602, which is 100 pages long. That's a book, not a pamphlet. I'll let you point that out to the general. Jeff spent the second half of his week home in Allison's company. The physical side of their renewed relationship didn't progress past second base, but that was fine with both of them. Allison received a much warmer reception from Marissa when she visited Jeff's house for lunch on Tuesday. His mother pulled Allison aside to apologize for how she treated the younger woman the previous year. Thursday night's goodbye between the young couple was much less emotional than the one last July. Thanks for stopping by Sunday. It's been wonderful being with you again. Of course, Allison, I enjoyed seeing you again too. He leaned down to kiss her as they stood in her driveway. She wrapped her arms around his neck. He'd remember that kiss for some time. You'd better stay in touch this year, Private. Call me? As you wish. She smiled. I love you too, you big softy. Be safe driving back tomorrow. Have fun storming castles. Jeff began the long drive back to Fayetteville after sunrise the following day. He pulled into the barracks parking lot 11 hours later, having made excellent time. He gathered his things and entered his room moments later. Ken informed him of a big heist at the company's supply depot over the week he'd been home. What did the thieves get? Nothing sensitive, thankfully, Ken answered. Sensitive items were equipment such as radios, code books, and weapons. Mostly LBE and related stuff. Jeff swung right back into the routine over the weekend. His brigade transitioned to training cycle on Sunday morning. He and Ken stepped out of their barracks room Monday morning, laughing as they headed to breakfast following PT. They looked up after they locked their door, and the laughter stopped. Five MPs surrounded them. Ken and Jeff snapped to parade rest upon seeing the staff sergeant commanding the contingent. Private First Class Jeffrey Knox? 
Yes, Staff Sergeant? Private Knox, you're under arrest. June 1988, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Private Knox, you're under arrest. What the hell? Jeff stood frozen in shock. The sergeant nodded to one of the MPs behind Jeff. The specialist stepped up to Jeff and snapped handcuffs on him. That brought Jeff out of his trance, but he did not react. The MPs were doing their jobs, and this was neither the time nor the place to act up. Private Knox, I want to advise you of your rights under Article 31 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. You have the right to remain silent, that is, to say nothing at all. Any statement you do make, either oral or written, may be used against you in a trial by court-martial or in other judicial, non-judicial, or administrative proceedings. You have the right to consult with a lawyer prior to any questioning and to have a lawyer present during any interview. You have the right to military counsel free of charge. In addition to military counsel, you are entitled to your choice of civilian counsel at your own expense. You may request a lawyer at any time during an interview. Do you understand your rights, Private? Yes, Sergeant. At this time, I wish to request the presence of military counsel before any questioning. One of the things he and Jack Dwachik talked about during their workouts was what to do if he was ever arrested. That discussion boiled down to him immediately requesting a lawyer and then keeping his mouth shut. Very well, the sergeant raised his radio. Bravo 03, uniform 06, suspect in custody. Suspect requests presence of JAG before questioning. Roger, 06, one in custody requesting JAG. 06 to all uniform units, suspect secure. The sergeant placed his radio back in its holder. He motioned for his men to follow him. Jeff, I'll call Sergeant Tyler, Ken called after him as the MPs led him away. His squad mates stared in disbelief from their doorways as they watched Jeff escorted down the hall in cuffs. Jeff's cheeks burned from embarrassment and anger. What the hell? Sergeant Tyler stood in the lobby next to the CQ desk by the time the group reached the bottom of the stairs. Sergeant, I'm Knox's squad leader. Can I ask what's going on? Private Knox is under arrest for theft of government property, conspiracy to commit theft, and other charges. He has requested counsel, as is his right under UCMJ Article 31, the MP sergeant explained. One of the other MPs placed Jeff's beret on his head in preparation for leading him outside. Thank you, Sergeant. The MP nodded at Tyler and then at his men. They led Jeff to a waiting MP cruiser and placed him in the back seat. They drove to the stockade, where they brought him inside for processing. They booked him and placed him in a holding cell. It approached 0900 and he still hadn't had breakfast. Jeff did push-ups and sit-ups to tire himself out and then laid down on the cell's bunk. There was nothing to do but wait. What the frickin' hell? Jeff reviewed his seven months at Fort Bragg over and over, trying to remember anything that could have caused him to land in the stockade. He couldn't think of anything. He hadn't had so much as an angry word spoken to him by anyone in authority since Jekyll's little test on his first day. They took his watch during booking and there was no clock he could see. Jeff didn't know how long he'd been in the cell when he drifted off to sleep. The clank of the lock turning in the heavy door woke Jeff. It took a moment to get his bearings, but he soon remembered where he was. Two MPs stepped through the door. Private, stand up, face the far wall, and put your hands behind your back. Jeff complied immediately. They handcuffed him again. Your lawyer's here. Let's go. The two MPs led Jeff to a small meeting room, where they removed the cuffs and motioned him inside. Jeff snapped to attention upon seeing the JAG captain waiting for him. Private Knox, I'm Captain Willoughby. She sported an 18th Airborne Corps patch on her uniform, as well as jump wings. Good morning, ma'am, Jeff barked. At ease, Private, have a seat. We have much to discuss. Jeff complied right away, sitting across from his attorney. Private, I've been assigned by the Corps Judge Advocate General's office as your counsel in this matter. Do you have any objections to that? Jeff was puzzled. No, ma'am. You'd be surprised how often people object to a woman as their counsel. That seems a little stupid, ma'am. I agree. Let's get to the matter at hand, shall we? The government alleges that you took part in a robbery on the night of 04 June and planned it as well. 
They are charging you with theft of government property, receiving stolen government property, breaking and entering into a government warehouse, and conspiracy to commit said theft. Jeff's head, which had already been spinning, spun harder. The captain was forced to get his attention because he took so long to process that information. Sorry, ma'am. It's a lot to take in all at once, Private. Don't worry about it. I've been reviewing your 201 file, and this doesn't line up with what I've read. Your record is spotless. This is not who I am, ma'am. I had no part in what I'm being accused of. Let's put aside the current charges for the moment. Talk to me about your career so far. Captain Willoughby led him through every minute detail of his career since he arrived at Fort Benning's reception center last year. She went back and forth through his tenure at Fort Bragg. They'd been at it for some time when Jeff closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose. Private, are you all right? My apologies, ma'am. A headache is all. I haven't eaten yet today. What? I was arrested as my roommate, and I headed to breakfast after PT this morning, ma'am. I haven't eaten. The captain's face set into a fierce scowl. She sprang from her chair and pounded on the door. Guard! The door opened immediately. Yes, ma'am, the guard asked. Specialist, you will get my client a meal immediately. He was arrested before breakfast and has been held here since. It is now almost 1600 hours and he has not eaten today. There had better be a meal here in under 15 minutes. Do make myself clear, specialist. Yes, ma'am. Make it a sizable one. Move, specialist. Yes, ma'am, the MP repeated. The door swung shut, locking as it closed. Jeff heard the specialist dart down the hall. Private, do you wish to wait until they bring you something? If we could, ma'am. I can't think straight at the moment. The specialist returned with a wrapped granola bar two minutes later. There's a tray coming for your client on the double, ma'am. Staff Sergeant Jennings ordered me to offer this granola bar to Private Knox in the meantime. The captain just nodded, the scowl still plain on her face. Thank you, specialist, Jeff said as the other man handed him the bar. The MP nodded and left the room. Jeff tried to eat slowly so he wouldn't look like a ravenous animal to the captain. I'm surprised you took the time to unwrap it, Private. I don't think I've ever seen anyone eat that fast. My parents have told me that meals last twice as long and cost half as much now that I'm out of the house, ma'am. Captain Willoughby laughed. Her parents said the same thing when her brothers moved out. Jeff's tray arrived ten minutes later. They provided him with a double portion of lasagna, a small salad, bread, jello, and two cartons of milk. All of that disappeared in 20 minutes. He was glad he could eat the meal with a spoon because that was the only utensil they gave him. Do you need a nap now, Private? The captain joked. Sorry, ma'am, I guess I was a little hungry. I'd hate to see it when you're really hungry. Stay clear of the intake, ma'am, and you'll be safe. The captain laughed again. The food cleared Jeff's head. Ma'am, they're alleging that I was part of the actual theft. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And the theft was last weekend? Yes. Jeff smiled. Ma'am, would it help if I could produce a solid alibi? Of course. I was 700 miles from here, in my hometown of Enfield, Massachusetts, last weekend, ma'am. The captain leaned forward. You can prove that? Yes, ma'am. My younger sister graduated high school on Saturday the 4th. I was on leave all of last week. I left Bragg at 0600 on 02 June and didn't return until this past Friday the 10th at 1700. The captain smiled upon hearing that news. I'll need the names and addresses of people you were with and when you were with them. Can anyone other than your family verify your whereabouts last week? Only about 200 people, ma'am. One of those people includes a World War II veteran of the 325th, an officer. I don't have the gentleman's address, but I believe I can get it for you. There will be the pictures the school photographer took as well, ma'am. Someone's trying to pin this on you. Yes, ma'am. It's all falling into place in my head now. Remember the barracks thief I mentioned? Willoughby nodded. Here's what I'm thinking. My roommate and I found that thief in our room after a training jump in mid-May. The theft last weekend occurred at my company's supply warehouse. When I in-processed at Alpha Company, 
The supply sergeant there tried giving me a set of LBE so encrusted with mud you could barely tell what it was. I called him on it. When I did, he tried telling me that I'd already signed for it, so I was stuck with it. The thing was, I hadn't signed for it. The sergeant told me to sign a receipt as soon as I walked in and before I was ever issued any gear. I've been told for years that you don't sign any receipt until you've inspected what you're signing for. When I pointed out to the surgeon that I hadn't signed the receipt, he got so red in the face, I thought he was going to blow a gasket. He snatched that gear back and threw it on the floor. He barked at one of his specialists to bring him another set without taking his eyes off mine. I've dealt with bigger bullies than him in the past, so I just stared right back. The specialist brought up another set of LBE and the sergeant slid it in front of me without a word. I counted the equipment I was issued, signed the receipt, and left. That's the last time I've dealt with him. I think the two are somehow connected. That fat little... The captain muttered. He's the one trying to hang this one on you. I'll lay odds that he and this fingers guy are tied in with each other. When you disrupted his supply chain, the sergeant started plotting his revenge. I'm going to hang him by his short and curlies. Jeff winced. That's one hell of a visual, ma'am. My priority is to make sure that you, my client, do not suffer from this. The word expunged keeps coming to mind, ma'am. That's a good word, but I think exonerated will be a better one. Any interest in becoming a lawyer? That was some good thinking there. No offense, ma'am, but I'd rather go back to my high school and have the soccer team kick balls at my head. For an hour. None taken, private, she chuckled. When was that training jump? The one when you caught fingers? I'm afraid you'd have to check with Alpha Company on that one, ma'am. I don't remember the exact date. It was the same day they arrested fingers. I think we're getting ready to hit the other side right between their eyes with a 2 by 4 What about the conspiracy charge, ma'am? Hearsay at best. I'll have to see what they have for evidence when they disclose their case to me. What will this do to my promotion and good conduct status, ma'am? Nothing. If I have anything to say about it, I'm going on a little trip. Don't talk to anyone about any of this. Capisce? Jeff endured ten more days of confinement. The court held his pretrial hearing on the Thursday after his arrest. It was all over five minutes after it started. The court-martial was scheduled to begin in two months. Pressure from Jeff's chain of command and a motion to dismiss from Captain Willoughby saw her before the assigned judge on the morning of Monday the 27th, however. Your Honor, defense moves to have this case dismissed, she said once in the colonel's office. On what grounds, Captain? Sir, my client was not on base when the theft occurred. I have affidavits from over 30 people, including a World War II veteran of my client's division, that my client was in Enfield, Massachusetts from 02 to 09 June. I have character references for my client there for you as well, Your Honor. Captain Willoughby stepped forward and handed the colonel a stack of papers. The man looked the stack over. The captain flew to Massachusetts last week and collected every affidavit herself. The chief of the Enfield, Massachusetts Police Department sent along a personal character reference for the accused. One of the department's patrolmen, a man who worked out with the accused for two years, and someone who'd known the accused since 1983, sent one as well. The stack of character references was as thick as the stack of affidavits. The stack of papers did not match the picture the prosecution had painted of the accused. The colonel looked over at the opposing counsel. Also, sir, the prosecution's case is almost entirely based on the word of the two likely architects of the theft. I believe the same two are also behind this attempt to ruin my client's record and reputation. John Flaherty, also known as Fingers Flaherty, was caught ransacking my client's barracks room. The MPs found items taken from other rooms, in the same barracks, in a bag he carried, at the time of his arrest. Staff Sergeant Terence Wendell, the company supply sergeant, harbors a grudge against my client. He couldn't stick Private Knox with a set of load-bearing equipment disguised as a ball of mud when Knox drew his equipment last December. Private Knox upset Wendell and Wendell wants revenge. My client's whereabouts are accounted for on every one of the dates of alleged planning meetings for the theft. As I've demonstrated, 
my client wasn't even in this state on the date of the theft. PFC Flaherty was in custody when he says my client spoke with him. The MPs have no record of my client even entering the stockade between Flaherty's arrest and his. My esteemed colleague, Captain Davis, has no hard evidence against my client. No video, no audio, and no writings that can be attributed to Private Knox. What Captain Davis does have is a reinforced brigade's worth of very pissed off people in the Privet's hometown. They are livid that he is being railroaded like this. They were practically lining up uses to come down here and storm the base. If there's another person on this installation who is held in such high regard by the people who know them, I challenge the prosecution to produce that person. The colonel listened to Captain Willoughby's speech and weighed her words along with the papers he held in his hands. Captain Davis, are you sure you want to proceed with this case? I'm looking at a certified copy of the accused's leave orders. I'm looking at over 30 affidavits that the accused was 700 miles from here on the night in question. I'm looking at a similar number of character references, letters from two members of his hometown police department, one of which came from the chief of that department. I see fuel receipts from the drive up and back and restaurant receipts from up and down the coast. What I don't see is any evidence Private Knox was involved in any way. All I see in evidence are statements from Sergeant Wendell and PFC Flaherty, and their personal character is more than in question at the moment. Do you think you may have jumped the gun by filing charges against this young man? Do you think you might have this one wrong? The Colonel stared at the prosecutor. Captain Davis swallowed as he looked over the stack of documents. I might have at that, Colonel, the man admitted. I agree with the defense's motion, sir. I too request the charges against Private Knox be dismissed. I further recommend they be dismissed with prejudice. So ordered. The case of the United States versus Knox is dismissed with prejudice. The matter is to be expunged from Private Knox's record and no further action will be taken against him. There will be no loss of pay or rank, no loss of promotion or good conduct status. He is due all appropriate leave accrual. The colonel picked up the phone on his desk. Sergeant Biggs, call the 503rd MP Battalion. Private Knox is cleared of all charges. They are to bring him and his belongings to my office. He is no longer a prisoner. Understood. Carry on, Sergeant. Fifteen minutes later, a bewildered Jeff Knox stepped into the colonel's office. He marched to the front of the colonel's desk and stood at attention, ramrod straight. Sir, Private Knox reports. At ease. Private, the case against you has been dismissed with prejudice. That means the government cannot take any more action against you in this matter. There will be nothing in your file to indicate any action was ever brought against you in this matter. Nor will there be any record of possible involvement in the matter itself. There will be no loss of leave, pay, rank, or any other negative consequences. You will be taken back to your barracks. You will be given the day off. I'll square it with your brigade commander. The stress of the past two weeks drained from Jeff, leaving him exhausted. He looked at Captain Willoughby with relief. She nodded at him, smiling. Her counterpart from the JAG office looked apologetic. Thank you, sir. Captain Willoughby, Sergeant Biggs will have paperwork for your client. That'll be all, people. Captain Willoughby, Private Knox, you're dismissed. Captain Davis, a moment, if you would. All the way, sir, Jeff and his lawyer said before filing out of the colonel's office. Jeff stood next to Captain Willoughby while she collected his paperwork from Sergeant Biggs. He was numb, but he was out of the cell and faced no charges. There are three copies there, ma'am, Sergeant Biggs told his lawyer. Let me know if you need any more. Efficient as always, Sergeant Biggs. Thank you. Private Knox, you ready to go? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Sergeant. You bet, Private. Don't let me catch you around here again, the Sergeant joked. Uh Jeff nodded and followed Captain Willoughby out of the office. She led him out of the building, one he hoped he'd never be near again. He stopped outside the front door and looked up at the clear blue sky. It's true, Private, the Captain said. She'd seen other clients do the same. Ma I've been trying to stay positive, ma'am, but there were times... Can we get out of here, ma'am? Absolutely. We're over here. 
Captain Willoughby pointed to the side parking lot where her car was. He was still in shock when they pulled up to the Alpha Company barracks for the 1st Battalion of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. He remembered nothing of the drive. All right, Private, here you are. As Sergeant Biggs said, don't let me run into you again. Ma'am, I don't know how to say thank you. You just did, Private Knox. She held out her hand. Good luck to you. Thank you, ma'am. Jeff climbed out of the car and made sure his beret was in place. He retrieved his belongings from her back seat. He saluted the captain from the sidewalk. She returned it and drove off. Jeff turned and looked at his barracks. He'd never been so happy to see it in the seven months he'd been stationed here. He strode to the building and pulled open the door. Professor. Hey, Shark Man. How's business? Shark Man was CPL Bill Nolan. He was the barracks loan shark and today's CQ. Ken and Jeff were on good terms with him because they never needed his services. The hell with that, how are you? Free and clear, Shark Man, free and clear. There'll be nothing in my 201 either. Outstanding, Jeff. The brigade office called and you've got the next two days off the duty roster. You're in the clear until Thursday morning. They'll fax the orders over to the company office in a few minutes. Jeff nodded, covering a yawn. I'm exhausted, Bill. I'm gonna go crash. What's 3rd Squad up to today? The whole company's at the range. Figures. I like range days. Go get some sleep, Jeff. You want me to wake you for lunch? Only if you want to go on sick call, Bill. Okay, he laughed. No wake-up call. Take it easy, Professor. Jeff waved and headed upstairs. He unlocked his door, dropped his belongings in the bottom of his closet, and collapsed on the bunk. Jeff? Jeff, out of the rack, Airborne. It's time for chow. Nolan, I told you you'd be on sick call if you woke me up, Jeff muttered, still face down in the pillow. Since when does Shark Man speak Japanese, round eye? Jeff rolled over to see Ken grinning down at him. He glanced at his alarm clock. It was 1745. Shit, I slept all day? Looks like it, Ken confirmed as Jeff sat up. Your uniform looks like it too. Jeff looked down to see a solid mass of wrinkles. Ugh, let me run through the shower and we'll get out of here. Jeff stripped off the uniform he'd worn since his arrest. He grabbed his shower stuff and hustled through the shower in the latrine. The friends left their room ten minutes after Jeff woke. This time, no MPs were waiting for him. The squad raised a cheer when he and Ken entered the dining facility for Chow. They quickly learned that Nolan hadn't been lying to them that Jeff had been cleared of all charges. Staff Sergeant Tyler shook his hand. SFC Huntula and 2LT Charrington came over to welcome him back to the platoon. Even CPT Hardesty, his company's CO, came by to welcome him back. Ken and Jeff prepared for lights out three hours later. They turned out the room's lights and crawled into their respective bunks. Jeff lay awake, staring at the ceiling. Hey, Jeff. Yeah? Welcome back. Thanks, man. I was trying to stay positive in there. Like I told my JAG lawyer, though. Some days got pretty bleak. You told me it's over, though. The judge made sure they can't come after you again. I've heard the captain won't let this affect your promotion status. He'd made up his mind on that even before he saw there was nothing in your file about the past two weeks. It's strange. I doubt I'll forget what happened, but with no record of it, it's like it never did. I'm just glad it's over. There's one positive that came out of it, though. There's a positive what? Jeff, we've been speaking Japanese this whole time. Ken was right. When I woke you up, we were speaking Japanese. We've been speaking Japanese since we left the DFAC to come back here. I'd say you're done with learning Japanese. 17 of December, 1988. Pope Air Force Base, North Carolina. Jeff stood in the space available waiting area at Pope Air Force Base, which borders Fort Bragg. The crew of a C-5 cargo plane on the ramp loaded a plastic-wrapped pallet through the maw under the aircraft's nose as he watched. Jeff wore his Class A uniform today, which was unusual for him when visiting Pope. His usual uniform on flights out of Pope was BDUs. Of course, he jumped out of those aircraft. Private? Someone asked from behind him. Are you the soldier looking to fly to Westover Air Force Base this morning? 
Jeff turned from the windows. An attractive blonde in a flight suit stood there looking at him. Her flight suit bore silver oak leaves on the shoulders, and her nameplate read, Let Call Donnelly. Yes, ma'am, he barked, coming to attention. At ease, trooper, she replied with a smile. Grab your gear and come with me. Yes, ma'am, he repeated, this time at a lower volume. He hustled to collect his duffel bag. Colonel Donnelly led Jeff onto the tarmac and toward the C-5. He fought the urge to put his beret back on because you don't wear covers on the flight line. Loose objects get sucked into engine intakes, which generates much hate and discontent among the aircraft mechanics, and is not a good way to get noticed. And the colonel showed him where to drop his gear when they stepped onto the plane. She walked over to her crew chief. He nodded at whatever she told him, and then came over to grab Jeff's duffel. I'll stow this for you, Private, he told Jeff. You follow the colonel. Yes, Sergeant. Jeff hustled, so the colonel wouldn't have to wait for him. She motioned for him to follow her. It was hard work climbing a ladder while trying not to look at the colonel's backside in her flight suit. He soon stood on the plane's flight deck. You're our only passenger, Private, so it doesn't make sense to have you sit in the aft seating area all by yourself. You'll have a headset to listen to things and someone else to talk to sitting up here. She smiled at him again. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. We've got about 15 minutes of pre-flight, and then we'll be off. Hang your uniform blouse in that corner there with our jackets. You'll be warm enough up here without it, and it won't get wrinkled that way. We'll get you on comms before we lift, so get yourself strapped in at the navigator station. She motioned to the station behind him. There's no navigator on this flight. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Jeff noticed another headset like the flight crew wore hanging from a strap on the console. He figured out how and where to plug in. Jeff heard the flight crew going through their checklists. He remained quiet so he wouldn't annoy the officers doing their jobs. Someone tapped him on the shoulder, snapping him out of a daydream. He pulled off the headset and turned. You got yourself on comms already? The co-pilot asked. The captain double-checked Jeff set his radio interface to the inner crew communications channel and for voice activation. Yes, sir, it seems straightforward. Good deal, Private. We get trainee pilots who can't figure it out, so it's nice to get a problem solver once in a while. The captain turned back to the colonel. Ready to go, ma'am. Roger. Colonel Donnelly put her headset back on. Pope Tower, Victor 03 is requesting permission to taxi. Victor 03, take taxiway Alpha to runway 23 and hold short of the active, came the reply from the tower. Roger, tower. Alpha to 23 and hold short. Victor 03 is rolling. Five minutes later, they were in the dark early morning air heading northeast. Jeff felt the flight deck relax after another five minutes of climbing and course adjustments. So, Private First Class Knox, Jeffrey Andrew? Colonel Donnelly's voice asked through the headset. What gets you to the Space A waiting area at zero dark 30 in hopes of catching a ride on a cargo flight headed to an Air Force base in Western Massachusetts two and a half hours later? My family's annual Christmas party is this afternoon, ma'am. I'm trying to surprise them. No one knows I'm coming home. Ambitious, she muttered, looking over her shoulder at him. Where's the party? Dana, ma'am, it's about 20 miles east of Westover. I'm originally from Greenwich, Trooper. I know where Dana is. She looked back over her shoulder again, giving him a friendly smile. Is that where you're from? Almost, ma'am. I'm from Enfield. My cousin hosts the party at her house in Dana every year. When they learn I'm from Massachusetts, most people expect me to have that accent. It doesn't matter that I grew up about 100 miles from Beantown. I mean, who calls Boston that anyway? He chuckled. There are times, you know, when I can turn on that wicked pissa accent and drive people frickin' crazy when I ask them to go out to my car and grab the bee as I got at the packy. I sound like a wicked masshole when I wanna. Jeff coughed. Um, pardon my language, ma'am. The flight deck broke out in laughter. Hell, trooper, that was perfect. The four-hour flight passed before Jeff knew it. The flight crew engaged Jeff in discussing the book he brought with him, Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising. The debate over the book's accuracy and the overall premise was quite interesting. Jeff felt the officers listened to, 
and considered his comments and opinions and offered thoughtful counterpoints. Jeff had studied military hardware and capabilities for some time, which helped him present strong arguments. The landing at Westover was an unremarkable one. The aircraft soon taxied to its assigned spot on the ramps. Jeff shrugged into his blouse when the plane came to a stop and got himself squared away. He made his way down to the cargo deck and found his duffel. Colonel Donnelly approached him while he collected his gear. Come on with me, Private. I'll escort you over to the Space A waiting area here. Thank you, ma'am. How are you getting to Dana? She asked him as they made there across the tarmac. She waved off his offer to carry one of her bags for her. Since I'm apparently too young to rent a car, I've made arrangements with a car service, ma'am. The service said to call from the waiting area if the car's not already here. It'll only be a 20-minute wait in that case. The security police have cleared their drivers to come on base. They entered the waiting area, and Jeff immediately spotted the payphones. Colonel Donnelly appeared to be looking for something or someone, so he stuck close. Private, my daughter's supposed to be meeting me here to drive us home, but she hasn't arrived yet. Would you watch my large bag while I take this one and clean up? Of course, ma'am. I'm going over there to call the car service, and then I'll be in those seats there. Do you want me to watch for your daughter while I wait, ma'am? In case you're not out before she arrives? Thank you, Private, she replied with another genuine smile. She withdrew something from her flight suit and showed it to Jeff. Here's a picture of Heather. She's a little taller than I am. Yes, ma'am, Jeff muttered before Colonel Donnelly put the photo away. Heather Donnelly's image burned itself into his brain. The young woman in the photo was even more beautiful than her mother. Wow. Jeff got to the phone without hurting himself and dialed the number of the car service. A short, disappointing conversation later, he made his way back to the seats where he dropped the bags. Heather Donnelly's picture caused the fog he'd been in on his way to the phones. Returning to his seat, it was due to the car service canceling on him. The driver, the service's owner who'd been covering for another employee, wasn't coming. The owner was in a serious accident after leaving the garage. EMS took him to the trauma center in Springfield. The dispatcher, the owner's wife, tearfully apologized to Jeff for leaving him stranded. He hung up after expressing his sympathies to the distraught woman. Jeff dropped back into his seat. His grand scheme for today was coming undone. While Jeff looked around in disbelief, the front door opened and a beautiful, young, blonde woman entered. Heather Donnelly had arrived. Jeff pulled himself out of his seat and intercepted the young woman. Excuse me? Miss Donnelly? Heather Donnelly stopped and regarded the young soldier. The dark green of his army uniform was out of place compared to the standard colors on an Air Force base. The Air Force wore uniforms of sage or blue. A barber had shaved off most of the soldier's dark hair, leaving only an airborne approved high and tight. His blue eyes were fixed on her green ones and weren't raking up and down her body. There was no sign of the arrogant sneers she'd become accustomed to seeing around Amherst. He had a respectful tone in his voice and addressed her as someone who learned proper manners. Yes? Private Knox, is it? She replied, reading his last name off his Class A nameplate. Yes, Miss Donnelly. Your mother asked me to watch for you while she cleans up. Jeff motioned to the bag next to his. Her bag is here, as you can see. Would you care to sit? I was about to get something to drink from the machines over there. Would you like something? Heather smiled at the earnest young man in front of her. She sensed a genuine, friendly vibe from him. Her drive from Amherst had been slow and difficult due to the snow squalls she encountered on the way. Yes, please, thank you. If they have something resembling hot chocolate, Jeff nodded and walked off to accomplish that task. <laughs> Jeff made his way back to the chairs after collecting the beverages. He managed not to spill either her hot chocolate or his coffee. <laughs> Heather Donnelly was even easier to talk to than her mother, not just because she wasn't a senior officer. She was one of those rare women he didn't already know that he could talk to right away. Either that or his high school relationships with Pauline and Allison had helped get him past his lingering shyness. Heather learned that his ride to Dana fell through 
and that he hadn't yet made alternate plans. We're headed home to my grandparents' place in Greenwich. We can drop you off on the way, Heather stated with finality. I can't ask you to do that, Miss Donnelly, Jeff protested. Your drive home is family time. I'd be intruding on that. Plus, Dana's not really on the way to Greenwich. First off, I told you earlier that my name is Heather, not Miss Donnelly. I'm barely a year older than you are, thank you very much. Second, you didn't ask, I offered. Third, it's not negotiable. You came all this way to surprise your family and we're going to make sure that happens. You best do what she says, Private, Jeff heard from his left. He tried to come to attention, but Colonel Donnelly waved him back into his seat. Heather's even more stubborn than I am at times. You mentioned your cousin's house is just off of Route 21 in North Dana, right? Jeff nodded. And the party starts at 1300? Another nod. Then let's get moving. The colonel insisted that Jeff sit in the front of the SUV with Heather. The colonel stretched out across the back seat and was asleep before they drove through the base's main gate. Jeff learned Heather was studying history at UMass and that her goal was to become a history professor. She was also minoring in Spanish. This girl is scary smart, he thought to himself, and beautiful, funny, sarcastic. He was intrigued. Heather found that Jeff could keep up with her in a conversation about history. Most people her age she met were unable to do that. She could see that Jeff loved history as much as she did. He'd educated himself very well despite just being a soldier. Heather frowned when he referred to himself in that way, even if it was in jest. Her grampy Kavanaugh, her mom's dad, served as a soldier for many years. Heather thought the world of him. Both were much more than just soldiers. They approached Dana and the end of their ride together. Their conversation dropped off while Jeff guided Heather to his cousin's house. It was only minutes before the 1300 start time when they pulled in front of the house. Jeff saw his Uncle Fred's car already in the driveway. The man was more than punctual. Jeff was sure he'd already been there 30 minutes. Well, Heather said with a sigh when she pulled to the side of Doubleday Village Road. Here you are. Yeah, Jeff replied in the same manner. He had a thought, and his mood brightened. Hey, do you and your mother want to come in to stretch your legs and maybe have a quick bite before you head home? <coughs> Heather brightened too and turned to look at her mother. Can we, Mom? Can we? Jane Donnelly smiled as she shook her head in amusement. She didn't see her 20-year-old daughter asking that question, but the pigtailed six-year-old she'd once been. Jane knew she couldn't say no. Monica Sellers wiped her hands on a dish towel while she approached her front door. She was surprised that whoever it was bothered to knock. Family knew just to walk in on days like this. Monica opened the door to find someone in an army uniform, standing on the front stairs, facing away from her. Two women standing at the bottom of the stairs looked up toward the soldier. Monica could tell that the two women were related. May I help you? Hey, Mon, Jeff said in an exaggerated Jamaican accent while he turned, a long-standing joke between his older cousin and him. Monica smiled as she stepped out of her house to hug the much taller man. You and your surprises are going to be the death of someone, one of these days, she scolded him. I'm voting for it to be you, you troublemaker. Gotta keep people on their toes, Mon. Monica, I'd like to introduce you to Heather Donnelly and her mother, Lieutenant Colonel Jane Donnelly. Heather Colonel, this is my cousin Monica Sellers, our host for today. Mon, the ladies gave me a ride here from Westover. I offered them something to eat and drink, if that's okay. You think we're ever in danger of running out of either in this family? You ladies are more than welcome to come in. This guy? I think I'll make this guy stand out here for an hour or two. Jeff smiled and held the door for the women while they entered. He collected their coats and passed them to Monica when she held her hands out for them. I'll run these upstairs while you go say hi to your aunts and cousins. Where's your mom? All the aunts are in the kitchen. Where else? Go on. Jeff led the Donnellys through the house to the kitchen. He startled his aunts when he appeared in the doorway. He put a finger to his lips, nodding at the woman at the stove. Who was at the door, Monica? That woman asked while she continued to stir a pot of something. 
I know I've been gone a while, Ani Merowin, but I don't think I look all that much like your daughter, Jeff replied, stepping into the room. His Aunt Marilyn dropped her spoon and rushed over, a smile on her face. Jeffy, oh, come here! As his mother's oldest sister, Jeff spent many a sick day with Marilyn Burlingame when he was younger. The two had a special bond, though he loved all of his aunts. Marilyn joked he was her oldest grandkid. Ani Merowin was how he pronounced her name when he was little. His four other aunts came over to join the hug, and the noise level in the kitchen rose. Ladies, I'd like you to meet the two women responsible for getting me here today. He pointed out the two women just inside the door. Lieutenant Colonel Jane Donnelly was the pilot of my flight from North Carolina to Westover this morning. Her daughter, Heather, offered me a ride here when my transportation from Chicopee fell through. Ladies, allow me to introduce my mother's sisters, my aunts Marilyn, Carolyn, Gwendolyn, Gerilyn, and Ashlyn. The Donnellys both raised eyebrows. Yeah, Grandma and Grandpa have a sense of humor. What's your mom's name, Jeff? Heather asked. Marissa. Heather just stared at him. We used to call her Marissa Lynn growing up, his Aunt Jerry explained. Hey. It sounds like there's a bit more to that story, Jane remarked. There is, but that's a story for another time, Marilyn commented. Would you ladies like something to drink? Where are Grandma and Grandpa? Jeff asked when he received his requested soda. Grandpa's holding court in the sunroom as usual, Monica replied. Grandma's flitting around here somewhere, as usual. You and Heather go ahead, Jeff, Jane said. I'll stay here and chat with your aunts some more. Jeff nodded and escorted Heather out of the room and through the rapidly filling house. Her head spun, trying to keep the names of all Jeff's cousins straight. Wait until all of the aunt's kids start having kids, he warned her. Thanksgiving and Christmas will be nuts. They finally reached the sunroom. Grandpa Keolis sat in a recliner pontificating to his sons-in-law on some subject. He clapped happily and sprang from the chair when he saw his grandson. He slapped Jeff on the back over and over during their hug. Jeff, I didn't know you were coming today. That's okay, Grandpa, neither did anyone else. You and your surprises, Nick said, shaking his head. One of your last surprises nearly bit you in the ass, boy. You're right, Grandpa, but things are better now. Speaking of good things, let me introduce you to a friend of mine. He held out his hand to Heather, who stepped closer. Grandpa, this is Heather Donnelly from Greenwich. She and her mom gave me a ride here from Westover. Heather, this is mom's dad, Nicholas Keolis. It's very nice to meet you, sir. The pleasure is all mine, Miss Donnelly. Nick kissed the back of her outstretched hand, causing Heather to blush. You should get rid of this whippersnapper and let a real gentleman show you how he treats a lady. How's that going to work out for you when Grandma hears about that, you wolf? You've got your own girl, now leave mine alone. His grandfather laughed while Jeff noticed his family's car pull up to the house. Looks like it's showtime, Grandpa. Nick turned to see his youngest and her family walking up to the house. He patted Jeff on the arm. Jeff held his hand out to Heather and led her to the front of the house. Monica positioned her and Jane on the opposite side of the entry hall to draw his family's attention, while Jeff ducked behind the door. Hi, Aunt Marisa. Merry Christmas. Hi, Monica. Merry Christmas to you. Thanks. Hi, Uncle Joe, Kara. Merry Christmas. I'd like to introduce you guys to Jane and Heather Donnelly from Greenwich. One of our family members brought them here as guests today. Who's that? Marisa asked. Me, Jeff said when he stepped into view. Can I take your coats for you? Kara's head whipped around and she leaped at her brother. Jeff! Marissa's head turned slower. Tears formed in her eyes while a hand covered her mouth. She began to sob. Jeff released Kara and drew his mother into a hug. Hi, Mom. You big stinker, I can't get leave this year. You're so full of it. Until about five days ago, I couldn't. The guy granted leave this week caught a 15-day barracks restriction last week, so they canceled his leave, and my lieutenant offered it to me instead. I don't have to go back until after New Year's. I had to scramble a little to make it work, and the colonel and Heather helped me out big time today. Leave it to you to fall into a pile and come up smelling like roses, Jeff, his dad remarked as he stood next to Heather and Jane. The colonel's been filling me in on your day, since you guys are right here, 
You can be first through the line for the food, Monica said. Did Grandpa get his plate already? Kara asked. Yep, just brought it to him. Go ahead. Jeff escorted Heather into the dining room. He pointed out his family's favorite dishes and his personal ones. They found seats on a couch in the living room once their plates were full. Jeff ate while Heather and Kara talked, getting acquainted. So what's all that new stuff on your uniform, Jeff? His sister asked at one point. Jeff looked down and started pointing out various items. That's my EIB, the expert infantryman's badge. The ribbons haven't changed since June. Jump wings are the same. I'm shooting expert with both the rifle and pistol now, so I got rid of the other marksmanship badge I had. Not too much different. I just rearranged things a little, that's all. Anyway, how did your first semester at MassArt go? Not bad. Kara studied graphic design at the Massachusetts College of Art. It's a bit of a culture shock with all the people who live in Boston after growing up here. Visiting a city is one thing. Living in, it's quite another. Yeah, Bragg's got about 35,000 of us there. You add the training areas, and I think the valley would fit inside the base two or three times. It's a little strange. And you've had no more trouble there. Kara referred to his legal issues after her graduation. No, no issues. You only have to go as far as Amherst for culture shock, guys. Heather chimed in. Even the size of Valley Regional High School didn't prepare me for how many people are at UMass when I got there two years ago. Speaking of school, how are your classes going, Jeff? Kara asked. Good. He mumbled with his mouth full. He swallowed his food. Sorry, they're going well. I'm about three quarters of the way through junior year. The Army's been kind enough not to interrupt my schedule with deployments. Wait, you're already a junior? Heather asked. I thought you graduated in 87, a year after I did? I did. Most of my senior year classes were AP classes. The college gave me credit for all that and placed me into my sophomore year right away. It's a correspondence school, so they send me the next class module once I return one. I don't go off base much and crank through the work. The guys call me professor. Tell her how many languages you speak too, Kara added with a grin. How many? Heather asked him. Three. Three? Three including English? I guess it would be four then. Heather stared at him. English, French, Spanish, Japanese. He counted off. Japanese? Hi. My roommate grew up speaking it. He's been teaching me. Don't be too impressed, Heather. He probably only knows the swear words. Shut up, kid. Jane, can I get you some more wine? Marissa asked. No, thanks, Marissa. I limit myself to a glass a night when I drink, and I've already had three this afternoon. You'll have to pour me into the car if I have another. May I have some water? Of course. Jane, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm surprised you and Heather have been here this long. Doesn't that fall under fraternization? Joe asked. What's that? Marisa asked as she returned with Jane's water. The military insists on a strict separation between officers like me and enlisted personnel like Jeff, Marissa. That's why I've been over here today while the kids are over there. I'm hanging out with you guys, not Jeff. He's hanging out with Heather. There shouldn't be a problem. Your family's made us feel right at home. Mom and Dad understand why we've been here so long. Your daughter seems to have hit it off with our son, Joe remarked while nodding toward the couch. The young couple in question sat on the couch together. Jeff had his arm around Heather while they laughed about something. Heather leaned back into him, looking very comfortable. I've never seen her warm up to someone that fast, Joe. Your son is a remarkable young man. I've been impressed with him since we met this morning. Thanks, Jane. So you called your parents? Yes, thank you. Mom found it amusing that we got way late at a party. Heather and I aren't exactly party animals. You said you're from Greenwich. Who are your parents? Alice and Tom Cavanaugh. Do they live on East Street? Jane nodded, sipping her water. Your folks are customers of mine. I own Valley Automotive on 21 and Enfield. Does Jeff know who your dad is? No, I don't think so. Joe smiled. How would you like to help us get a little payback on our son? How do you mean? Well, here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> the flurries Heather encountered earlier in the day had returned, 
leaving a dusting of snow blowing across the pavement an hour later. The light flakes stuck to Heather's hair while Jeff walked the Donnellys out to their car. He didn't think Heather could look any more beautiful. He was wrong. Would it be okay if I called you while you're home on break? Jeff asked Heather as they stood on the side of the road. I'd like that, the young blonde said with a big smile. Heather gave the tall young paratrooper her phone number, a hug, and a quick kiss on the cheek before climbing behind the wheel. Jeff turned to the colonel. She stood next to the rear quarter of their vehicle, smiling at the scene. I didn't think of this before, ma'am, but is this going to cause you any problems? Jeff asked. No, Jeff. Jane smiled at his thoughtfulness. Are giving you a ride home. Even hanging out here with your family won't be a problem. And before you ask, I don't have a problem with you going out with Heather either. Are you sure, ma'am? Your daughter's a special young woman. I'm just a soldier and... Private! She snapped in an angry tone, cutting him off. Don't let me hear you say that about yourself again. Do you understand me? Yes, ma'am! He barked, snapping to attention. Airborne! I expect to see you at my parents' house for dinner sometime next week before Christmas. Clear? Crystal, ma'am, Jeff replied, saluting. Good night, ma'am. Good night, Jeff, Jane answered, returning the salute. We'll see you next week, 22nd of December, 1988, East Street, Greenwich, Massachusetts. Jeff walked up to a colonial farmhouse in Greenwich the following week. He shifted the items he carried in his hands, took a deep breath, and used the brass knocker on the front door to announce his presence. He heard footsteps approaching the door after a few moments of silence. The door opened to reveal an attractive and familiar-looking older woman. Jeff realized this must be Mrs. Cavanaugh, Colonel Donnelly's mother. Despite the scowl on her face, it was easy to see how both younger women inherited their looks. You must be Mr. Knox, our wayward young paratrooper. My daughter and granddaughter have yammered about you nonstop. Mrs. Cavanaugh said with a clear tone of disapproval. Yes, ma'am. Not very impressive for a paratrooper to need to have women come to your rescue. Well, I've heard many women find vulnerability in men attractive, ma'am. Therefore, shouldn't one allow the damsels to rescue you from time to time, Mrs. Cavanaugh? Alice Cavanaugh couldn't maintain the facade any longer, nor could she help but laugh at the response. This young man didn't take himself too seriously, she could tell by the good clothes he wore that he had thought about meeting her family. I can see we're going to get along just fine, Jeff. Alice Cavanaugh laughed as she stepped aside, opening the door wider. Please, come in. Jeff stepped into the entryway after wiping his feet on the provided mat. This is for you, Mrs. Cavanaugh, Jeff said, holding out the poinsettia he had been carrying. Thank you, Jeff, Alice said. Please call me Alice. This young man has been doing his homework, she thought. Heather must have told him I like poinsettias, and I'll just bet that bag he's holding has a bottle of scotch for Tom. She turned to place the plant on a side table before taking Jeff's coat. You go on into Tom's den there, Alice indicated a door on the other side of the family room. I suppose he wants to talk to you before dinner. Yes, ma'am, he muttered. Jeff had expected Heather's grandfather would want to talk to him, but he wasn't sure he was looking forward to it. He knew Heather told her grandparents all about him, but she hadn't told him much about them in return. He tried not to walk like a condemned man as he made his way into Mr. Cavanaugh's den. He wasn't sure he was all that successful. Stepping into Tom Cavanaugh's den felt like stepping into his company commander's office. There were twice as many items on the I Love Me walls, though. Behind the oak desk stood an American flag, a U.S. Army flag, and a dark blue Army regimental flag. Jeff read 504th Infantry Regiment on the regimental flag scroll, moving as close as he dared. Holy shit, Jeff muttered. Looking around, Jeff learned Tom Cavanaugh was once Colonel Thomas Cavanaugh. He'd been the final full regimental commander of the 504th Parachute Infantry. A quick tour around the rest of the room told him more about Tom Cavanaugh's career. He started as an enlisted man, received a battlefield commission, had been awarded the Combat Infantryman's Badge three times, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, received a Silver Star, two Bronze Stars for Valor, made a combat jump and was wounded three times. 
All that crap just means I got lucky, son, came a quiet voice from behind him. Jeff spun around and snapped to attention. Airborne all the way, sir, he barked to the older man in his best parade ground voice. Tom Cavanaugh couldn't help but smile at the young man standing before him. Heather was a big fan of his. Jane seemed to be keen on this kid, too. Alice gave him the look when he told her he would be talking to their guest. He decided to take a softer approach with this visitor than the boys Jane and Heather dated when younger. All the way, son, Tom answered, walking over with his hand out. Jeff shook hands and returned to the position of attention. Relax, son, relax. Come, have a seat. Tom noticed the brown paper bag in his hand as Jeff settled into his chair. What do you have there? Tom asked. I brought this for you, sir. Jeff held the bag out to Tom. Tom's eyebrows rose when he saw what it held. Jameson Black Barrel? Son, this is too much. It's just a token, sir. Your granddaughter already means a lot to me, sir, regardless of where our relationship may or may not go. I want to assure you that I am not looking for a quick score with Heather. Tom looked at the young man in front of him. He was a good judge of character. He sensed that Jeff was honest with him. Alice had already made her decision about the boy, as had Jane. Jeff wouldn't even be in the house if either of them felt otherwise. I believe you, Jeff. What's your sense of where this relationship is headed? I've only talked to your granddaughter for a few hours, but I feel that I've grown very close to her. She's an amazing young woman, smart as a whip, has a great sense of humor, and is absolutely beautiful. We only have 10 days before both her semester break and my leave end. Our future goals don't exactly line up at this point, but I'm hoping we both can relax and at least develop a lasting friendship in that time. Tom nodded as he listened to Jeff. This kid gets it, Tom thought. He's well-spoken and has been taught good manners. Too bad he's probably right about them being together long term. I hope he sticks around though. I like him already. Boys dinner, came the call from the other room. Come on, Jeff, Tom said, rising from his seat. Let's not keep Alice waiting. She won't let us have dessert if we're late to the table. Jeff was a regular visitor to the Cavanaugh household over the next week and a half. Heather made similar visits to his house, where his family welcomed her in return. He spent the majority of his second week on leave in Greenwich, getting to know her family. It neared the time when Heather would return to Amherst, and Jeff would head back to Fort Bragg. He and Heather checked out a new brew pub in Amherst Center on December 30th. There were plenty of tables available when they got there. It was still early enough in the evening that the crowds hadn't turned out yet. Tomorrow night, however, on New Year's Eve, the place would be an absolute madhouse. The food was delicious and the pub's beers were great, but the knucklehead behind him kept bumping into him. Jeff tried to ignore him. How's the calamari? Heather asked. Excellent. Your sliders? The same. Heather watched the man behind Jeff lean back in his chair, bump Jeff, and not say anything. Again. Heather looked over at him. Really? Her look asked. Jeff closed his eyes and shook his head. He was picking up his beer to take a sip when he overheard the jerk's conversation. Oh, I played that naive little bitch, but good. She thought we were boyfriend and girlfriend. Jeff's beer paused halfway to his mouth while the man's friend asked something he couldn't make out. I've been doing her for the past two months. I got what I wanted from her, all right. I dumped her ass today. Another question. Yeah, the little blonde bimbo from MIT. Her name? Alice? No, Allison. Allison Newberry, that was it. Yeah, from New Salem. Jeff saw red. Allison was one of his best friends. This asshole had used her and then dumped her without a second thought. Jeff slammed his beer down. It sloshed over the edge of the glass. He stood up so fast his chair shot backward away from him. He wheeled around. The jerk was in mid-lean when Jeff's hand grabbed the front of his shirt. He shoved the jerk back hard. The man's eyes bulged as he lost his balance and Jeff slammed him to the floor. The man's eyes also bulged because Jeff twisted his collar so tight it cut off his air supply. Only Jeff's grip on his shirt kept the jerk's head from bouncing off the floor. Jeff knelt and put his nose in the jerk's face. Wrong place, wrong time, asshole, he growled. Allison Newbury is one of my best friends. Jeff saw movement out of the corner of his eye. Sit your asses back down, 
he barked to the jerk's friends. Karma's paying your friend here a little visit. You want some? There'll be plenty to go around after I snap his neck. Jeff turned his attention back to the jerk. The jerk's face was turning blue from the restricted airflow. That blonde bimbo has more brains in her pinky than you have in your whole body. She earned her way into MIT. She worked her butt off to get there and earn her scholarship. Did daddy buy your way into Harvard? Be advised, dipshit, that if you ever come near her again, I will put my foot so far up your ass, you'll be able to smell my boot polish. I will then cut your dick off and make you choke on it. Then I'll get angry. When you're the assistant night manager at some quickie mart somewhere, and you're begging the armed robber not to shoot you in your pathetic, shit-filled head, that girl will literally be figuring out the secrets of the universe. Fat lot of good your Harvard education will do you then. You're not smart enough to learn anything. Jeff slapped the man on the side of his head. A wet stain spread across the front of the man's pants. A different, fouler odor made its presence known as well. He let go of the man's collar and stood. The manager and bartender of the pub stood next to a startled Heather. I apologize for the disturbance, gentlemen. I'll put some money on the table and we'll leave. It's fine, just go, the manager replied. I'm paying for our drinks, our food, and making sure Sandra gets the tip she deserves, Jeff insisted before he dropped $50 on the table. Everything was excellent. Again, I apologize to you, your staff, and your patrons. Jeff looked down at the jerk still quivering on the floor. Well, most of your patrons. Heather? The pub was silent while they left. Heather said nothing during the walk back to his truck. Jeff unlocked the passenger's door before holding open it for her. She hesitated. Heather, if you're uncomfortable being with me now, I'll pay for a cab to take you back to Greenwich. She ignored his offer of a cab. What happened back there, she asked. That jerk was bragging about a conquest of his at college. That conquest is one of my best friends from Tompkins. I've known her since her family moved here in 1985, and we dated during our senior year. I'm sorry, Heather, but I need to go check on her tonight. Where does she live? New Salem. May I come with you? Jeff looked a question at her. What? I was startled, that's all. It was just after seven in the evening when Jeff and Heather pulled into the Newberry's driveway. He escorted Heather to the door and knocked. Don Newberry answered. Hi, Jeff, the man said in a tired voice. Don, we just heard what happened and came to see Allison. She's up in her room. Dottie's trying to help her calm down. You two come on in out of the cold. Jeff let Heather enter first. He introduced her to Don. Jeff, you bring your girlfriend to check on your ex-girlfriend? Jeff and Heather shared a glance and smile. I don't know if Heather and I consider ourselves boyfriend and girlfriend. We are friends, though. As I explained to Heather on the way here, Don, the operative word is friend. Allison was my friend long before we started dating and continues to be, even though our relationship is over. I don't forget my friends. Don Newbury nodded at his words. Mr. Newbury, would it be okay if I stayed here while Jeff goes up to see Allison? That'll be fine, Heather. It'll give me a chance to learn about the intriguing young lady Jeff brought to my doorstep tonight. The one who would go to another woman's house, her date's former girlfriend while on a date with him. Heather smiled at Jeff. Go check on Allison, Jeff. I'll be fine. She kissed him on the cheek. Go. Don Newbury nodded. Jeff climbed the stairs, trying to keep himself from running. There was no sense scaring the poor girl upstairs. He heard sniffling when he approached the half-open door to Allison's room. He poked his head in slowly. Dottie Newberry sat on Allison's bed, rubbing her daughter's back. Dottie caught the movement of a head peeking into the room and gently rose. She padded to the door, passing through it while looking back at her daughter. Dottie shut the door, turned and gasped when she saw who stood in her hall. How's she doing, Dottie? Jeff! Oh, Jeff! She wrapped him in a hug. Jeff, he hurt my little girl. He broke her heart. How could anyone be that cruel? He won't be doing that again, Dottie. I had a little talk with him tonight. What? How? How did you hear already? We haven't left the house or spoken to anyone since Allison came home and told us. Heather and I were at the Amherst Ale House, and the jerk was right behind me, bragging about what he did. 
or he was until I got in his face and threatened to snap his neck if he ever comes near her again. Jeff, you didn't! I can find other places to eat when I come home, Dottie. Friends are harder to find. Like I told Don, I don't forget my friends. No, you don't, Jeff, Dottie admitted. I thought you weren't coming home this Christmas. And who's Heather? My lieutenant granted me two weeks leave back on the 13th. I have to head back Monday. Heather's someone I met when I got home. A friend. She's downstairs now, probably charming the socks off your husband. You should get down there. Dottie smiled and put her hand on his cheek. Allison's lucky to have a friend like you, Jeff. Thank you. Jeff smiled back. Thanks, Dottie. I'll check on my friend now. Be down in a bit. Dottie patted his cheek and headed downstairs. Jeff walked to Allison's door. He opened it to find her still laying on her bed, facing away from the door. Her sniffles told him she was still awake. He walked to her bed. Sitting on the edge of it, he stroked her long blonde hair. Jeff used to do this when Allison was upset. Mom, what should I do? Allison asked. You can stop calling me mom, first of all. Allison sat bolt upright and spun around. Hey, Brainiac, he said, smiling at her. She threw herself at him, crushing him in a hug. She began to sob, then cry. He stroked her hair again. It'll be okay, Allison, he promised her. It'll be okay. No, it won't, she wailed. He pulled out of the hug. Hey, Allison, hey, look at me. She looked him in the eye. Have I ever steered you wrong? She shook her head after a moment. Trust me on this. He'll never come near you again. We ran into him over at the Amherstdale house tonight, and I had a little... discussion with him. We? My friend Heather and I. Heather? Her face fell farther. I've lost you too then. Hey. He lifted her chin to look her in the eye again. I'm here, aren't I? You're my friend and have been for years. As soon as I heard what he did, I dropped everything to come and see you. I was ready to drop Heather at her house before I came here, ending our night together. You're better off without that idiot from Harvard. You haven't lost me, not by a long shot. But I ruined your date. Ruined. Allison, Heather came with me. She's from Greenwich, so we're not far from home, either of us. She's downstairs talking to your parents. Allison stared at him. She asked to come with me, told me to come up here and check on you before she sat down with your dad. She is? She did? Yes. Wash your face. We'll go down, and I'll introduce you. It was New Year's Day, 1989. Jeff and his family had just finished dinner with the Kavanaugh clan. Jeff and Heather now walked through Alice's back garden together. Jeff would fly back to Fort Bragg in the morning. Heather would return to Amherst tomorrow night. The night was clear and cold, but they were both New England born and raised and had dressed for it. Both were quiet, each lost in their thoughts. Jeff bumped Heather with his hip, causing her to look up. What's up, beautiful? Heather sighed. I've been having such a good time being with you over the last two weeks, Jeff. But that romantic spark isn't there, is it? Heather smiled sadly. No. She sighed again. So, the question becomes, where do we go from here? Yeah. Jeff guided her to a bench and sat next to her. We stay friends. That's what I'd like to happen. There's a definite connection between us, Heather. I already know that I love you. Though I don't know if that would ever progress to me being in love with you. You're rapidly becoming the big sister I never wanted. Jeff sighed. Plus, you've got a plan for your life. Graduate school and a professorship. As people have suggested, I'm starting to think about staying in the army and going to OCS. You followed your mom around for a while before coming to live here, and you don't sound like you're eager to do it again. Heather smiled sadly again and leaned into him. Jeff put an arm around her and gave her a small kiss on the top of her head. Jeff looked up at the dark sky, picking out the constellation Orion. Hey, old friend, he thought to the ancient grouping of stars in the southern sky. Jeff had taken to talking to Orion when he was younger and felt alone. I could use your help on this one. I don't want to lose this girl as my friend. She's too special. A moment later, 
a movie line popped into his mind. It was a way to break the tension he knew Heather would understand. Your destiny lies along a different path from mine, Jeff quipped. Heather barked out a laugh, hugging him tightly. Her eyes shone with tears when she looked up. You geek, she said, shaking her head. You're lucky you've met one of the few women who would recognize that line. But you're right, Obi-Wan, at least partially. We may not be on the same path any longer, but I want us on parallel ones. I've always wanted a little brother too, but I never had one. You've got one now for as long as you'll have me. Your boyfriends will have one hell of a gauntlet to run. Your mom, your grandparents, and then me. It's a deal. Jeff and Ken re-entered their barracks room one morning at the end of January. They had a rare weekend off coming up, even for support cycle, and prepared for a trip off post. They weren't going too far though, they were only going to Myrtle Beach, a two and a half hour drive away. Jeff carried the large box Heather sent him. He told Ken all about her when he returned from Enfield. He hoped to introduce his friends to each other at some point. Jeff made short work of the tough packing tape used on the box. He hadn't shaken it to try and get a hint at what the box contained because she wrote fragile on the outside. Must be Italian, he joked to himself. Jeff noted the two layers of bubble wrap on top of whatever the objects inside were. Bubble wrap lined the sides of the box as well. Removing the wrapping revealed three separate picture frames. Jeff lifted the frames out of the box, stunned to silence. Ken came over to investigate. He let out a low whistle when he saw what the box contained. Wow, Ken said in Japanese. You were right. She is beautiful. Yes, she is. She should be up by now according to the class schedule she gave me. Do you mind if I call to thank her before we go? Are you going to put those somewhere I'll be able to look at them? Um, yeah, Jeff replied, not following his roommate. Then I'll wait as long as it takes. Jeff shook his head. He picked up the phone and dialed Heather's number. Hello? Came the now familiar voice, one that filled him with a touch of regret. Hi, beautiful, Jeff said, switching back to English. Jeff, how's my little brother doing? Heather asked happily in return. <laughs> Much better now that I've seen those photographs you sent me, especially that one of you in the bikini. Wow. They both laughed. That was a very thoughtful gift, Heather. Thank you. Hey, I figured it would help you get through the cycles a bit easier. You're on support now, right? <laughs> yeah, for another week or so, then we'll be on to training. Did Ken say anything about the gift? Well, the word beautiful did come up. He's a smart man. You say the nicest things, she said. Sometimes I wonder how I keep finding beautiful women hanging out with me. And he ruins it, folks. Why should that be a surprise to you? You're a great guy. Sure, and I couldn't hold on to a great girl again. I know I'm not even 20 yet, but still. We tried, you dumbass. The spark just wasn't there, you know that. Sorry, Heather, but sometimes the regret hits me a little hard. Regret? Heather, any man would be lucky to date you, especially long term. Doofus, any woman would be lucky to date you as well. Don't you forget that. Thanks, Heather. I don't know why I'm putting so much pressure on myself. Just relax, Jeff. I saw something there, as did Pauline and Allison, obviously, she said, mentioning Jeff's high school girlfriends. You'll get the timing right eventually. Just don't settle for some floozy. Did you ever try tracking Pauline down like you said you were going to try to? Pauline would graduate from UMass in the class of 1990, as would Heather. No, but I think I'll try to after midterms. Now cut this, I'm feeling sorry for myself crap out, or I'm coming down there to kick your ass. Yes, Miss Donnelly. Ooh, now you're saying that just to piss me off. Soros of February, 1989, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Well, it was fun while it lasted, Jeff commented while Ken packed the last of his things. You knew one of us would eventually leave, either when we got promoted or PCS'd. So again. I know, but I'm not sure I want to see who I'm going to get for a roommate after lucking out for the last year and a half. Aw, oh, aren't you sweet? Jeff threw a pair of Ken's socks at him. Watch it, Buster. That could be construed as striking an NCO. Yes, Corporal. Sorry, Corporal. Won't happen again, Corporal. You want to meet Corporal Punishment? Jeff's fears were well-founded. A private straight from training named Campbell was his new roommate. Campbell failed the Jekyll test, as it had become known in the company. 
he joined right in on the mock taunting of Jeff. Campbell tried to continue that taunting when he entered room 317 15 minutes later. Shut the hell up, Sandwich, Jeff said, cutting him off. It's Campbell. Not any more congratulations. You've already earned a nickname. Sandwich, as in, you're as fuck it up as a soup sandwich. You haven't even been here five minutes, and you're trying to tell me what's what. Take a long walk off the top of the rappel tower. Unpack your shit and don't say another word to me tonight. Jeff then did something he hadn't needed to do since reporting to Bragg. He locked up his stuff so his roommate couldn't get to it. The following morning, Campbell tried to act all high speed at PT formation. Halfway through the five-mile run, Campbell complained of cramps. Probably menstrual, Jeff muttered to Oscar Infante's amusement. I've nicknamed him Sandwich already, Oscar. Spread that around. Oscar's slick gigolo ways were gone thanks to the 504th's near combat deployment to Honduras the year before. He'd become a soldier you could count on. He'd become one of the most vital members of 1st Platoon. I'm guessing like Soup Sandwich. You're right on the money, Oscar. What's he been here, not even 24 hours? Oscar asked. Nope, not even. <laughs> I hope we run all morning then and you know how I hate running. A week later, as Jeff tried to complete an assignment for school, Campbell turned his boombox on and set the volume to 11. Jeff could hear Campbell's music over his own, and Jeff wore headphones. Jeff ripped the power cord for Campbell's radio out of the outlet. Hey, you want to listen to your music that loud? Put on headphones or take it outside. I was wearing headphones and I couldn't hear my music. You're going to be bunking in with someone else until you hit sergeant if you live that long. You'd better learn the concept of common courtesy. You're not in charge of me. I'm going to be in charge of throwing your radio down the stairs with you right behind it in about two seconds. Campbell sulked in his desk chair for the next few hours, playing his music through headphones. Jeff could still hear the music since it was so loud. If the kid wanted to destroy his hearing, Jeff wasn't going to stop him. Jeff put his stuff away and cleaned up in the latrine before bed. In true infantry fashion, Jeff ignored the world around him as he went to sleep five minutes later. Sir, Private Knox reports. Jeff stood in front of his company commander's desk during the last week of February. He rarely found himself in this office, and he did his level best to keep it that way. Seeing the rest of his company chain of command in the office did little to calm his nerves. At least there were no MPs around. At ease, Knox, offered CPT Matthews. CPT Matthews was his new CO. He took command at the beginning of the year. How are things going in your fire team? Overall, I'd say they're going well, sir. The guys are young, but they seem to be picking up the stuff we're throwing at them quickly. Even Campbell? He's more... challenging. Sir, but he'll come around. CPT Matthews stole a glance at SSG Tyler. These might help him come around quicker. The captain flipped him something. Jeff saw that whatever it was came from AFS, the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. They were subdued corporal rank pins for his BDUs. Sir? Congratulations, corporal. Thank you, sir. Do I have to leave the company now, sir? Not unless you want to. No, sir, I'm alpha all the way. I didn't think so. No, we're stretched thin as it is. You'll be staying with us. We thought we could hold off until support cycle came back around. But we need you in place before mission cycle starts in two weeks. We'll get you to PLDC as soon as we're back on support. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You've earned it, Corporal. However, you will have to move out of your barracks and over to the battalion NCO barracks. As a junior NCO, you'll bunk in with another corporal. Yes, sir. We've got a small detail assembled to help you out. CPT Matthews stood and extended his hand. Congratulations again. Thank you, sir. I won't let you down. I don't expect that you will. Dismissed, Corporal Knox. Ken Takahashi rose to answer the knock on his door. Jeff stood in the hallway, holding a box. There was a duffel bag slung over his shoulder as well. Three other soldiers carrying boxes also stood in the hall. Hey, Jeff, what are you doing here? Ken asked his former roommate. Moving in. What? I just got promoted. Can I come in? Ken stepped aside, bewildered. They assigned you to this room? You're a master of the obvious there, fella. Jeff joked to his best friend. 
a mind like a steel trap. This is cool. Third Squad's going to be the class of the company with us running the fire teams. You know it. Uh, Ken, you want to clear your shit off my bunk? Two days later, the company conducted mount training, military operations in urban terrain. Mount is mill speak for house to house fighting. Mount is high stress as it combines close combat with threats coming from all angles. Everyone has to be on the top of their game and supporting the team. And then there was Campbell. Jeff's fire team stood in loose formation after their turn in the shoot house. The company wore Miles Gear, the military's version of laser tag, which allowed realistic training. The gear required the use of real weapons modified to fire blanks. Jeff reviewed how to clear a room with one of his new privates, Williams. Campbell discussed something else with his battle buddy. He also waved his rifle around in an unsafe manner. Carelessness with a weapon, even if unloaded, was not to be tolerated. Stand by, Williams. Jeff started towards Campbell to correct his malfunction, but fate intervened. Oscar Infante crossed behind Campbell. He was right behind Campbell when the misfit drew his rifle back over his shoulder. Oscar turned when Jeff shouted at Campbell. The combination of Campbell's action and Oscar turning his head caused the rifle stock to pass under his chin and strike the passing specialist in the Adam's apple. Jeff heard a wet, sickening crunch upon impact. Oscar's eyes widened. He tried to take a startled breath, but found he couldn't. His hands shot to his neck and he started to crumple. Medic, Jeff yelled while darting towards Oscar. Heads snapped around at the call. Others saw Jeff moving toward a falling soldier and began to head that way. Jeff caught Oscar while his friend fell like a tree. A striped abrasion marred Oscar's neck and Jeff saw blood in his mouth. Jeff lowered his buddy to the ground. He unbuttoned Oscar's BDU shirt and unbuckled his web belt. With an injury to the man's neck, Jeff didn't want to move him any more than that. What do you have, Corporal? Asked the assigned medic as the man knelt on the other side of Oscar. A strike to the Adam's apple from an M16. The striations are from the butt plate. I heard a crunch when it hit. Didn't want to move him much till you got here. Crushed larynx, the medic mumbled. Nixon, ambulance up! He barked before turning back to Jeff. Can your guys give me a hand? He asked Jeff. Williams, sleds, Jeff called, looking around. The two privates he called were already right behind him. What do you need us to do, Doc? Get his helmet and LBE off carefully. Jeff and the two privates bent to the task. He registered the sound of someone tearing Campbell a new one, but didn't spare the time to look up. They worked the LBE and Miles harness off without touching Oscar's neck. Jeff saw Doc swab his friend's neck with something below the injured area. It was a yellowish-brown liquid with an antiseptic smell. Jeff also saw a flash of steel. Hold him still, there's gonna be some blood. Jeff looked Oscar in the eye. Look at me, Oscar, look at me. This isn't gonna be fun, but you can handle this. This will hurt less than your landing at Palmaroa last year. You bit it hard, buddy. I swear I don't think I've seen anyone screw up a PLF like that since jump school. The pain was visible in his friend's eyes when Doc made his cut. You can do this, Oscar. This ain't nothing. You're airborne. Suck it up and drive on. Jeff heard others wretch at what Doc was doing, but he didn't move. There was a gasping rush of air when Doc cut through Oscar's neck and into his windpipe. Doc swabbed away the blood and placed a breathing tube into the incision. He packed more clean gauze around the tube. The ambulance pulled up. The second medic grabbed a pole stretcher while Doc secured the tube in Oscar's neck. Williams and Sleds looked green, but they hadn't moved. The platoon helped load their fellow soldier into the back of the ambulance. The siren wailed while it drove away and towards the base hospital. Jeff tore his eyes away from the ambulance and scowled at Campbell. Campbell had three sergeants screaming at him already. Jeff watched while the sergeants made him start doing push-ups. Campbell would be pushing for days. The sergeants continued to harangue him and the added voice of a corporal wasn't going to matter much. Jeff turned his attention to more urgent matters. Williams, where did our weapons go? Williams indicated a spot behind Jeff. Someone had stacked the rifles in a teepee-like arrangement as if they were on display. 
A private from Ken's fire team stood watch over them. Good work, Knox, 1SG Haversmith said as he walked over to Jeff. Jeff shook his head. I should have stopped this before it happened, First Sergeant. How? The First Sergeant asked. I saw you about to correct Sandwich as soon as he started messing around with his rifle. Yes, I know his nickname and why he has it. It fits from what I hear. Tell me how you could have prevented this. It doesn't matter, Top. I'm his fire team leader, the first NCO in his chain of command. It's my responsibility. Jeff, David Haversmith said, placing his hand on Jeff's shoulder. You may have heard this one already, but you can't cure stupid. I know you've been trying to correct Sandwich's attitude since the day he arrived here. There are some people you just can't help. Yes, as a leader, you're responsible for the things your subordinates do or fail to do, but this one is on him, not you. You've had two days as an NCO, but Williams and Sleds have been benefiting from your leadership since they've been here. Take a breath. Yes, First Sergeant. So what did he get? Ken asked the next day. The captain wants to drop him out of a C-130 without a parachute, but he's going to let Jag handle it. From what I hear, Jag will charge him with assault and battery with a dangerous weapon due to culpable negligence. We'll see what he winds up getting. What's the maximum penalty for that? Dishonorable discharge, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, and confinement for three years. Not enough, Ken spat. He's ended Oscar's career and could have ended his life. No argument there, but that's all the punitive articles allow. No stretch in Leavenworth will be any fun for him. Is it true they're bringing in two new sergeants as fire team leaders? That's what I'm hearing. The company was supposedly working on that before Sandwich's incident. We'll keep our stripes. They're still going to send us to the primary leadership development course the next time we're on support, too. Jeff nodded and wondered how Oscar was doing. Oscar Infante stared at the ceiling in his hospital room at Fort Bragg's Womack Army Medical Center. It was a different room than the one he'd been in this morning, but the ceiling was the same. He almost wished he was still unconscious. There was nothing to do but stare at the ceiling or watch soap operas. He'd prefer to run all day than do either of those. A knock sounded on his door. The rigid collar on his neck prevented him from turning his head. Rolling to one side, he saw Jeff Knox standing in the doorway. Oscar waved him into the room. Hey, Oscar, glad to see you awake. Oscar smiled at him and pointed to a chair. Thanks. Oscar picked up his pencil and pad of paper. That was his only form of communication with his voice box crushed. I know it's a dumb question, but how are you doing? Neck hurts, Oscar wrote. Surgery when swelling goes down. Are they going to be able to fix your throat? So they say. So much for the singing voice. Your singing voice was fine, Oscar. It was fine when you were in the shower, that is. Maybe we can find a porta potty you can carry around with you? Oscar started to laugh, but there was no sound. No laughing. Hurts. Sorry. Campbell. Nobody's told me yet. You're the first one by. You were in the ICU until today. The rest of the guys will be by soon enough. Sandwich is in the stockade now, but they're convening a general court and will send him to Leavenworth, hopefully. He'll receive a dishonorable discharge, forfeit all pay and allowances, and receive three years confinement if convicted. None of us think it's enough, Oscar. Oscar shrugged. Doesn't matter. You're wrong, Oscar. It does matter. You're someone we counted on in first platoon. You were probably next on the list for a lateral promotion to corporal. With you, we were a lock for the best platoon in the brigade. It matters because you're one of us, a devil in baggy pants and a first battalion red devil to boot. No matter what happens next, Oscar, no one can take that from you. Don't forget that. Oscar just put his head back, staring at the far wall. Jeff wasn't sure how much of his little speech got through to his friend. A soft knock at the door made Jeff turn, a pretty brunette stood just inside the room. Hi, I'm Jenna Ferrier. I'm here for Specialist Infante's physical therapy session. Hi, Jenna. I'm Jeff, one of the guys from Oscar's platoon. Jeff turned back to Oscar while he rose. I'll be back tomorrow, Oscar, and I'll let the guys know you can have visitors now. Jeff glanced at Jenna. You should at least comb your hair before your date comes over, bud. 
Jeff said in a stage whisper. I'll give you a few dating tips when I come back. Jenna giggled when Oscar gave him the finger. You'll have to excuse my friend, Jenna. He's a bit shy and isn't real comfortable around girls. Jeff ducked when Oscar threw a box of tissues at him. Time to go. A week later, Ken and Jeff stood in the company offices meeting two new additions to the squad. Sergeant Tyler handled the introductions. Sergeant Frank Breckenridge, Sergeant Corey Song, these two men are Corporals Ken Takahashi and Jeff Knox. They've been acting as the fire team leaders for 3rd Squad. You won't find a better pair of soldiers in the company. I've relied on them since the last two team leaders left. The four NCOs shook hands. Mm -hmm. Speaking for myself, I know I'll be counting on you guys while I settle in here, SGT Breckenridge said. SGT Song nodded in agreement. Which one of you is acting as Alpha Team Leader? Ken raised his hand. How are we looking? We're doing okay, Sergeant. We just lost a team member two weeks ago, a specialist, to a training accident. We're handling it right now. We need a replacement for that soldier, and we'll be back up to strength. SGT Song looked at Jeff. Same here, Sergeant. Our training loss was the careless soldier who caused the accident. He's still in the stockade, but that's until he's court-martialed. We also need another warm body and to get that body trained up. Both are in the works and both should report in before we hit training cycle next week, noted SSG Tyler. They nodded. Jeff and Ken entered the battalion NCO barracks lobby after the meeting. They nodded to the CQ, CPL Emilio Vasquez from Charlie Company, while headed for the stairs. Hey guys, hold up, Vasquez called as he put down the phone. Your first sergeant's going to be here in a few minutes with some guests. He told me to have you guys stand by. Standing by to stand by, Corporal, Jeff joked from the position of parade rest. Vasquez looked pained. I don't know how you put up with him, Ken. It's all I can do not to smother him with my pillow some nights, Mono. Jeff shook his head at the two comedians as one SG Haversmith pulled the door open and held it for someone. Kara? He gasped as a sandy-headed blonde in a mass art t-shirt appeared. She skipped over to her brother and hugged him. Holy shit, he heard someone whisper. Jeff looked behind Kara to see Allison and Heather standing in the lobby with 1SG Haversmith. Move it, sister, Heather muttered as she nudged Kara out of the way to give Jeff her hug. You're taking too long, Allison said, tapping her foot. Ken and Emilio's jaws hit the floor as they watched the scene. Heather stepped aside, and Allison pressed herself to him. There was a roaring in his ears while she kissed him deeply. Hi. Hi, Jeff replied, his smile a mile wide. This is a terrific surprise, but what are you ladies doing in Fayetteville? Allison and I have been talking about heading to Myrtle Beach for spring break since the snow started to fly in earnest after New Year's, Kara informed him. We started to talk to Heather about the idea, and she brought up the idea of stopping here on our way down. I'm so glad you did. We need to get you three off post before you cause a riot, though. You all get better looking every time I see you. Allison kissed him again at the compliment. You guys have met the first sergeant, but let me introduce you to two guys I share the cell block with. The sorry-looking individual behind the desk is Emilio Vasquez, and the sorrier-looking individual next to me is Ken Takahashi, my roommate. Emilio, Ken, these gorgeous specimens of femininity are my younger sister, Kara Knox, and my good friends Allison Newberry and Heather Donnelly. Ken found his voice. Why don't you have any pictures that do these ladies justice? Are you trying to keep them all to yourself, you greedy son of a bitch? Emilio was still staring. What can I say, Takahashi-san? I'm blessed. Lieutenant Colonel Reich and Captain Matthews have also blessed you both with the day off, Corporal, Dave Hagersmith told him. You and Ken go get changed into civvies while I keep these lovely ladies company. Yes, First Sergeant, he and Ken replied. Disappear. You two are giving me a headache. Dude, your photos of them don't even come close, Ken remarked as they hustled up the stairs to get changed. It's good to be the king. Yeah, no more comments about you being the piss boy. The five young people made their way off base. They drove to a local amusement complex, where they spent hours playing mini-golf, riding go-karts, and being treated to a hitting exhibition by Jeff. 
their sides all hurt from their laughter, Jeff treated the group to dinner at a local barbecue restaurant. Who else am I going to spend my money on? Jeff asked when Kara complained he was hemorrhaging money that day. Ken will tell you that neither of us comes off base all too often. We're both working on our degrees, and now that we're NCOs, we're even busier. Plus, you ladies will spend enough in Myrtle Beach. I meant to ask, Jeff, but did you get promoted? Allison asked, taking a sip of her iced tea. Jeff nodded while he chewed his food. At the end of February, he confirmed. Ken was promoted at the beginning of the month and was still without a roommate, so we're roommates again in our current barracks. Do mom and dad know? Asked Kara. I haven't mentioned it yet, so I doubt it. I'm waiting for my file's picture to be updated, and I'll send a copy home. Why not mention it? I don't know, Jeff shrugged. I guess in my mind nothing has changed. I'm still roommates with Ken, still at Bragg, still with the same unit, other than the stripes. Don't let Mr. Modest over here fool you, Kara, added Ken. He's helped the new kids in the squad get up to speed and helped keep our platoon running when we lost a man in training. The women looked at Jeff sharply. An injury, not a death, Ken clarified. It could have been a death if Jeff hadn't reacted as quickly as he did. I think you're exaggerating, Jeff muttered. Sure, and Colonel Reich pinning that ARCOM on you in front of the battalion was an exaggeration. Ken related the incident to the women, glossing over the bloodiness of the emergency field tracheotomy. Kara looked even prouder of her big brother. They drove to the women's hotel after dinner. Ken and Jeff stayed until they needed to head back for lights out. Thanks for coming down, Heather. It's been great seeing you again. I can see why you like Ken. He's a good guy. She gave him a tight hug. You take care of yourself. Call me soon. Kara hugged him next, telling him she'd call when they returned to Boston and reminding him to call their parents. Allison's hug got his motor running again. The roaring returned with her kiss. Jeff was sure it was just the blood in his ears. Part of him thought it might also be the roaring of a crowd. He was reluctant to let her go. You be careful, he whispered, and you jump out of airplanes. Voluntarily, I might add, and you're telling me to be careful? She kissed him again. It was a soft, lingering kiss that used to be a prelude to more. I love you too, remember? Whoever fate has waiting for you is going to be pissed if you get yourself hurt. I'll talk to you soon. They finished their goodbyes and the paratroopers returned to Jeff's truck. You have to be the luckiest son of a bitch in the world, Jeff, Ken said while they drove up the All-American Expressway towards the base. That I am, Ken. That I am. Jeff, Ken, and other NCOs from the battalion watched the evening news in the first floor lounge of their barracks at the end of May. The lead story was about the presidential elections in the nation of Panama. The opposition candidate won the election, but the dictator, Noriega, declared the election invalid. A mob beat the presumed winner bloody the next day. The man wasn't killed outright, surprising Jeff. Noriega claimed that the United States was the root cause of election irregularities and refused to step aside. I hear they're starting to reinforce the Canal Zone garrison, commented SGT Tyler Jefferson of Bravo Company. Man, all that humidity would play hell with my hair, someone else muttered. None of the soldiers in the room went more than two weeks without a haircut. None of their hair was longer than a quarter of an inch. A single bottle of shampoo would last a year in the barracks if shared. Ken and Jeff shared a look. They'd tell their fire teams to start checking their equipment tomorrow. Jeff glanced around the barracks room one more time to make sure everything looked presentable. Ken would arrive with his parents and sister at any moment. He was going on ten days leave to North Carolina with his family. Ken's younger sister had asked to visit her brother for her high school graduation present. Jeff heard the call of female on the floor and rose to his feet. Clear, he called back. The barracks was almost empty since it was already the weekend. Most everyone who was going to leave for the weekend took off after the close of business on Friday. Jeff saw Ken step into view and gesture someone inside. A small distinguished looking man stepped inside the room, Ken's father. Jeff bowed and addressed Mr. Takahashi in Japanese. Konnichiwa Takahashi-san, I am Ken's roommate and student Jeffrey Knox. Konnichiwa Nox-san, replied Ken's father, Hiro. 
He bowed back. May I introduce the rest of my family? Ken's father turned to the two women accompanying him, who stepped through the door. My wife, Mayumi, and our daughter, Keiko. Jeff bowed to both women. They bowed back. Ne Jeff's gaze locked with Keiko's when they straightened up. Nothing else existed as Jeff fell into her deep brown eyes. Someone's gaze had never captured him like this, and no one had ever stared at him so intently. He wasn't even sure he was breathing. Unseen by either of them was the look Mr. Takahashi gave his wife. Nor did they see the follow-up look he gave Ken. Ken gave his father a nod. I'm very sorry, Takahashi-san. Did you ask me something? Yes, are you ready to go? Go, sir. Yes, to lunch with us. My apologies, sir. I did not realize you had extended the invitation to me. I can be ready in five minutes. Jeff began to pull clothes out of his bureau. He nodded to a still-staring Keiko before he darted to the latrine to change. Jeff lied to Mr. Takahashi. He was ready in four minutes. Ready, sir? Let us go, then. Jeff led the way to the parking lot. Every time he glanced back to check the Takahashis were behind him, he found Keiko staring at him. The intensity of her gaze surprised him. He was in for another surprise. Father, may I ride with Noxon? Keiko asked. Her voice did things to him he hadn't experienced before. Mr. Takahashi shared another look with Ken. Ken gave his father another nod. Yes, Keiko. Jeff, we're headed to the steakhouse on Bragg Boulevard down by 401. Ken said. Jeff nodded. This way, Miss Takahashi. Jeff escorted her to his truck. He rolled down the driver's window to let the built-up heat out before starting the truck. He cranked the air conditioning before leading Keiko to the other side, holding the door open for her. Thank you, Jeffrey, she said as she stepped into the cab. That voice. He fought not to stare at her legs while she sat. Closing her door, he raced around to get in the driver's seat. He buckled up and pulled behind the Takahashi's rental. Keiko was staring at him again. She rolled up her window when the air conditioner began to win its battle against the North Carolina summer. Jeff did the same. She spoke again once they were on the All-American Expressway heading south. Do I make you uncomfortable, Jeffrey? In many ways, yes, Miss Takahashi. There was no sense in prevaricating to this woman. She'd know he was lying in a heartbeat. Your voice does things to me I won't mention to your brother. Your eyes. I'm lost when I look at you, Miss Takahashi. Keiko, she said. Call me Keiko, please. I do not wish to be Miss Takahashi to you. You are not lost, Jeffrey. Your heart has found something. It has found something it has been looking for. I believe mine has as well. What? We've known each other for less than 30 minutes, Keiko. You just graduated high school. You're about to start college in the fall. Do you want to tie yourself to someone who lives 3,000 miles from Spokane? The heart wants what it wants, Jeffrey. Do you not feel the connection? I do. Also, I will be less than 300 miles from here in the fall. I will attend the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. UVA? Ken didn't tell me that. If he thought her voice threw him for a loop, her touch almost stopped his heart. It was electric. She'd placed her hand on his arm. I will study English, both composition and literature. My goal is to teach at the high school level. UVA has a combined BAMT program. Bachelor of Arts, Masters in Teaching? Yes, exactly. It is a five-year program. I will graduate in 1994 with both degrees. They finished the drive in silence. Dinner passed without any surprises. Mr. and Mrs. Takahashi asked Jeff many questions during the meal. He knew they were interrogating him, though subtly. Their daughter had expressed interest in a virtual stranger, so it was not unexpected. After the meal, the group drove to the Takahashi's hotel with Keiko again riding with Jeff. They sat in the family suite and continued their discussion. Jeff realized after an hour they'd spoken Japanese exclusively all day. It was effortless. Keiko favored him with many small smiles while they sat with her family. Jeff said his goodbyes to Ken and his parents at 2000. Keiko asked if she could accompany Jeff to the lobby. Her father gave another nod. 
I'm sure Ken has told you, but we leave for Wilmington in the morning, she told him, as they rode the elevator to the lobby. I will see you when we drop Ken off at your barracks. I will call you during the week. She stood on her toes and wrapped her arms around his neck. She pressed her lips to his. Pauline's first kiss his sophomore year in high school shocked him. Allison was good at making the world disappear when she kissed him. Keiko's kiss had him on fire. Whatever connection he felt during the day, whatever her touches had done to him already, paled in comparison to her kiss. He couldn't form a coherent thought. Before this moment, he would have said he could die a happy man if such and such occurred. Now he would never say that again because his death would make Keiko unhappy, and he'd never do that to her. Good night, Jeffrey, she whispered. He floated out of the elevator, his eyes locked with Keiko's while the doors closed. As he made his way back to his truck, he wondered how the train named Keiko Takahashi had flattened him. Jeff slogged through the next week and a half. He didn't remember much of it. He barely got any schoolwork done, and he found himself staring at his desk half the time. Finally, Ken's leave ran out. Ken called when they left the beach, telling Jeff that they'd be back at the barracks in two and a half hours. Those were the longest 150 minutes of Jeff's life. He took a leisurely shower to pass some of the time. That only ate up 15 minutes. Listening to music helped a little, but only a little. The gods took pity on him and the time passed. From his window he could see the Takahashis walking to the barracks. Jeff flew down the stairs. Keiko smiled when she saw Jeff waiting for them, for her, in the lobby. She walked over and wrapped him in a hug. Do you feel it now, Jeffrey? She whispered in Japanese. He nodded to her. It is not yet our time. You have your time in the army still, and I have my time at college. What do we do, he whispered back. Live, Jeffrey, we live. An old saying tells us if you can't be with the girl you love, love the girl you're near. Do not deny yourself love when it presents itself to you. Our time is coming. We both still have experiences coming to us separately before we share ours. She kissed him in full view of her parents and Ken. Jeff said goodbye to her and the elder Takahashis. He then watched while his future walked away. Jeff wasn't sure how long he stood there before Ken nudged him. He made his way up the stairs with his roommate. Jeff sat on his bunk, not saying a word, while Ken put his things away. Ken sat on his bunk and looked Jeff in the eye. She's in your head. Ken, I don't know what hit me. Your sister is unlike any of the women in my life, and she's all of them at the same time. You've met Allison and Heather. You know the kind of women I've been lucky enough to meet. Keiko, what she does to me. Jeff didn't know how to explain what he felt. Ken nodded. Jeff, you need to remember one thing no matter what happens between now and whenever you're supposed to be together. What's that? She will be hard-pressed to find a better person than you, my friend. The group watching the evening news in the lounge had grown. Almost the entire battalion's NCO Corps began watching once the media called President Bush a wimp months ago. Now, ten days before Christmas, they watched the same media report a Marine officer gunned down by the Panamanian Defense Forces in Panama City. Well, fellas, there's our warning order came the comment. Sure as hell. Someone started softly calling a favorite running cadence. Gone was the usual bravado of the song, smothered by the cold realization that the division's future was being written while they watched. C-130 rolling down the strip. Unlike a regular cadence call, no one answered the original speaker. There was too much truth in the follow-up line. Airborne Daddy gonna take a little trip 19th of December, 1989. Airborne southbound over the Gulf of Mexico. The cadence got it wrong. Jeff's little trip was on a C-141 Starlifter aircraft, one of the hundreds delivering early Christmas presents to Panama. Follow-on troops may travel on C-130s, but not the initial wave. Jeff woke from his nap. He reviewed the plan for the jump one more time before putting the map away. If he didn't know it by now, he never would. I don't think this is going to end like Golden Pheasant did, Jeff thought, thinking about the not-quite-combat insertion he took part in last March. Unlike that jump into Honduras, combat looked certain for the 504th PIR this time. 
He noticed a mix of emotions on the faces of his fire team when he looked down the row of seats. The new members of the squad, SPC Herman Adler and PFC Norm Feller, didn't look nervous at all. They were asleep. Both experienced soldiers transferred into the 82nd at their own request. Williams and Sleds, however, looked scared. Hey, he yelled to Williams over the scream of the plane's engines. Take a deep breath, man. You scared? Williams nodded. Good, me too. Williams shot him a surprised look. You'd have to be crazy not to be. There's only one way off this plane and that's through those doors back there. The first step is a thousand feet high. Williams chuckled and shook his head. He nodded his thanks to Jeff. Jeff motioned for Williams to switch places with sleds. The two privates swapped places and Jeff repeated his little speech. Sleds was more nervous than Williams before Jeff's pep talk. He thanked Jeff after three minutes of uncontrollable laughter. Just remember, Manny, bravery is the capacity to perform properly even when scared half to death. You and Rick have performed properly since you guys got here. Shit, you didn't even budge when Doc cut Oscar Infanti's neck that day. If that's not bravery, I don't know what is. Sir? Where have I heard that first thing you said before? The person who said that was the first ever division commander of the 82nd Airborne, General of the Army Omar N. Bradley. That might be why you've heard it before. The Air Force lit the plane's interior with red lights during the flight. This preserved the paratroopers' night vision before they jumped. Now the red pre-jump warning lights came on near the jump doors. Time to get ready. Showtime, Manny! <laughs> Lieutenant Charrington ordered 3rd Squad to perform a security sweep outside the LZ perimeter. They would push the American-controlled envelope around Omar Torrijos Airport outward. They'd operate away from other supporting units, but they weren't worried about it. Hell, that's what the Airborne does. Their assigned reconnaissance patrol was routine, up until the point it was not. They stumbled across a Panamanian Defense Forces patrol, which launched a hasty ambush at them. Years of training the PDF in American tactics came back to bite them in the ass, their fourth point of contact in airborne language. The PDF knew where to concentrate their fire to do the most damage to the squad. They caught squad leadership conferring while the patrol stopped. John Tyler and Frank Breckenridge died immediately while Corey Song was wounded. He was now unconscious. Third squad bounded away from the ambush after assaulting through the PDF and wiping the enemy forces out. Williams and Sleds carried the dead across their backs. American forces do not leave their fallen on the battlefield. Adler and Feller limped along, carrying Song and a poncho between them. Feller also carried the destroyed radio as they made their way away from the ambush site. He was the squad's RTO, the radio telephone operator or radio man. The PDF would know 3rd Squad was out of contact if they found the radio. Jeff slung his M16 across his back while he carried Adler's M60 and extra ammo. The squad had eliminated the PDF force that tried to ambush them, but the Americans knew another PDF force would find their trail and try to hit them again. Survival was far from assured. Ken became acting squad leader with Tyler and Breckenridge dead and Song out of action. Third squad needed to hole up. Ken looked over the terrain he selected for the squad's hasty patrol base site. It was nasty. A partial swamp separated from the trail by thick brush and buzzing with mosquitoes. In other words, it was the perfect place for a patrol base. The enemy would have to look hard for their trail in, and the site allowed them an escape route. Ken picked out spots for their fighting positions. What now, Ken? Jeff whispered. Jeff spoke in English to avoid any possible confusion during translation. Jeff looked at Ken, but it was too dark to see Ken's face, just his silhouette. Jeff was lucky that Ken couldn't see him either. Jeff's shoulder bled freely and had already soaked through his BDUs. We've got to get this perimeter set up before the PDF comes back, Ken whispered back to his friend. Conserve ammo, water, rations, and hold out until the sun comes up and we get relieved. If they hit us and we can't get away, we give them everything we've got. The squad bent to the task and set up the perimeter. Ken and Jeff, now Ken's assistant squad leader, met again to discuss what they still needed to accomplish. Before the meeting started, a flash appeared outside their perimeter. 
Ken shoved Jeff backward without hesitation. Jeff landed hard as he heard Ken's grunt of pain. Williams and Sleds returned fire while the rest of the squad held steady. The shot came from outside of their sectors of responsibility. A cry pierced the darkness, and the two ceased fire. Jeff rushed to Ken's side, his heart in his throat. Through and through to my bicep, Ken said through clenched teeth. I'm okay. Jeff thought Ken needed work on his definition of okay. Jeff tore away the arm of Ken's BDU shirt before opening Ken's first aid pouch. Under the dim light of a red-filtered flashlight, Jeff dressed the wound as best he could. He grabbed the grenades off Ken's LBE to hand out to others in the squad. Jeff took the Claymore mines from Ken's pack and put them in an empty rucksack stripped from one of the dead. Jeff collected more mines from the squad, including the deceased. Jeff thought their lieutenant was nuts when he told them to take the mines before they left. Jeff was now grateful that the LT insisted. I'll be right back, he whispered. The hell you will, Ken whispered back. Ken, I'm the only one not wounded in the leg. I'm the only one of us that can still move around. The rest of you guys are already starting to stiffen up, and we need to get this done before the PDF hits us again. What are you going to do? I'm going to make this an expensive piece of ground for the PDF. Jeff handed Ken a large, soft-sided case. These are Tyler's PVS-7s. I'm taking songs, and I'm going out to even the odds a little. I'll flash the active IR source every 30 minutes to let you know I'm okay. I'll flash a reverse SOS with my flashlight to tell you that I'm coming back in. Three longs, three shorts, three longs, okay? Get these guys home if I don't make it back. Jeff disappeared before Ken could object. By the time Ken had the night vision goggles out and on, his friend had disappeared. Pain. That's what registered first when consciousness returned. The pain centered around Jeff's left chest and arm. He recognized the pain as a good thing. He'd been in combat, so the pain meant that he was still alive, at least for the moment. Next to register was the steady he heard even through what he guessed was ear protection. The wine was one he recognized the engines of a C-5A Galaxy cargo plane. He'd been on one only once, for a trip home last year, but the sound was hard to forget. Jeff tried opening his eyes. Even the low-level lighting hurt at first. He made out the shapes of people near him. Two women stood nearby, officers both. They wore Air Force flight suits and air crew headsets with microphones. A dark-haired first lieutenant briefed a blonde lieutenant colonel. The colonel, from what Jeff saw of her, looked familiar. Her height and the patches on her flight suit, combined with the blonde hair, reminded him of someone he had met once. When she looked up from what the lieutenant showed her, he did recognize her. Net. Jeff thought he was close enough to reach the colonel, despite the IV lines taped into his right arm. His litter lay at their waist height, so he reached out to touch the colonel's elbow. The lieutenant noticed his movement. Her glance caused the colonel to turn towards Jeff. The colonel's eyes showed a hint of tears as she rested her hand on his arm and smiled down at him. Wrong party, colonel, Jeff said through his oxygen mask. The lieutenant relayed his message through her headset. The colonel nodded and grabbed a pad from her pocket, scribbling a quick note. Sleep. Long flight. I'll come back. He nodded and drifted back into unconsciousness. Jane Donnelly looked down at the young man on the litter. She wished that her daughter's best friend wasn't so seriously wounded. She and Lieutenant Mia DiNapoli noticed movement as the lieutenant briefed her on Jeff's injuries, penetrating trauma to the left interior chest and left upper arm, a pneumothorax, a hemothorax, massive blood loss, and dehydration. As badly hurt as he was, he wasn't the worst on the flight. But he was the only wounded soldier Jane knew. Ma'am? came the voice over her headset. Are you all right? Jane turned. Lieutenant Dinopoli looked at her with concern. No, Lieutenant, not really, was Jane's honest reply. This soldier is my daughter's best friend. I thought, or maybe I hoped, he would be my son-in-law one day. But he and my daughter told our family those feelings just weren't there. They're very close now, like brother and sister. Jane sighed. I'm not looking forward to telling her he's wounded. My condolences, ma'am, 
I knew you were concerned about him, but now I understand why. What did he mean, ma'am, when he said wrong party, ma? Last December, I flew a cargo mission out of Pope to Westover Air Force Base. Westover is just outside of Springfield, Massachusetts, and the corporal flew Space A with us. He's from that area, and his family Christmas party was that day. Jeff was trying to surprise them because he hadn't told them he was coming home. He was the only person other than my crew on board, so I let him sit on the flight deck. Jane paused to compose herself. This young man impressed my officers and me. He gave us a good vibe right away. He brought a book with him on that flight, one about a possible conventional Third World War. The title escapes me at the moment. I think it had a color in the title. I think I know the one you mean, ma'am. Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising? Jane nodded. That's the one. He's a voracious reader and a huge history buff. The rest of my flight crew had read the book and told me that Jeff had some good insights. They were particularly impressed with his knowledge of the state of NATO and Warsaw Pact forces and capabilities back then. Jeff also provided a few alternate scenarios based on his knowledge. When we got to Westover, my daughter came to pick me up. The corporal and my daughter hit it off like nothing I've ever seen. Their history debates over the next couple of weeks were insightful and even beneficial for Heather when she went back to school. She said Jeff provided viewpoints she hadn't considered or heard in class. Heather used one or two to construct arguments for her paper since then. Jane sighed again. For those two weeks, they were all but inseparable. They were always together, either at my parents' place, his parents' place, or off somewhere together. My dad's a retired paratrooper, the former commander of the same regiment. The corporal is in now. It usually takes him a long time to trust someone new around his girls. That's my daughter Heather, my mom, and me. He liked the corporal right away. Again, something else I've never seen. Dad was hell on my dates in high school. At the end of those two weeks, Heather needed to head back to UMass and he needed to report back to his unit. The two of them had a very adult conversation about their relationship before leaving Greenwich. That's when they decided that while they loved each other, they weren't in love with each other. They considered themselves siblings from that point on. Mom and Dad were disappointed that he wouldn't marry Heather, and I know I was too. She shook her head. Thank you, Lieutenant, for listening to me ramble, Jane said, drawing herself up straight. I'll get back to my job so that you can get back to yours. Thank you for briefing me. Of course, ma'am. Jane Donnelly found a dark corner in her cavernous aircraft and cried for the young man she considered an adopted son. An exhausted Jane Donnelly dropped into a desk chair later that day. She sat in her assigned visiting officer quarters room at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington, D.C. and stared at the wall. Jane turned to gaze longingly at the full-sized bed mere inches from her, but knew she had a couple of calls to make before she could lie down. Jane picked up the phone and dialed a number she remembered from childhood. Hello? Hi, Heather. Mom, are you okay? I'm fine, Heather. I'm just tired. It's been a long few days. After I hang up with you and make one other call, I'm taking a shower and sleeping until Christmas. Mom... Jeff's been wounded in Panama, Heather told her, near tears. Kara said they haven't told her family much beyond that Jeff was wounded and flown back to Walter Reed in Washington. I know about Jeff, Heather, Jane sighed. He was on the aircraft I flew into Andrews just now. I need to call his parents. Would you give me their number in Enfield? Jane wrote down the number as Heather gave it to her. Heather, Jeff is badly hurt but he woke up and recognized me. He was awake again when we landed and while they unloaded him. The flight surgeon said those were good things. Jeff will be okay. Thanks, Mom, her daughter replied, the relief audible in her voice. I love you. Get some sleep. I'll tell Grammy and Grampy you're safe and that you'll call after you wake up. I promise, Heather, Jane replied. Love you too, bye. Jane dreaded making the next call. Taking a deep breath, she dialed the number she'd just written down. Hello, came the emotion-laden voice of Marissa Knox. Marissa, it's Jane Donnelly. Hi, Jane. Are you all right? You sound pretty beat. 
It was clear to Jane that Jeff got his concern for others from his parents after meeting them. The boy, man, she corrected herself, was raised right. I'm fine, thanks, Marisa, Jane confirmed. It was all hands on deck for this operation, as my colleagues in the Navy would say. Heather told me that Jeff was wounded in Panama. How much information did the Army give you? Very little, I'm afraid. We know they flew Jeff to Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. The sergeant who called the house didn't have any information for us on how bad his injuries are. Jane sighed once again that day. I already knew of Jeff's injuries before I spoke to Heather Marisa. I was the pilot of the plane that brought Jeff here to D.C. I'm calling you from Andrews Air Force Base. Joe, Kara, come here. Jane Donnelly was the pilot of the plane that flew Jeff to Walter Reed. Jane, please tell us everything you can about Jeff's condition. As I said, Marisa, I flew Jeff to D.C. today. We landed about an hour ago. I have a list of his injuries here. Jane read them off to Marissa, who sobbed into the receiver while when she heard them. When I read Jeff's name on the flight manifest, my heart was in my throat. Once I was able, I left the flight deck. I wanted to see how he was doing and get a report on his condition. Jeff woke up and recognized me during my briefing. He was awake again for the last hour of the flight and stayed awake through unloading. The surgeon on the flight assured me Jeff's being awake and recognizing me were good things. Jeff will need lots of rehab, but he should heal up fine. Jane, thank you for calling to give us this information. I know we will head down to D.C. to see Jeff as soon as we can. Will you be in town long? Honestly, I don't know, Marisa. I haven't received my next orders yet. So far, I only know that I have the rest of today and tomorrow off. I'll check back in with the host wing office on the 24th. What I have heard is that casualties are nowhere near as bad as expected, so I might not be flying back south. Thank heaven for small favors, Marisa muttered. As for visiting Jeff, Joe and I will coordinate things with your family here. Thanks, Marisa. Jeff woke feeling worse than he had ever felt in his life. His first hangover had been more pleasant than this. He felt as if someone tossed him into an empty cement truck and left him to tumble for an hour. The last thing he remembered from his follow-up surgery was trying to count backward from 100. He reached 98. Jeff tried to move but soon gave that up with a groan. The left side of his body wasn't interested and his right side seemed content to go along with the left. His groans attracted attention. Merry Christmas, Corporal. Back among the living, are we? Jeff managed to crack his eyes open. An attractive female officer in an army nursing uniform stood next to his bed. Well, my day just got a whole lot better than it seemed to me before, if you'll allow me to say so, ma'am. He asked, wagging his eyebrows. I'll have to watch myself around this side of the ward, Captain Terra Paradise chuckled. You're feeling better already, I see. Knox? Got a bit of the Blarney in ya, do ya, boyo? A bit I lass. Uh, ma'am. Jeff responded in a bad Irish accent. Half Irish, half Greek, and twice as full of myself as anyone has a right to be. The captain cast a jaundiced eye at him like she didn't believe his statement. I don't buy that for a second, Corporal, she confirmed. I don't get that vibe from you. Plus, I don't think an arrogant person would have the flock of people waiting to see him that you do. Flock? What do you mean, ma'am? Well, let's see. She paused, looked up at the ceiling, and started counting off on her fingers. There's your parents, your sister, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, her daughter and the Colonel's parents. Not to mention, there's your division's commanding general and his ID. See? A flock. Holy crap. Uh, am I ready to see them? I mean, do I need to wash up? I know I need a toothbrush. My mouth tastes like the elephant that stepped on me took a dump in it. Vivid, deadpan the nurse. She produced a wrapped mouth swab. That'll have to do until you can get up. You shouldn't need to wash up, though. We've been giving you sponge baths while you were unconscious. Jeff paused in mid-reach for the swab. He looked the captain in the eye, a mortified look on his face. Sponge baths, ma'am. Uh... Oh, yes. Good grief. Don't worry, Charlie Brown. It's all part of our training. CPT Paradise watched while he ran the swab around in his mouth. You ready for the visitors? His mother smothered him, crying. 
Kara was more reserved, but still weepy. Jeff's wounds concerned his father, but Joe was grateful Jeff was awake and would recover. Two army officers waited behind his family. A major general and his aide stepped forward during a pause in the family proceedings. Jeff sat up as straight as he could. At ease, son, the general said in a soft voice. At ease. Yes, general. Good man. I've got a few things to tell you, and then we'll get out of your way and let you get back to your family. I wanted them to be here for this before we came to see you. First is your promotion to Sergeant E5, effective 2-4 December. Merry Christmas, by the way. Jeff's jaw dropped while his family looked proud. Begging the General's pardon, sir, but I've only been a corporal for ten months. Been in less than three years. Sergeant, according to your file, your performance since February has proved that your promotion to corporal instead of specialist was the right decision. You, Sergeant, are a leader. Your company sent your promotion packet to battalion last month, remember? Your scores put you near the top of the list for promotion to sergeant. With squad leadership dead and most men wounded, battalion will give you a fire team in third squad. You've already completed PLDC, so we're good there. Sir, Ken Takahashi was acting squad leader that night. The promotion should be his. Who says Ken Takahashi isn't receiving a promotion as well, sergeant? He will be the other team leader, while you help your new squad leader rebuild. Nah. Jeff's head was spinning, but all he could do was answer, Yes, sir. We're not quite done with you yet, Sergeant, General Johnson said. Due to your service in Panama, you are authorized to wear the Combat Infantryman's Badge, Basic Parachutist Badge with Combat Star, and Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal with Arrowhead. Your wounds, which you received in armed combat against an enemy force, mean you are authorized to wear the Purple Heart. And last, but certainly not least, you have been awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action against the Panamanian Defense Forces on 20 December 1989. The General's aide handed his boss each item as General Johnson named them. Johnson pinned five badges and medals to Jeff's pillow. The awards were visible to all who looked at Jeff. Jeff's head threatened to spin off his shoulders. General, the Silver Star, sir, I was just doing my job. You were sergeant, yes. However, the after-action reports I've read from your squad mates tell me you did your job in an exemplary manner. Specifically, you carried out the plan to defend your patrol base after Sergeant Takahashi was wounded. Then, single-handedly, you held off the PDF. You later refused evacuation until after everyone else had been from the battlefield. Kara beckoned the Donnelly and Kavanaugh clan into Jeff's ward after General Johnson's presentation. Jeff saw Tom nod at him after seeing the items pinned to his pillow. While the army officers made their exit, a crying Heather attempted to crush Jeff with her hug. She sobbed in relief as a red-eyed Kara rubbed her back along with Jeff. It's okay, Heather, he assured her while he rubbed her back with his good hand. It's okay. I'll be fine. Are you hurt on this side? Heather sniffled. She sat back up and pointed to his right shoulder. No, it's all on my left side, he answered. She punched him in the right shoulder, and she didn't pull her punch either. You need to be more careful. Heather, I promise. I looked both ways before I jumped out of the aircraft. That drew a snort from Tom. Alice promptly smacked her husband on the arm. Paratrooper humor, she muttered darkly. I can't believe that you guys came down here. Mom, Dad, and Kara, I expected. But, Jeff said, trailing off. Heather hugged him again, this time without the associated violence. I finally got used to the fact I've got a little brother now, so don't you try taking yourself out of the equation again, mister. Jeff, you and your family made a terrific impression on all of us last year, Alice explained further. You and Heather hit it off like none of us have ever seen. You are important to her. Why the poor girl was in hysterics when she heard you were wounded? Heather buried her face in Jeff's good shoulder, out of embarrassment. And don't think for a minute that you're not important to the rest of us, either, Alice admonished him. You've helped breathe a bit of new life into our little family, a life we didn't realize was missing. 
Your parents have invited us to lots of your family's events since last year. We now feel like our family is many times larger than it is. Alice and Tom were only children, as were Jane, her late husband, and Heather. The four living members of the Kavanaugh family were all the family they had until Jeff came along. His family and friends chatted with him for about an hour until his strength began to wane. Jeff drifted back off to sleep, causing Kara and Heather to usher everyone out of the ward. He missed the kisses on his cheeks from both young women while he slept. Jeff woke a few hours later to find his ward empty of visitors. He noted that someone placed his new awards and rank insignia in a black cloth-lined shadow box, which now stood on a table near his bed. Captain Paradise walked in a few minutes later. She sat down in a chair next to his bed. How you doing, Sergeant Knox? She asked in a quiet voice, keeping their talk private. In a bit of a daze, ma'am, Jeff replied in the same manner. The promotion was a big enough surprise, but the Silver Star? I just wanted to get home alive for Christmas, you know. You'll figure it out, Sergeant. Be careful with the humble routine, though. I can tell it's genuine, but it'll cheese some people off. Specifically, people who will want to make a bigger deal out of it than you will want. And you'll have to learn to deal with it. CPT Paradise shrugged. I wish I had better advice for you. It's not so much that, ma'am, it's the fact that John Tyler, Frank Breckenridge, and Corey Song are dead. We weren't friends in the classic sense, especially since they were sergeants and I was a corporal. But we were all NCOs in the same unit together. We hung out in the same places together. Sure. Uh, sorry, ma'am. I even shared a beer with John when I made corporal. CPT Paradise smiled. You have my permission to speak freely when we're talking like this, Sergeant. You can say shit or any other colorful words you've learned around me. I have four brothers in the military and a father who used to be. I have likely heard it all before. Was this your first time in combat? Yes, ma'am. I turned 20 in August, so I was a little young for Grenada. Then this is the first time you've experienced death? Like this? Yes, ma'am. Dad lost his parents before my sister and I were born. Moms are still alive, though elderly. No one from my high school managed to kill themselves before we graduated either. Jeff closed his eyes and sighed. I can see their faces from the night the sergeants in my company took me out to celebrate my promotion to corporal. John looked so proud that one of his soldiers would soon join the NCO ranks. Looking down, he shook his head. The profession of arms is not inherently safe, is it, ma'am? No, the captain agreed, smiling sadly. I thought I knew what I was getting myself into when I decided to be an army nurse. I mean, I worked in a large city hospital before I got my direct commission. Nursing is nursing, right? My first assignment was Madigan Army Medical Center at Fort Lewis. I arrived just before Grenada. The second ranger battalion was part of the invasion. And while I saw gunshot and stab wounds before I joined the army, the number of wounded rangers far exceeded what I'd seen in the past at least all at one time. I was overwhelmed, Sergeant. So many young, normally healthy people in the hospital. I thought I made a terrible mistake in joining the army until I talked to a young man like you late one night. Stephen helped me understand what drives you men forward when most people's instincts tell them to run the other way. Stephen smiled at me the night before surgery on his leg and finally put it all in perspective. He said, they issued us parachutes and rifles. Not capes, ma'am. We're not superheroes, only rangers. We follow our training. Jeff saw a look much like a combat soldier's thousand-yard stare settle over the captain's face. A tear trickled down the captain's face. What happened to him, ma'am? He asked. Private First Class Stephen Allen Dunbar of Alpha Company, 2nd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, Airborne suffered a massive intraoperative stroke during surgery to repair a broken leg suffered in the invasion of Grenada. He never woke up and died two days later. He was 19. CPT Paradise stopped and grabbed a tissue from the box on Jeff's nightstand. You can't ever bring those men back, Sergeant. No more than I could bring Stephen back in 1983. I'll never forget the young man I knew, though. There's no rhyme or reason to who lives and who dies. It just happens. CPT Paradise rose, walked away from his bed, and out of the ward. Jeff lay awake for a long time, 
3 February 1990, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Jeff Knox strode down the hallway of a different yet similar army barracks. He hadn't heard from Tom Pelly since they jumped into Panama. Tom was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 504th PIR, and this was his barracks. They kept in touch here and there, seeing each other occasionally around the base. 1st and 2nd Battalion were both in the 82nd Airborne's 1st Brigade. Both were on the same duty cycle and jumped into Panama for Operation Just Cause together. Jeff transferred down from Walter Reed to Womack in mid-January. The balance of the 82nd returned from Panama on the 31st, but Jeff had been unable to reach his friend since. Multiple phone calls went unanswered. Jeff checked in with TC's squad leader before trying to see him. It was a courtesy to let the man know about the visit. Jeff stopped in front of TC's assigned room and knocked on his door. He took a step back when it opened. TC was pale and much thinner than Jeff remembered him. There were dark circles under the man's eyes, suggesting a lack of sleep. TC, Jeff whispered. What the hell do you want, Yankee? Jeff was taken aback by his tone. I haven't heard from you since we jumped. I wanted to see how you were doing. I'm fine. Anything else? I kind of wanted to know why you've been ignoring your phone. Maybe it's because I don't want to talk to you. What did I do? Jeff asked the man he considered a friend. Leave me alone, TC snarled. He slammed the door in Jeff's face. A stunned Jeff stared at TC's door, trying to figure out what the hell just happened. Jeff noted the pictures on that door. They were of TC's roommate, one of the soldiers the division lost during operations in Panama. Jeff felt a hand on his shoulder while he tried to make sense of his interaction with TC. The hand belonged to TC's squad leader, SSG Alonzo. Tom and Ricky were close, Alonzo explained. Everyone in the company liked Ricky, but he and Tom were tight. I didn't want to say anything before you came up. I hoped your coming by might snap him out of whatever funk he's in. I've never seen him like this, Jeff said, shaking his head. I guess I'll head back to my barracks. How'd it go? Ken asked, hearing his roommate return. Jeff didn't answer Ken, causing Ken to look up. It was then that Ken saw the look on Jeff's face. Jeff, what's wrong? Again, no answer. Jeff. Jeff dropped into the chair at his desk, looked at the ceiling, and sighed. You know how you called me at Walter Reed? Visited me when I transferred down here to Womack? He asked. Yeah. I found out why I couldn't get a hold of TC. His roommate died during Just Cause. Shit, man. <laughs> yeah, he won't talk to me. He slammed his door in my face. Ken nodded. He's going to be angry for a while, I'm guessing. You can't help him until he wants help. I know, Jeff said. It hurts, though. I don't know what to do, Mrs. Pelly, Jeff said to TC's mother over the phone later that night. I know this is going to sound trite, Jeff. Tommy's got to want the help you're trying to give him, Mrs. Pelly replied with clear resignation in her voice. She echoed Ken's words from hours before. We came up to visit him when he got back, but he pushed us away too. We cut our visit short. I guess we all just have to give him time to work this out for himself. If you say so, ma'am. Jeff was still asleep in his bunk when the pounding on his door began. He was on a medical profile. Unlike Ken, he was allowed to skip PT and sleep. Ken could at least run. With a groan, Jeff rolled off the bunk and made his way to the door. Opening the door revealed a wild-eyed TC. Leave my family the hell alone, you Yankee Sanuva bitch, the man roared. Your family is worried about you, TC. Your mother and sister both called while I was at Womack to ask me to check on you. You ignored my phone calls after you returned, so I went to your barracks to do exactly that. I don't want you talking to them. Is that how I'm supposed to repay the kindness your family showed me last year? Ignore them? Blow them off? Leave us alone. Jeff saw he wasn't going to get through to TC at the moment. He took a step back and slammed his door shut, frustrated. The pounding restarted before the echo faded. A look of anger settled over Jeff's face as he tore his door open. TC held his arm back, ready to pound on the door again. The look on Jeff's face made him pause. You best get your ass out of my barracks, specialist, Jeff said in the coldest voice he'd ever used. 
If you're not out of here in 10 seconds, 10 goddamn seconds, I am going to make sure you have your head up your ass. Literally, now get out. TC said nothing, glaring at him. He lowered his arm, turned, and walked away without a word. Hello? Good evening, Mrs. Pelly, Jeff said, his voice devoid of all joy. I hope I didn't interrupt your family's supper. Jeff? No, I wouldn't have answered if we were still eating, you know that. Jeff, what's wrong? Is it about Tommy? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm afraid I had words with your son this morning. Words, Jeff. Jeff relayed the interaction with TC the best he could. Jeff, I hope you know that there's no way Tommy could expect you not to call us. At this point, ma'am, I can't say what TC expects. Jeff sighed. At the end of it all, Mrs. Pelly, though TC is my friend, he is your son. He's going to need plenty of support from your family to help him through whatever it is he's dealing with. The best way for me to support him is by not making him feel that I'm spying on him. Jeff, what are you saying? I'm saying that, for your family's sake, I need to back off and not contact you for a while. I don't want him turning on you. Jeff, no. She knew what was coming. I'm sorry, Mrs. Pelly, I really am. I hope I'll be able to reconnect with you, Dr. Pelly, Miranda, and most of all, TC, soon. All the best. Jeff, please wait. Jean Pelly's voice cut off when Jeff hung up. Jeff made another attempt to visit TC the following week. He hoped they could both be more reasonable this time. He stopped to see SSG Alonzo again before heading to TC's room. Alonzo shook his head. Don't bother. He's still closing himself off? Alonzo shrugged. I don't know, he's not here anymore. Not here anymore? Where is he? Transferred out. He left early this week. Where? Korea somewhere. I'm guessing the DMZ, but I'm not sure. Jeff thanked the sergeant and walked outside. He scratched his head for a moment before heading back to his barracks. You know, people are usually dead drunk when they decide to do something like this. That's a sweeping generalization, Ken. Okay, okay, fine. It's not like we're getting our girlfriend of the week's name tattooed on our chests or anything, and it's not like we weren't there either. Very true. Can I help you, gentlemen? asked the shop's owner when they entered. Yes, sir. What would be involved in getting this design done? The tattoo artist looked at the paper Jeff held. Colors? Jeff held out an 82nd patch and 1504th's jump status oval. The stars in the same color yellow? Gold for the stars above the rest of design. A bronze color for this one here, if possible. The outline would take a day, and filling in the colors would have to be spread out over a few weeks. That bronze star might look better as a bronze-shaded silver one. Solid bronze might get lost in the 82nd patch. You both looking to get this one? To the 24th Infantry Division, Jeff said in Japanese while raising his beer in salute. The two friends shared a final drink as roommates in late June. Ken wouldn't be part of the 504th after tomorrow. He returned his issued equipment earlier in the week. Ken would sign out of the unit following his promotion ceremony in the morning. He'd always be a part of its history, though. Jeff's best friend would depart for his PCS leave after the ceremony. Ken would report to Fort Stewart and the 24th Infantry Division on July 30th. You're taking this better than I thought you would. No, I'm not, Jeff grumbled. I'm just faking it pretty well. We knew this was coming, Jeff. Ken reminded his best friend. That doesn't mean I have to like it. All good things must come to an end. Thank you, Jeffrey Chaucer. Jeff helped Ken carry his belongings out to his car the following morning. He stood next to the car, trying to think of something to say when Ken surprised him. Hey, you know how I took yesterday off to take care of things in town? Yeah. Well, what I needed to take care of wasn't here in Fayetteville. Where was it? Charlottesville. Charlottesville? Jeff noticed Ken looking behind him. He turned and almost fainted. Jeff saw the most beautiful thing ever walking towards him. Keiko Takahashi. He and Keiko had agreed to not keep in touch. They didn't want to pressure themselves. Ah. Her freshman year was kind to her and she looked more mature. Her looks were more womanly than before, less teenager-like. She wore a sundress that matched her dark eyes and hair. 
and also flattered her figure. Her walk was confident and assured while she approached. Jeff felt a sense of completeness as he gathered her in his arms and kissed her. Keiko-chan, Jeff whispered. Hello, Jeffrey. I am glad to see you well. And you, you are more beautiful than ever. Thank you, Jeffrey. Our time is still years away. But I wanted to see you, even if for only a few moments. I am glad you did. Jeff registered the years away she mentioned. He would bear whatever burden necessary to be with this woman in the end. I wish we had more time together today, but Ken and I must leave for the airport soon. This was more than I'd expected when I woke this morning. I trust you when you say our future is coming. They shared another kiss before Jeff turned back to Ken. The two friends shook hands. Ken looked Jeff in the eye and quoted, From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, and for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. I proudly call you my brother, Jeff. I will be even prouder to call you my brother-in-law when that day comes. Jeff was at a loss as to how to respond at first. He then remembered an old Irish prayer. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. They embraced, wishing each other well. Jeff gave Keiko one more kiss. He then watched the two siblings drive away. It was every goodbye Jeff ever experienced rolled into one. The sounds of saber rattling dominated the summer. The US and Iraq sniped back and forth over the subject of Kuwait, a small oil-rich emirate in the Persian Gulf. The Iraqi leader, Saddam Hussein, was the personification of the adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Once acceptable to the US during the Iran-Iraq war, he was less so now. Jeff noticed an increase in training tempo during training cycle in mid-July. Iraq invaded and subjugated Kuwait, its 19th province, on August 2, 1990. The forced annexation took mere hours. For Jeff, it was one more case of deja vu all over again. He saw the same type of escalation before Panama. 2nd Brigade was the duty brigade and shipped out within hours of the invasion. 3rd Squad was well prepared when the rest of the 82nd Airborne received deployment orders. The 82nd was little more than a speed bump in the desert until their pre-positioned equipment arrived. The arrival of various armored divisions made the Desert Shield more than just a name. Jeff celebrated his 21st birthday by running through a platoon-level training exercise in full chemical protective gear. The Iraqis had a reputation for using chemical weapons. It took multiple showers to get the charcoal from the Mo-P gear out of his skin. The Soviet hardliners in Moscow only recently returned to power through a successful coup, opposed any UN sanctions against Iraq. The US used the absence of the Soviet's UN ambassador to ram resolutions authorizing the use of force against Iraq through a Security Council meeting at the end of November. Resolutions condemning Iraq and approving sanctions also passed in the General Assembly. The Soviets could do little more than watch the growing tide of displeasure with Iraq. The Security Council vetoed any attempted reversal of previous decisions. The Soviets touted the strength of the Iraqi military hardware which they provided. Both countries predicted sad times for the US-led coalition. The 82nd held its place in the desert for months, running exercise after exercise. NCOs from every Allied unit maintained a delicate balance of readiness. Too much training, and their units would lose their edge. Too little, and they wouldn't be ready when combat began. The Soviets continued to laud Iraq's military capabilities and its place as the fourth largest army in the world. The confidence they displayed early on started waning as Desert Shield continued. The two sides hurtled headlong towards the deadline for Iraq to pull out of Kuwait. The point of no return was the middle of January 1991. The deadline passed without the UN-mandated withdrawal. The world held its breath. Desert Storm began with a massive air attack at 1800 hours, Eastern Standard Time on January 17, 1991. The recently launched cable news network made its name by scooping the big three networks. Their live reports from Baghdad while the first bombs fell captured the attention of billions of viewers.
Coalition forces breached the defensive sand berms far to the south of the Iraqi capital on February 24th. Coalition air forces flew thousands of sorties and dropped millions of pounds of ordnance in those five weeks. If it moved, it died. If it didn't, it died faster. The coalition's iron fist smashed the world's fourth largest army in just over four days. It became the world's most extensive collection of scrap metal under the onslaught. U.S. Army's Central Command tasked the 82nd Airborne with securing the area around Talil, Iraq when the ground war stopped at the end of February. Jeff was exhausted after two weeks of clearing bunker, after Iraqi bunker. The 82nd still camped in the desert, and he'd been spitting sand and dust for seven and a half months. Maybe he could transfer to Fort Wainwright, Alaska for his next tour. Snow sounded pretty good right now. Hey, Sarge, came a shout from behind Jeff. He turned to see one of his soldiers, Mendoza, jogging over to him. Sarge, the captain wants to see you over at the CP. Okay, thanks, Ricky. Jeff walked to the company's command tent, ensuring he was as squared away as possible. Jeff ducked his head while he entered the tent and looked around for his company commander. His company chain of command all stood near the captain's desk. This news was either going to be excellent news or very bad. Jeff made his way over to the group after removing his helmet. Jeff drew himself to attention in front of the desk. Sir? Sergeant Knox reports. Jeff did not salute since they were in a combat zone. The captain, who stood by the desk, nodded at him. At ease, Jeff. Have a seat. Captain Matthews motioned to the cheap metal chair next to Jeff. Jeff sat and looked at the sad faces of the other men before turning back to the captain. CPT Matthews sighed. Jeff, there's no easy way to tell you this, but I just received word that Ken Takahashi was KIA two weeks ago during the ground phase, back on 28 February. Jeff felt like a giant punched him in the stomach. He couldn't breathe, and his vision started to gray out. He put his head in his hands and tried to keep his composure. Ken Takahashi was his roommate from the day Jeff reported into the 82nd, to the day Ken transferred out of it, almost two and a half years. They preferred to forget about Campbell. Ken was his best friend, a man he called brother. Today was to have been Ken's 23rd birthday. The tears Jeff tried to hold back began to fall and he couldn't stop them. Jeff barely registered the hands on his shoulder and the back of his neck. Jeff was able to compose himself and raise his head after a few minutes. The hands he felt belonged to his platoon sergeant, and first sergeant. They lost friends in combat earlier in their careers. They understood the pain he felt. I'm sorry, Jeff, I know how close the two of you were. The others present in the tent expressed their condolences as well. The colors seemed to be missing from the world around him. Jeff didn't remember leaving the CP. He found himself sitting on a low dune, looking out over the Iraqi desert as the sun set. He was a clear target but he didn't care. There was a muffled when someone sat in the sand next to him. He turned to see who it was and started to scramble to his feet. As you were, Sergeant, as you were, Warren Thomas quickly said, keep your seat. Yes, Father. Chaplain, Major. Thomas was a Catholic chaplain attached to 1st Battalion. The pair watched in silence while the sun slipped lower and lower. Reds, oranges, and golds spread through the sky as it disappeared. We don't take time to appreciate that often enough. No, Father, we surely don't. Jeff picked up a rock, turned it over in his hands, then tossed it away. That'll happen again tomorrow whether we're all here or not, won't it? That's correct, Jeff. There wouldn't be anyone to appreciate it, though. Father, you shouldn't be exposing yourself to the enemy like this. What about you, Jeff? Jeff shrugged. You think your death wouldn't matter then? Instead of answering the question itself, Jeff responded with lyrics from a song. So you run and you run to catch up with the sun but it's sinking, racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way but you're older, shorter of breath and one day closer to death. Pink Floyd, Father Thomas said nodding. But what of your family? Won't your death matter to them? Another shrug. The young ladies I keep hearing about? The ones who visited you two years ago? 
No. Ken's sister, maybe. Jeff reacted to that question, looking sharply at the priest. You have to pay attention in this job, Jeff. You might need some little piece of information you've heard one day. What about Miss Takahashi, then? Don't you think she'd care more than a little? Jeff hung his head. The pain of Ken's death came rushing back. He tried to shove it into a corner, but he should have known from experience that wouldn't work. Tears for his friend fell again. They fell for the future lost, for the pain Keiko and her family now experienced. Why, father? Why? What purpose does his death serve? He asked, the tears leaving streaks in the dust on his face. Those questions are as old as the human race, Jeff. Let me ask this in return. Something you seldom hear asked. What purpose did Ken's life serve? At a minimum, it was to be your best friend and the man responsible for introducing you to his sister. Will his death be an excuse for you to stop living now? Or will it be the reason you live? Carpe diem, Jeff. Carpe diem. Jeff nodded and wiped his face. Lodas, lodas. Toujours lodas. Grab life by the throat. Exactly, Jeff. Otherwise, it's just existing. Jeff looked back at the western sky. The red glow faded towards a bluish purple as the minutes passed. Thank you, Father, Jeff said, turning back to the priest. He rose and dusted himself off. You've given me something to think about. The green of spring seemed unnatural now. The 82nd landed back at Fort Bragg a week ago after eight months in the desert. His family drove down to witness his return. Kara cried when Jeff told her about Ken. She liked Ken immediately when they met two years ago. Jeff's parents would never have the chance to meet him now. They saw the positive effect of Ken's friendship on their son's life, however. Jeff also told his family about the decision he made in Iraq, and why. Is that what you want, Jeff? Is that what will make you happy? It is, Mom. That's where my future lies. Honey, as long as you're happy, that's all your father and I want for you. I finally understood that someone else can't define your success the day you left home. Thanks, Mom. Are you going to call Ken's family? Jeff shook his head. I wrote them a letter while I was over there. I think that was the hardest thing I've ever done. I put it in the outbox in the company office when we got back yesterday before I even took my shower. His parents nodded. It was good of you to do that, his father commented. You two would have been disappointed if I hadn't done that. I mean, sure, I bring death from above, but there's no reason for me to be impolite. Jeff stepped into the Alpha Company office in mid-April. Hey, Sergeant Knox, good morning. Specialist Chris Vanderbill was the Alpha Company clerk. Morning, Dutch. I need to submit this. Chris's eyebrows rose at the form Jeff handed him but said nothing. He pointed out spots where Jeff needed to initial and then asked him to sign the bottom of the form. You want the captain to see this now? No time like the present, Dutch. Chris knocked on CPT Matthew's door and handed the form back to Jeff. Come. Sergeant Knox to see you, sir. Thanks, Chris. Come on in, Sergeant. Good morning, sir. I have something you need to see. Jeff handed the form to his CO after he saluted. CPT Matthew's smile faded. He fell back into his chair, still staring at the paper. He looked back up at Jeff. Is this for real? I'm afraid so, sir. Have a seat, Jeff. The captain reread the form in disbelief while Jeff sat. When? I have 61 days of leave accrued now, sir. The day after Memorial Day? With what I'll accrue between now and then, that will take me past the end of my enlistment period. The Army as a whole and this company in particular will be lessened by your departure, Jeff. You'd have made an outstanding senior NCO or officer. That's kind of you to say, sir, thank you. I would have left the company after the summer regardless, though, sir. True enough. May I ask a personal question, Jeff? How much of this is due to Ken's death, sir? The captain nodded. I won't deny that a fair amount of my decision stems from that fact, sir. There are other considerations, too. There's a young lady in my future, sir. To be more accurate, she is my future. Someone who doesn't approve of the army, Jeff. Not quite. Keiko Takahashi, sir. 
The captain's eyebrows rose. I met her two years ago when Ken's family came to visit. From what I remember hearing, she's quite the catch. No argument there, sir. I'm sure I've only begun to learn how true that statement is, too. Terry Matthews nodded again. 28 Mays in a little less than two months, Jeff. Keep running past the finish line. You can count on me, sir. You'll get my best effort. I always do, Jeff. Dismissed. CPT Matthews watched Jeff come to attention, salute, and leave his office. He sat at his desk, lost in thought for many minutes. A quiet knock brought him out of his musings. Yes, Chris? Do you need anything, sir? Would you bring me a Form 638, Chris? It took almost a month for the rumor mill to catch wind of what transpired in the company office. Jeff sat in his barracks room while he reviewed his final school paper. He heard a knock and looked up. One SG Haversmith stood in his doorway. Hey, First Sergeant, Jeff said as he rose. He came to a relaxed position of parade rest. At ease, Jeff. Have a seat. This is your room, after all. Thanks, Top. Have a seat yourself. Can I get you something to drink? Do you have any soda? Jeff offered what was in his small fridge. He handed the first sergeant the soda he requested. What can I do for you, Top? You can call me Dave for starters, Jeff. Is it true what I'm hearing? Depends, Top. Uh, Dave, what are you hearing? That you're gonna ETS? Afraid so, Dave. 25 days and a wake up now. I'll go on terminal leave at that point on 2-8 May. I'll officially echo Tango suitcase on 02 August. You were talking about going career, maybe even going to OCS. Change is the only constant, Dave. Ken's death has a lot to do with this change, but his family's visit two years ago has even more. Why's that? Ken's little sister? Keiko? Love at first sight, Dave. Dave's eyebrows rose. Wow. Ken's sister. Did he know? He knew, gave me his blessing even. Is she that against the military? Jeff shrugged. Beats me, Dave, I guess I've soured on it. Four years, two war zones, my best friend dead. I used to see a future in the army. Now it's just darkness when I try to picture that future. I can't see it any longer. What are you going to do? Not quite sure yet. Keiko will be in school until 94, earning a bachelor's in English and a master's in teaching. We'll see what happens when we get to that point. The news spread like wildfire around the company. One of 3rd Squad's newest privates thought he could coast because Jeff would slack off due to his imminent departure. He was wrong. There was ample time for that private to consider his error while he ran the division's obstacle course twice in a row. Jeff made sure his Class A uniform was clean and pressed for the Memorial Day celebrations. He'd need it soon after that, too. Lieutenant Colonel Reich called him up in front of the entire battalion at his final formation on the 28th. Colonel Reich told the battalion how Sergeant Knox performed with a high degree of professionalism and dedication since being promoted. He presented Jeff with his 4th Army Commendation Medal, the one Captain Matthews recommended him for in mid-April. The battalion's NCOs took Jeff to the E-Club for some going-away elbow lubrication after close of business. Jeff drank lightly, not wanting to lose a day of travel to a hangover. He did need to help Dave Haversmith off his bar stool, however. Jeff joined Alpha Company for one last PT session on the morning of the 29th. He would be sedentary over the next month or so, and he needed the exercise. He cleaned up in the restroom before returning to his room for the last load of his belongings. He could get away with the PT session, but not eating at the DFAC. He turned in his meal card the day before, and it was time to go. He stopped at the CQ desk where he shook hands with the duty NCO, Emilio Vasquez. He turned his room key over to Emilio also. Jeff made sure his buddy knew his address in Massachusetts before he left. He kept himself from turning to look at the barracks he called home for over three years. Don't look back, the band Boston once sang. The road is calling, today is the day. Jeff placed the last box in the back of his pickup, followed by his duffel bag. He locked his truck's cap and started the engine. Jeff turned in a slow circle and took in one last memory of 1st Brigade's area. He drove off Fort Bragg for the final time and watched the base recede behind him as he went down the All-American Expressway. He took State Route 87 south to Interstate 95, where they intersect, 
I-95 runs northeast to southwest. Jeff put the rising sun in the rearview mirror and drove into his future. June 1991. Off State Highway 64, Coconino County, Arizona. That's one hell of a foxhole, Jeff thought while watching the sunrise over the Grand Canyon. He woke at zero dark 30 that morning to drive from Winslow, Arizona to Grandview Point. The view made every second of lost sleep worth it, as did his stop in Winslow. His mom was a big Eagles fan, and Jeff made sure someone there took a picture of him standing on a street corner. Jeff captured the sunrise as it rose over the landscape, using a full roll of film, 36 shots. He changed rolls as fast as he could. Pictures of the canyon itself as the first sunlight spilled into it would fill this next roll. Jeff knew the colors on both rolls would be amazing, though they would pale beside the real thing. There were a dozen more rolls of film, both exposed and unexposed, in the truck. He documented his trip well. He'd spend a small fortune in processing, but he didn't care. He turned from the observation point and allowed another tourist to take his spot. He asked a park ranger for recommendations on breakfast spots nearby. Jeff made his way back out to State Route 64 and turned east. Jeff thought about his trip out from Fayetteville during the drive to the restaurant. The trip had been a leisurely one, one he could have made in two days. The trip took four days instead. Fine by him. With no deadline and no one expecting him, he limited himself to eight hours of driving per day. He rubbed a hand across his face. The unaccustomed feeling of stubble greeted him. He hadn't shaved since May 28th, his last day in uniform. He'd have to shave in two or three days, though, maybe four. Ah. The place the ranger told him about looked like a place the locals kept secret from the tourists. The outside didn't look like much. Jeff noted the volume of people streaming in and out of the restaurant. He was able to grab a spot at the counter after a 20-minute wait. He was used to such delays back home at the lunch car. The menu contained Southwest-inspired items. The lunch cars didn't. He ordered the Huevos Rancheros, Jalapeno Cornbread, and coffee. He looked around while he ate and appreciated how the decor tended towards the homey. It was a nice change from the in-your-face southwestern trappings of tourist-oriented places. More coffee, hun? Jeff nodded to the waitress as he chewed. Where are you from? Stick out like a sore thumb, do I, ma'am? I'm from Enfield, Massachusetts, originally. It's out in the western part of the state. How about now? I've been at Fort Bragg for the last four years. I got out of the army last week and drove out here. You looking for work? No, ma'am. I wanted to see the canyon before I headed north to visit my buddy's family in Spokane. I'll be headed home after that. That's one hell of a detour. You're visiting your buddy's family, but not your buddy? Well, him too, eventually. Gotta figure out where they buried him first. The woman looked at him in shock. Sorry, ma'am. Ken died in the Gulf War. I'm headed to Spokane to pay my respects to his family. I need to go there before I get tied up in life. The woman put the coffee pot down, shock and sorrow visible on her face. One of my brother's buddies did the same thing after Vietnam. He said he'd rather forget about the war, but he'd never forget Irv. She wiped a tear from her eye. Your brother was lucky to have a good friend like that, ma'am. I apologize. I didn't mean to bring up bad memories. Fred's a good man, the woman said, twisting her wedding ring. Has been for the 25 years I've known him. Your friend's family will be thankful that you visited them. Do they know you're coming? Jeff nodded. I told them I'd come by when I left the army, but I haven't told them I'm on the way. I'll call them after I get to Spokane. They've had enough surprises. Jeff rolled into Spokane two days later. His hotel reservation was for four nights. He wasn't sure how long researching the location of Ken's gravesite would take. The desk clerk at his hotel proved to be a godsend. You're looking for someone's grave, but you don't know where it is? She asked when he checked in. Yeah, a buddy of mine from the army he did in the Gulf War. Holy Cross. Sorry? Holy Cross Cemetery. It's about three miles from here. How do you know that? Your buddy's death was the only death Spokane had during the war, so it was a pretty big deal. They showed the procession from the church to the cemetery on live TV back in March. 
I remember because my grandfather's buried at Holy Cross, too. I'll write down what plot your buddy's in for you. Jeff looked at the woman behind the counter and raised an eyebrow. What? I was curious. Jeff secured his belongings in his room before preparing his uniform. The next morning, a different desk clerk referred him to a barbershop nearby. Jeff specified he was looking for a barbershop and not a place to get my hair cut. The shop was a short five-minute walk away. A bell rang when Jeff opened the door. Be right out, a voice called from the back of the shop. Thank you, Jeff called back while he looked at the items on the shop walls. The owner was once in the army as well, a master sergeant. The owner stepped out of the back. Sorry about that, can I help you? Yes, sergeant, I need to look like a paratrooper again, not some long-haired hippie freak. The owner laughed while he walked over and extended his hand. I see you speak my language, John Kershaw. Jeff Knox. On leave? Yes, but it's a terminal condition. Best kind of leave there is. What brings you to Spokane? Paying my respects to a buddy's family after I go by his gravesite. John nodded, a sad look on his face. I had to do that a few times after my tours in Nam. How many? Just Ken. You're lucky. Well, let's get you squared away again. The cut didn't take long since John used electric clippers exclusively. A whirring sound echoed through the shop. John applied warm shaving cream to the sides of Jeff's head and the back of his neck. John then took a straight razor and slid it repeatedly over a leather strap. He scraped the foam and remaining stubble off Jeff's head and neck next. John surprised Jeff when he laid the barber's chair flat like a recliner. John's next surprise was when he extracted an honest-to-goodness hot, wet towel from a special cabinet and draped it over Jeff's face. A few minutes passed before Jeff heard the shaving cream dispenser whir again. John pulled the towel off and tossed it in the sink. He applied shaving cream to Jeff's face and stropped the razor again. The cream in Jeff's stubble disappeared under John's practiced hand. He sat Jeff upright again. Aftershave soothed and cooled Jeff's face. All set, Airborne. The base barbers never did this good of a job, thanks, John. My pleasure, when are you heading over? I'm headed back to the hotel now. I'll get changed into my Class A's and head over to the cemetery. Tell him this old vet says thanks. I'll trade stories with him when I get up where he is one day. Wilco, Sergeant. Putting his A's on was like putting on a favorite shirt. Comfortable. Jeff spent a few minutes checking his appearance in the mirror after he finished changing. He walked down to his truck once assured everything was in order. He drove the ten minutes to Holy Cross Cemetery. It took him another five to find Ken's grave. Jeff stared at Ken's headstone after he parked his truck. He sat there for many minutes, gazing at the stark, white stone. Ken's family had opted for the traditional white marble headstone common to military cemeteries like Arlington. Jeff climbed out of his truck, rolled up the window, and locked the door. Jeff approached the grave in a daze. He stopped a pace away and crouched. His chest began to tighten as the writing on the headstone blurred. His hand reached out to touch the stone. This time he did not attempt to stop the tears. They fell like rain. Minutes passed before he was able to compose himself again. Jeff wiped his face. He pushed the two small flags he carried into the ground in front of Ken's headstone, Old Glory and the 82nd Airborne Division's flag. He stood and took two steps back. He rendered a parade ground quality salute to his friend's grave. He dropped the salute and executed an about face. Jeff's breath caught in his throat. Keiko stood six feet away, crying, her hand over her mouth to muffle her sobs. He stepped over to her, wrapped his arms around her, and held her. Jeff stroked her long, dark hair while she sobbed into his chest. I'm so sorry, Keiko-chan, he whispered. Her pain cut through him. Keiko wiped her face minutes later after she calmed down. When did you get here, Jeffrey? I got to Spokane last night. I was going to call after my visit here. How long have you been here? I was walking up when you crouched down. I started crying when you did. He was my friend, Keiko, my best friend. He saved my life in Panama when he took that bullet in his arm. What bullet? He never told you guys? Jeff told Keiko about the defense of the patrol base in 1989. 
I could have never repaid him for that as it was, but then he goes and introduces me to you. And not that I didn't want to see you today. But how did you wind up here? I felt I needed to come to see Ken today. I cannot explain why. I walked here from our house. Where did you stay last night? Jeff told her. You must come to the house. I was planning to visit. I need to express my condolences to your parents in person. Let us take your truck then. Do you need to have a moment with Ken first? Keiko looked at Ken's grave and smiled while she held on to Jeff. She felt her brother smiling back at her. I already have. Mayumi Takahashi heard the screen door close at the front of the house while she finished her meditation. She heard movement in the front hall as she stood, bowed to the picture of her son, and then turned. Keiko back so. Her question faded as disbelief crossed her features. Jeff bowed to his best friend's mother, the woman who would be his mother-in-law one day. He no longer doubted that fact. Takahashi-san, words are inadequate to express my sorrow at Ken's loss. Mayumi overcame her shock and bowed back. Jeffrey-san. She approached her son's best friend and embraced him. It was Jeff's turn to be shocked. That shock increased when she kissed his cheek. My son chose his best friend well. You promised to visit when you wrote to us in April. That you would drive 2,700 miles to say those words speaks to your character. He came farther than that, mother. Mayumi raised an eyebrow at her youngest. Jeffrey stopped at the Grand Canyon first. The brow swung in Jeff's direction. Ken and I talked about visiting the canyon someday, Jeff shrugged. My family understands why I needed to come here once my obligation to the army was complete. I've been letting them know where I am. There's no deadline for me to get home. You are out of the army then? Functionally, yes, ma'am. I'm on what's known as terminal leave. The army will pay me until the 2nd of August, but my duties are complete. How long will you be here? I've reserved a room at the hotel I stayed at last night for three more nights, ma'am. I wasn't sure how long it would take me to track down Ken. Last night's desk clerk knew where he was buried, which allowed me to be there for Keiko to find me this afternoon. Your things are at the hotel? Yes, ma'am. You must stay here with us instead. We have a guest room and Hero will not object. Ma'am, it was not my intention to impose on you in such a manner by coming here. Mayumi ignored his comment. Return to your hotel and collect your things. He and Keiko did as ordered. Jeff changed out of his uniform before loading the truck again. He explained what was happening to the same desk clerk who checked him in the night before. She marked the room as available but needing cleaning and handed Jeff his invoice. She charged him for only one night and didn't charge him for staying past checkout time. The young couple returned to his truck for the ride back to the Takahashi's house. Jeffrey, there is an alumni event at my former high school tomorrow night, one I would never have considered going to before. Now that you are here, however, I wish for you to escort me to that event. I also wish for you to wear your uniform. I would be honored to escort you, Keiko-chan. What time? Mr. Takahashi was in full agreement with his wife on the subject of Jeff staying at the house. Dinner that night was a simple, all-American cookout. We can say it's hibachi if you prefer, joked Mr. Takahashi. Mrs. Takahashi showed Jeff the guest room after dinner. He found himself looking into Ken's room from the hall after he brought his things upstairs. His best friend's room looked like he'd just left for basic training. Not a speck of dust was visible. Ken's diploma sat on the desk, and his academic and athletic awards lay scattered around the room. Jeff expected Ken to trudge up the stairs any minute. Jeff turned to rejoin the Takahashis. He froze in his tracks before taking a step. Keiko and her parents stood at the top of the stairs, smiling sadly at him. I apologize, I meant no intrusion. Jeff, if we thought you would be an intrusion, we wouldn't have extended the offer for you to stay here, Mrs. Takahashi said. You were remembering your friend, our son, and being respectful about it. He and Keiko spent the next day exploring Spokane. It was good to see her smiling again. They returned to her house at 1700 hours, 5 p.m., he reminded himself, to get ready for the alumni gathering at her school. Jeff was ready in less than an hour, 
Keiko took longer to get ready, but it was worth it. She wore a calf-length dress in midnight blue, which hugged her lithe frame. Her years of karate, something else Ken didn't tell him about, showed in her visible muscle tone. Mr. Takahashi snapping photos before they departed reminded Jeff of his high school proms. Jeff paid for professional washing and detailing for his truck while he and Keiko were out earlier in the day. The black paint gleamed in the late evening sun. The only issue was that Will Clement's bumper sticker came off during cleaning. Jeff would have to find another to take its place. The truck looked incomplete to him without it. He and Keiko drove to her high school. His uniform drew as many stares that day as when he escorted Miranda Pelly into her school in 87. Keiko's appearance at this event was as unexpected as Miranda's had been at hers. Jeff wondered how the Pellys were doing. The event was already underway when they arrived at 7.30. A DJ played music from the late 80s and early 90s in the background while they served dinner. The other alumni were polite enough, but Jeff again felt a feeling of deja vu as people barely spoke to them. He and Keiko kept each other company, speaking privately in Japanese. A few couples drifted out to the dance floor after dinner, but not many. The spacious dance floor with a sparse crowd gave Jeff an idea. Jeff approached the DJ while Keiko used the ladies' room. He asked the man for a specific song. Yeah, I've got that album, the man confirmed. When would you like me to play that song? Second. Give me a few minutes, I'll give you a sign and you can add it to your list of requests then. Would you be able to let me know before you play it? Maybe as you start the song just before? Sure. As you can see, I'm not exactly swamped. Jeff thanked the man and returned to his table. Keiko returned a few minutes later. He gave the DJ the high sign. It was only a few minutes before Jeff heard Sergeant Knox. Yo, Jeff called back. Stand to. Hua. Jeff rose. Keiko looked at him like he'd grown another head. The DJ started the song that would play before his. It was an okay song. Short, easy to dance to. He held his hand out to Keiko. She looked at that with a raised eyebrow. She didn't dance. Do you trust me? He asked. Keiko's answer was to put her hand in his. She rose from her chair, and Jeff led them both to the floor. He held Keiko in a traditional dance hold and moved gently to the song. Okay, folks, here's a request from someone who served with Ken Takahashi, class of 1986, the DJ said as he readied Jeff's song. He nodded to Jeff and started the turntable. Jeff held Keiko motionless in a ballroom dance pose. The song started with... Violins? Her look asked, What are you doing? He winked at her. Wait for it, he whispered. The violins rose to a crescendo, then transitioned to a short guitar solo. When the guitar started, Jeff began to move in a slow, sweeping step. His speed increased when drums signaled the arrival of the rest of the instruments in the song. Jeff pictured the Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire movies his mother made him watch on TV growing up. They danced in soft dancing shoes. He glided across the floor in his jump boots. Eat your heart out, Fred. Jeff sang softly to Keiko, his voice blending with the band's voices. You want to get close to me, the feeling's so clear, but I need some time to see. The vision through my tears. You want to get next to me, I need your intrusion. I don't need to be blinded by confusion. Here is my heart and waiting for you, here is my soul. I eat it, Shenu. Love will find a way as if you want it to. Love will find a way, love will find a way for me and you. Jeff slowed to a stop, swaying while he continued to sing to her. Love will find a way, love will find a way. Love will find a way, love will find an... In the space between beats of the song, his gaze transfixed her as they stood motionless. The music paused, allowing the next moment of the song to be just the lyrics, away. And they were off again, sweeping across the now empty floor when the music returned. The other alumni had cleared the floor to give Keiko and Jeff all the room they could have wanted. Jeff continued to sing to Keiko while they danced. There was a quick change in the tempo in the song where Jeff brought them to a stop again. He then danced to that different tempo by himself. His wild gyrations allowed those who knew Keiko to hear something new. The sound of Keiko Takahashi laughing. Jeff swept her up again when the original tempo returned. He kept up that pace until the final line of the song. Will love find a way? 
Love will find a way. The crowd's applause thundered through the hall, while Jeff dipped Keiko at the end of the song. Jeff heard none of it concentrating on the young woman in his arms. The song was his promise to her. He believed. He helped her stand upright. They kissed with all the passion both possessed. I love you, Keiko Takahashi, he whispered. I don't want to wait until it's our time, but I will. Our love will find a way. Keiko's tears of joy flowed down her cheeks. She found a reserve of passion and kissed him with more intensity than ever. What is the name of that band, Jeffrey? Yes, he smiled. Appropriate, isn't it? The second verse doesn't fit us as well as the first, but... Where did you learn to dance like that? Arthur Murray Dance School on Bragg Boulevard in Fayetteville. Your brother and I took some classes after your visit. Ken was pretty good. He was a favorite of the ladies in the class. And you were not? Well, I didn't say that. Another kiss. We may leave now. Jeff spent the next day in the Takahashi's driveway, performing an oil change and other preventative maintenance on his truck. He put 3,500 miles on his truck during the drive from Fayetteville, and the trip home would add about another 2,800. Keiko was right there with him. The work caused the sleeve of his t-shirt to ride up his arm. Jeffrey, what is that on your arm? Keiko asked when Jeff reached for the air filter. Jeff looked down at his arm. This? He pulled his sleeve over up his right shoulder. Tattoos covered his upper arm. On his shoulder appeared the design he and Ken had gotten after Panama. 1504th's jump status oval was there, behind a pair of jump wings. The 82nd airborne patch lay superimposed over the risers, and a bronze-shaded star in its center signified the combat jump into Panama. Above the design, three gold stars commemorated the lives of John Tyler, Frank Breckenridge, and Corey Song. Below the original tattoo sat the one Jeff added before leaving Fayetteville. Trailing down the remaining length of his upper arm was a larger gold star, and then the kanji of Ken's full name, Kenji Isoroku Takahashi. Keiko sobbed while she reached for Ken's name, her fingers brushing across the characters. She looked into Jeff's eyes while tears fell. I will never forget Ken, Keiko. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Covered in grease, they hugged, in full view of Keiko's neighbors. Jeff placed the last of his belongings in the back of his truck two days later. The trip home would take him about four or five days, depending on how often he stopped. Mrs. Takahashi handed him a small styrofoam cooler with lunch and dinner for that day, plus drinks. She hugged him as she did when he first appeared in her house. Please call us when you arrive home, Jeff. Safe travels. She bowed and went back into the house. Mr. Takahashi shook his hand before doing the same. Jeff and Keiko stood alone in her driveway. Their kiss was volcanic. It needed to sustain them for many years, as Keiko said last year. Remember, Jeffrey, live. We will be together soon. Do not deny yourself a life in the meantime. If you love someone, set them free. In a way, yes. Be well, Keiko, I love you. 14th of June, 1991, Interstate 90 eastbound, Conneaut, Ohio. Jeff drove east through Ohio five days later. He hadn't pushed very hard to get home until today. Jeff started the day west of Cleveland, and two hours later, he was to its east and almost into Pennsylvania. He planned to push through the remaining miles to Enfield. That was the plan, at least. Jeff was on Interstate 90, which would become the Massachusetts Turnpike at some point that night. His truck rolled along in the right lane of the two eastbound lanes. He sometimes changed lanes to avoid traffic, merging at the exits, but otherwise it was an easy ride. He wasn't trying to win any races and didn't care if people passed him. He cruised at five miles an hour over the posted speed limit. His open window let the breeze in, and he enjoyed the warm morning air. Home wasn't going anywhere. High-pitched engine sounds cut through the cab of his truck, overpowering Jeff's music. A glance in his rearview mirror showed a low-slung import weaving in and out of traffic. The engine had to be turning 7 to 8,000 RPM from the way it whined. The import blew by him, rocking his truck as it passed. Dick, he muttered. 
there's always someone who wants to be first. Jeff's laid-back attitude vanished moments later, when the import's brake lights came on in the distance. The lights veered left, and the car flipped down the highway. Another half a dozen vehicles also collided in front of him. Shit! He darted around the crash using the breakdown lane and parked off the road well past the accident. Jeff hit his flashers and grabbed his first aid kit. Brakes squealed behind him while jogging to the import. He spared a glance over his shoulder and confirmed that traffic stopped well back from the crash. The import was somehow upright on its wheels. Jeff barely recognized it compared to the last time he saw it, however. The driver, who hadn't been wearing his seatbelt, still sat in the car. There was a large gash across his forehead that hadn't bled, and his head hung at an unnatural angle. Glancing at the car's interior, Jeff guessed the driver's neck broke upon impact with the collapsing roof. The passenger must not have been wearing his seatbelt either. What remained of him hung halfway out his window and appeared crushed, likely by the rolling car. Jeff shook his head as he walked back to the rest of the accident. Hey, Jeff called to the driver in the first car he came to, one with heavy front-end damage. You all right? I think I just lost 20 years off my life, but other than that, yeah. Okay, the police should be here soon. Sit tight. The man waved his thanks and Jeff went to check the rest of the cars. Need any help? Asked a man approaching from the direction of the stopped traffic. Yes, sir. Can you find the driver of that tractor trailer over there? Ask him to make sure the police know about this, using his CB? Already called it in, that's my rig. Perfect, thanks. If you have a first aid kit, would you mind grabbing it and checking the other cars? I'm headed to that minivan over there. I hear some yelling coming from it. The trucker gave him a thumbs up and ran back to his truck. The crying of a young child mixed with an adult's cries for help grew louder while he approached the van. The van's driver looked like someone painted her red from the forehead down. The blood covering her face had partially hardened already, causing her eyes to stick closed. A large, jagged cut was visible across her forehead and up into her hairline. A blood-soaked sun visor sat in her lap, and the van's left front corner displayed heavy damage. Help! She called out the window as Jeff approached. Ma'am? My name is Jeff. I've got some gauze here that I'm putting over a big cut on your forehead. Then I'm going to try to clean some of the blood off your face, okay? My son, is he okay? Jeff glanced in the back seat of the van. A two- or three-year-old boy sat in his car seat. The boy looked uninjured, despite his frantic cries. Hey, little guy, I'm going to help your mom, okay? The boy didn't respond. He just kept crying. Jeff covered the woman's cut with a wad of gauze pressed to her head and then secured it with a military field bandage. He doesn't look injured, and his seat doesn't appear damaged at all. I think he's crying because he's scared. What's your name, ma'am? Donna. Are you with the ambulance? She asked while holding the bandage to her head with her right hand. Jeff tied the ends of the bandage around her head to hold it in place. No, Donna. I'm just another motorist heading home. I had to stop and help out. The ambulance should be here soon. Traffic's already pretty backed up, so I'm sure they're going to have a little trouble getting through. Jeff used damp gauze to sponge the dried and drying blood off her face. I can't move my legs, Donna said matter-of-factly. Jeff stopped cleaning Donna's face. You can't move your legs, he asked, glancing down. Her legs disappeared into a mass of metal. I can feel them. But for some reason, I can't move them. It feels like something is digging into my left leg. Relief washed over Jeff. The front of your van looks like it crumpled around your legs. That might be why you can't move them. There's no other damage inside the car, though. Jeff cleared enough of the blood off Donna's face for her to open her eyes. Hey, little lady. Can you see me? Yes, I've got a terrible headache, though. You've got a pretty good gash on your forehead up by your hairline, Donna. It looks like you took down your sun visor with your forehead. That might be it. The boy in the back seat was now quiet and looked around. What's your son's name? Jeffrey, he's four. Jeffrey, say hi to the man helping mommy. Jeff smiled at the boy in the back seat when the little man waved at him. Your name's Jeffrey? The boy nodded. What a great name. My name is Jeffrey, too. It's the best name in the world. The little boy smiled back. 
an Ohio State Highway Patrol cruiser rolled down the breakdown lane and parked behind Jeff's truck. Jeff waved to the trooper when he stepped out of the patrol car. The man placed his campaign cover on his head and stepped over. Good morning, trooper. There are two dead in that import up there. You might want to cover that car with a tarp or something. The passenger got crushed by the car as it rolled, and oncoming traffic might see that. That car there has a gentleman who was scared half to death, but says he's otherwise uninjured. Other than Donna and her young son here, I don't know who else might be injured. The driver of the big rig there is checking the rest of the cars. I worked this side of the crash until I got to Donna's car. Donna couldn't move her lower legs. The front of the van crumpled around them. She does have feeling in them, however. She says she can feel something sticking into her left leg. Trooper Phil Jackson rarely received that kind of report from a bystander. Where do you work? That was a comprehensive report. The aid bag and pile of bloody gauze at the man's feet hinted that the man might work in public safety. Nowhere, sir. I just got out of the Army infantry. Gotta be able to size up what you see pretty quickly, you know? I do. Someone will need to talk to you after we take care of the accident. Roger, trooper, I'll be here. The trooper nodded and walked away. Donna, does your neck hurt? A little. I think my head snapped back when I hit the sun visor. Jeff probed the back of her neck. He checked from the base of the skull to the level of her shoulders. He didn't feel anything out of the ordinary, but Donna sucked in a sharp breath when he touched a spot halfway down the neck. I don't feel anything wrong, Donna, but with the pain you're feeling in that spot, try to keep your head still, okay? Jeff reached through the window. He manipulated the rearview mirror so that she could see her son. Can you see Jeffrey now? I can, thank you. Hi, Pumpkin, Mommy's got a boo-boo, but I'll be okay. Jeffrey looked like he was about to start crying again. Buddy, that's just a big band-aid on Mommy's head, okay? Jeff said to the little boy. Jeffrey looked at Big Jeff, and then back at Mommy. It's okay, Pumpkin, she said to Jeffrey, trying to soothe him. Am I still covered in blood? She whispered to Jeff. Well, you'll need a little more cleanup, but you don't look like Carrie at the prom any longer. Donna chuckled. Bastard. An ambulance and a fire engine pulled up behind the trooper's car. The trooper walked up to the crews and pointed out various things around the accident scene. Two of the engine's crew retrieved a large canvas bundle and hustled to the crushed import. The canvas was a tarp that they used to obscure the remains of the vehicle. The engine's officer approached. Sir, Trooper Jackson said you'd be able to give me a rundown on this lady's condition. Jeff nodded and briefed the lieutenant on Donna's injuries and what she told him about her legs. The fire officer nodded in return. Sounds like we'll need the jaws to get her out. The tools get pretty noisy, ma'am. Do you think your son will go with someone when we start working on the car? Jeff, would you take care of him? Of course, Donna. Is there anything in the car you use to keep him occupied? There's a bag in the back seat with some of his books. LT, can we sit in the back of the ambulance while I read to him? No reason you can't. We've got a few more units coming to help out, but that one won't be leaving before they arrive. I'll make sure Donna and her little man are together before she's transported. Grab his car seat, too. <laughs> Jeff smiled at Donna and then walked around to the van's sliding passenger door. Jeffrey looked at him with big eyes. Hey, Jeffrey. The firemen need to use some tools to help get your mommy out of the car. They're going to be pretty loud, so she asked me if I'd bring you over to the ambulance and read some of your books to you. Does that sound okay? Jeffrey nodded. Jeff gathered up the boys' books and placed them back in their bag. The crash had scattered the contents across the back seat. He unbuckled the boy and figured out how to remove the car seat. He carried the boy over to the ambulance along with the bag and seat. Wow, Jeffrey, this is cool. Have you ever been in an ambulance before? No? Me either. Why don't you sit here on this bench? I'll sit next to you. We won't need your seat until they're ready to go. Which book do you want to read first? Jeff used different voices for the various characters in Jeffrey's books. The little boy soon filled the ambulance with laughter. Jeff kept him laughing by making funny faces as he read. The back doors to the ambulance opened 30 minutes later. Donna lay on the ambulance stretcher, strapped to a long wooden board with her neck in some sort of brace. A thick bandage covered her left lower leg. All right, Jeffrey, it looks like it's time for an ambulance ride. 
I have to get something from my truck. I'll be right back. A crew member nodded to Jeff while strapping Jeffrey's seat to a captain's chair in the back. Jeff jogged to his truck, retrieved two items, and jogged back. Jeffrey sat in his seat again, ready to go, when Jeff returned. Hey, little buddy, you take care. These folks will take good care of you and your mom, okay? Jeffrey nodded at his new friend. These are for you because you were so brave. I'll give this one to mommy to hold for now, though. It's got sharp points, and I don't want them to poke you, okay? Jeffrey nodded again, holding his arms out for a hug. Donna, these are what I'm giving to Jeffrey, if it's okay with you? Jeff showed her an 80-second airborne patch and paratrooper wings with a bronze combat jump star. The pin is what has sharp points. I'll pin it on his bag. Donna nodded despite the brace on her neck. She reached for his hand. Thank you, she said, tears leaking from her eyes. Of course, Donna. You and Jeffrey take care. Jeff stepped out of the ambulance and watched it pull away. A trooper approached. Mr. Knox, I'm Trooper Ferris, OSHP Crash Reconstruction. How are you, sir? Mr. Knox, would you tell me what you saw? I was going about 60, headed eastbound in the right lane. I could hear the engine of that import winding long before I ever saw it. I saw him weaving in and out of traffic in my rearview mirror as he approached, and he blew by me like I was standing still. A minute later, I saw his brake lights come on and then he flipped down the highway a bunch of times. I'm not sure how many. I was a little busy trying not to be part of the other cars piling up. I'd like to get home in one piece. <laughs> That's usually a good plan. Is this your current address, Fayetteville? I got out of the army at the end of May. Well, technically, I'm still in the army until the beginning of August. I'm using up my accrued leave, but I don't have to report back to Bragg. I'm headed home to Enfield, Massachusetts. Jeff gave Trooper Ferris his home address on West Ware Road and phone number. What are you doing in Ohio? A trip up 95 would have been quicker and more direct. My best friend was killed in the Gulf War. After I got out, I drove to Spokane, Washington to express my condolences to his family in person. Ferris grimaced as he nodded. He quizzed Jeff on what he did after stopping at the accident. Those are all the questions I have for you, Mr. Knox. I have your home address and phone number, though I don't think we'll need to contact you further. The deceased driver seems to have caused the accident. Other than the two in that car, Mrs. Smith's injuries were the only serious ones from the accident. We lucked out there. It could have been a lot worse. Trooper Ferris shook his hand. Thanks for your help. Jeff drove to the motel trooper. Ferris recommended two exits away. There were plenty of rooms available. Jeff unloaded his things to his room and called home. Hello? Hi, Mom. Hi, Jeff. Where are you? I'm in a motel in Conout, Ohio, which is just west of Pennsylvania. There was a big pileup on I-90. I got stuck behind it for a couple of hours, so I'll stay here for the night. I'll be home tomorrow afternoon. Well, we'll be disappointed not to have you here in the morning, but that sounds like a smart choice. Are you okay? Yeah. I wasn't involved in the accident, just stuck behind it. Eight more hours of driving didn't seem like a good idea today. There's a restaurant next door where I'll grab a late lunch. After that, I'll come back to the room and relax. I'm glad you're okay. What time will you be home? Snack. I'm planning to blow out of here around 8 tomorrow morning. I should reach Enfield by 4 in the afternoon or so with any luck. Okay, honey, we'll see you then. Love you. Love you too, Mom. Jeff woke later than he planned. He checked out of the motel and pulled his truck over to the adjacent gas station around 9. Jeff loved his truck, but it was not easy on gas. He'd just begun to fill his tank when a minivan pulled up on the other side of the pump. Daddy, Daddy, it's Jeff. Over there, that's Jeff, he heard from the van. A large man unfolded himself from the vehicle and rushed over. Are you Jeff, the one who helped a woman and her son on the highway yesterday? Yes, sir. The man startled him by grabbing his hand, shaking it furiously. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Donna's husband, Stan Smith. You're very welcome, sir. How is she doing? They kept her in the hospital last night for observation. She has a mild concussion. She needed about 60 stitches for that cut on her head, both inside and out. 
They wanted to keep the stitches small so that they'd heal better, be less noticeable. Her leg took another 20. They're going to let us take her home later today. We're on our way over to see her now. She and Jeffrey have been singing your praises ever since. They had the tooth jobs, sir. They were both fearless. I just bandaged her up and kept Jeffrey company for a little while. Well, you'll forgive me if I disagree. Come on over and say hi to Jeffrey. Stan slid the side door open. Jeffrey beamed at him and held up the red, white, and blue 82nd patch. Jeff noticed the jump wings pinned to Jeffrey's shirt and traded high fives with the little guy. Nah. He hasn't let go of that patch since you gave it to him yesterday. He slept with it last night. You were a paratrooper? Yes, sir. I just got out. I was headed home to Massachusetts when the crash happened. I should make it home by dinner time today. Jeff chatted with the Smiths for a few minutes while the gas pumped. I'll let you guys get over to see Donna now. I've got about eight hours of driving ahead of me. He gave one more high five to Jeffrey. Stan shook his hand again and slid the door closed. Jeff turned back to his pump. Stan finished fueling first and waved when they drove away. That doesn't happen very often, so savor it when it does. The man fueling the car behind him turned out to be the lieutenant from the fire engine yesterday. Phil Jackson said you're not a firefighter or EMT. No, I just got out of the army. They teach buddy aid and I took a first aid course in high school but nothing too involved. That was a well-stocked bag you had yesterday, Jeff shrugged. A surplus medic bag from an Army Navy store in Fayetteville. My platoon medic helped me stock it before I left Bragg. Well, however you wound up at that accident, you have a future in public safety if you want it. I've seen people with many years under their belt who don't handle stressful situations as well as you did. And that's not to mention how you took care of that woman and her son, both physically and emotionally. I think you'd do very well as an EMT or even a paramedic down the road. Jeff's pump clicked off, his tank full. Thanks, Lieutenant. Sherman Pineo, I go by Sherm, the man offered as he extended his hand. You have a safe trip home. It's good to see you again, Sherm. I'm Jeff Knox. Take care and be safe out there. Jeff climbed back into his truck. He rolled east on I-90 towards home a minute later. While driving along, Jeff considered Sherm Pineo's words. He hadn't considered a career in public safety before Sherm mentioned it. Jeff crossed being a police officer off his mental list almost immediately. He respected law enforcement for the difficult job they did, but didn't want to do it himself. The same was true about firefighting. However, becoming an EMT was something he could see himself doing. He'd look into it next week. The miles rolled by while Jeff thought about his future. In the near term, he knew he wouldn't stay with his parents very long. Finding an apartment was an immediate goal. He didn't want to upset them by moving out so quickly, especially his mother, but he was almost 22, a combat veteran, and used to living on his own. Financially secure, thanks to Dr. Pelly's insistence on financial counseling before he and TC reported to Bragg, Jeff wasn't worried about affording it before finding a job. Again, he wondered how TC was doing. Jeff would mail the Pellies a Christmas card this year. He was out of the country last Christmas. The New York Thruway was miles and miles of miles and miles. Western and Central New York was pretty country, but each mile closer to West Stockbridge, Massachusetts, made him want to drive faster. The New York State Police might frown on that, though. They wouldn't be as majestic as the Rocky Mountains but the hills of the Swift River Valley were home, and he missed seeing them. Eating fast food as he drove was the limit of Jeff's culinary experience that day. He didn't want to delay his arrival home by sitting down somewhere. He felt almost giddy when he saw signs for I-87 South, the road that bypassed Albany, and would take him south to the Berkshire Connector eastbound. Jeff felt lighter when he crossed the Massachusetts state line. The state police cruisers were the right colors, and the state flag looked right to him. He stopped for gas at the Lee Service Plaza along the eastbound pike. He stood by his truck as the pump dispensed its product into his tank. He gazed east, unmoving, even after the pump clicked off. Sir, are you all right? The question startled Jeff out of his thoughts. 
He turned and saw a Massachusetts state police trooper looking at him, his cruiser parked at the edge of the grass of the rest area. Yes, sir. I've been away from Massachusetts for a few years and I was soaking up the feeling of being back. It's good to be almost home. Where have you been, sir? Fort Bragg. The DOD was kind enough to send me on field trips to all sorts of interesting places along the way, too. The trooper walked over and held out his hand. Jeff took it. Welcome home. Where are you headed? He asked. Enfield. Only a little more than an hour to go. What will you be doing now that you're home? Well, if you'd asked me two days ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. Now I think I might try being an EMT, see how that goes. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Do what you love and love what you do. You might not get rich, but it will feel right.